franchise. Linda, age 10, was the only one of the family who seemed to enjoy being awake. Norman Muller could hear her now through his own drugged, unhealthy coma. He had finally managed to fall asleep an hour earlier, but even then it was more like exhaustion than sleep. She was at his bedside now, shaking him. Daddy, Daddy, wake up, wake up. He suppressed a groan. All right, Linda. But Daddy, there's more policemen around than any time. Police cars and everything. Norman Muller gave up and rose blearily to his elbows. The day was beginning. It was faintly stirring toward dawn outside, the germ of a miserable gray that looked about as miserably gray as he felt. He could hear Sarah, his wife, shuffling about breakfast duties in the kitchen. His father-in-law, Matthew, was hawking strenuously in the bathroom. No doubt Agent Handley was ready and waiting for him. This was the day, election day. To begin with, it had been like every other year, maybe a little worse because it was a presidential year, but no worse than other presidential years if it came to that. The politicians spoke about the great electorate and the vast electronic intelligence that was its servant. The press analyzed the situation with industrial computers. The New York Times and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch had their own computers and were full of little hints as to what would be forthcoming. Commentators and columnists pinpointed the crucial state and county in happy contradiction to one another. The first hint that it would not be like every other year was when Sarah Muller said to her husband on the evening of October 4th, with Election Day exactly a month off, Cantwell Johnson says that Indiana will be the state this year. He's the fourth one. Just think, our state this time. Matthew Hortonweiler took his fleshy face from behind the paper, stared dourly at his daughter, and growled, Those fellows are paid to tell lies. Don't listen to them. Four of them, Father, said Sarah mildly. They all say Indiana. Indiana is a key state, Matthew, said Norman, just as mildly. On account of the Hawkins-Smith Act and this mess in Indianapolis, it... Matthew twisted his old face alarmingly and rasped out, No one says Bloomington or Monroe County, do they? Well, said Norman. Linda, whose little pointed-chinned face had been shifting from one speaker to the next, said pipingly, You going to be voting this year, Daddy? Norman smiled gently and said, I don't think so, dear. But this was in the gradually growing excitement of an October in a presidential election year, and Sarah had led a quiet life with dreams for her companions. She said longingly, Wouldn't that be wonderful, though? If I voted? Norman Muller had a small blonde mustache that had given him a debonair quality in the young Sarah's eyes, but which, with gradual graying, had declined merely to lack of distinction. His forehead bore deepening lines born of uncertainty and, in general, he had never seduced his clerkly soul with the thought that he was either born great or would under any circumstances achieve greatness. He had a wife, a job, and a little girl, and except under extraordinary conditions of elation or depression, was inclined to consider that to be an adequate bargain struck with life. So he was a little embarrassed and more than a little uneasy at the direction his wife's thoughts were taking. Actually, my dear, he said, there are two hundred million people in the country, and with odds like that I don't think we ought to waste our time wondering about it. His wife said, Why, Norman, it's no such thing like two hundred million, and you know it. In the first place, only people between twenty and sixty are eligible, and it's always men, so that puts it down to maybe fifty million to one. Then, if it's really Indiana... Then it's about one and a quarter million to one. You wouldn't want me to bet in a horse race against those odds, now, would you? 
Let's have supper. Matthew muttered from behind his newspaper, Damned foolishness. Linda asked again, You going to be voting this year, Daddy? Norman shook his head and they all adjourned to the dining room. By October 20th, Sarah's excitement was rising rapidly. Over the coffee, she announced that Mrs. Schultz, having a cousin who was the secretary of an assemblyman, said that all the smart money was on Indiana. She says President Villers is even going to make a speech at Indianapolis. Norman Muller, who had had a hard day at the store, nudged the statement with a raising of eyebrows and let it go at that. Matthew Hortonweiler, who was chronically dissatisfied with Washington, said, If Villers makes a speech in Indiana, that means he thinks Multivac will pick Arizona. He wouldn't have the guts to go closer, the mushhead. Sarah, who ignored her father whenever she could decently do so, said, I don't know why they don't announce the state as soon as they can, and then the county and so on. Then the people who were eliminated could relax. If they did anything like that, pointed out Norman, the politicians would follow the announcements like vultures. By the time it was narrowed down to a township, you'd have a congressman or two at every street corner. Matthew narrowed his eyes and brushed angrily at his sparse gray hair. They're vultures, anyhow. Listen. Sarah murmured, Now, Father... Matthew's voice rumbled over her protest without as much as a stumble or hitch. Listen, I was around when they set up Multivac. It would end partisan politics, they said. No more voters' money wasted on campaigns. No more grinning nobodies high-pressured and advertising campaigned into Congress or the White House. So what happens? More campaigning than ever. Only now they do it blind. They'll send guys to Indiana on account of the Hawkins-Smith Act and other guys to California in case it's the Joe Hammer situation that turns out crucial. I say wipe out all that nonsense. Back to the good old... Linda asked suddenly, Don't you want Daddy to vote this year, Grandpa? Matthew glared at the young girl. Never you mind now. He turned back to Norman and Sarah. There was a time I voted, marched right up to the polling booth, stuck my fist on the levers and voted. There was nothing to it. I just said, this fellow's my man and I'm voting for him. That's the way it should be. Linda said excitedly, You voted, Grandpa? You really did? Sarah leaned forward quickly to quiet what might easily become an incongruous story drifting about the neighborhood. It's nothing, Linda. Grandpa doesn't really mean voted. Everyone did that kind of voting. Your grandpa, too. But it wasn't really voting. Matthew roared, It wasn't when I was a little boy. I was 22, and I voted for Langley, and it was real voting. My vote didn't count for much, maybe but it was as good as anyone else's. Anyone else's. And no multivac to... Norman interposed. All right, Linda, time for bed. And stop asking questions about voting. When you grow up, you'll understand all about it. He kissed her with antiseptic gentleness, and she moved reluctantly out of range under maternal prodding, and a promise that she might watch the bedside video till 9.15 if she was prompt about the bathing ritual. Linda said, Grandpa, and stood with her chin down and her hands behind her back until his newspaper lowered itself to the point where shaggy eyebrows and eyes, nested in fine wrinkles, showed themselves. It was Friday, October 31st. He said, Yes. Linda came closer and put both her forearms on one of the old man's knees so that he had to discard his newspaper altogether. She said, Grandpa, did you really once vote? He said, You heard me say I did, didn't you? Do you think I tell fibs? N no, but Mama says everybody voted then. So they did. 
But how could they? How could everybody vote? Matthew stared at her solemnly, then lifted her and put her on his knee. He even moderated the tonal qualities of his voice. He said, You see, Linda, till about forty years ago, everybody always voted. Say we wanted to decide who was to be the new President of the United States. The Democrats and Republicans would both nominate someone, and everybody would say who they wanted. When Election Day was over, they would count how many people wanted the Democrat and how many wanted the Republican. Whoever had more votes was elected, you see? Linda nodded and said, How did all the people know who to vote for? Did Multivac tell them? Matthew's eyebrows hunched down and he looked severe. They just used their own judgment, girl. She edged away from him and he lowered his voice again. I'm not angry at you, Linda. But you see... Sometimes it took all night to count what everyone said, and people were impatient. So they invented special machines which could look at the first few votes and compare them with the votes from the same places in previous years. That way the machine could compute how the total vote would be and who would be elected, you see? She nodded. Like Multivac. The first computers were much smaller than Multivac. But the machines grew bigger, and they could tell how the election would go from fewer and fewer votes. Then, at last, they built Multivac, and it can tell from just one voter. Linda smiled at having reached a familiar part of the story, and said, That's nice. Matthew frowned and said, No, it's not nice. I don't want a machine telling me how I would have voted just because some joker in Milwaukee says he's against higher tariffs. Maybe I want to vote cockeyed just for the pleasure of it. Maybe I don't want to vote. Maybe. But Linda had wriggled from his knee and was beating a retreat. She met her mother at the door. Her mother, who was still wearing her coat and had not even had time to remove her hat, said breathlessly, Run along, Linda. Don't get in Mother's way. Then she said to Matthew, as she lifted her hat from her head and patted her hair back into place, I've been at Agatha's. Matthew stared at her censoriously and did not even dignify that piece of information with a grunt as he groped for his newspaper. Sarah said, as she unbuttoned her coat, Guess what she said. Matthew flattened out his newspaper for reading purposes with a sharp crackle and said, Don't much care. Sarah said, Now, Father. But she had no time for anger. The news had to be told, and Matthew was the only recipient handy, so she went on, Agatha's Joe is a policeman, you know, and he says a whole truckload of Secret Service men came into Bloomington last night. They're not after me. Don't you see, Father? Secret Service agents, and it's almost election time. In Bloomington. Maybe they're after a bank robber. There hasn't been a bank robbery in town in ages. Father, you're hopeless. She stalked away. Nor did Norman Muller receive the news with noticeably greater excitement. Now, Sarah, how did Agatha's Joe know they were Secret Service agents? He asked calmly. They wouldn't go around with identification cards pasted on their foreheads. But by next evening, with November a day old, she could say triumphantly, It's just everyone in Bloomington that's waiting for someone local to be the voter. The Bloomington News as much as said so on video. Norman stirred uneasily. He couldn't deny it, and his heart was sinking. If Bloomington was really to be hit by multivax lightning... It would mean newspaper men, video shows, tourists, all sorts of strange upsets. Norman liked the quiet routine of his life, and the distant stir of politics was getting uncomfortably close. He said, It's all rumor, nothing more. You wait and see, then. You just wait and see. As things turned out, there was very little time to wait, for the doorbell rang insistently, and when Norman Muller opened it and said, Yes? A tall, grave-faced man said, 
Are you Norman Muller? Norman said, Yes, again, but in a strange dying voice. It was not difficult to see from the stranger's bearing that he was one carrying authority, and the nature of his errand suddenly became as inevitably obvious as it had, until the moment before, been unthinkably impossible. The man presented credentials, stepped into the house, closed the door behind him, and said ritualistically, Mr. Norman Muller, it is necessary for me to inform you on behalf of the President of the United States that you have been chosen to represent the American electorate on Tuesday, November 4, 2008. Norman Muller managed with difficulty to walk unaided to his chair. He sat there, white-faced and almost insensible, while Sarah brought water, slapped his hands in panic, and moaned to her husband between clenched teeth, Don't be sick, Norman. Don't be sick. They'll pick someone else. When Norman could manage to talk, he whispered, I'm sorry, sir. The Secret Service agent had removed his coat, unbuttoned his jacket, and was sitting at ease on the couch. It's all right, he said, and the mark of officialdom seemed to have vanished with the formal announcement and leave him simply a large and rather friendly man. This is the sixth time I've made the announcement, and I've seen all kinds of reactions. Not one of them was the kind you see on the video. You know what I mean? A wholly dedicated look and a character who says, It will be a great privilege to serve my country. That sort of stuff. The agent laughed comfortingly. Sarah's accompanying laugh held a trace of shrill hysteria. The agent said, Now you're going to have me with you for a while. My name is Phil Handley. I'd appreciate it if you call me Phil. Mr. Muller can't leave the house anymore till election day. You'll have to inform the department store that he's sick, Mrs. Muller. You can go about your business for a while, but you'll have to agree not to say a word about this. Right, Mrs. Muller? Sarah nodded vigorously. No, sir, not a word. All right, but Mrs. Muller... Handley looked grave. We're not kidding now. Go out only if you must, and you'll be followed when you do. I'm sorry, but that's the way we must operate. Followed? It won't be obvious. Don't worry. And it's only for two days till the formal announcement to the nation is made. Your daughter... She's in bed, said Sarah hastily. Good. She'll have to be told I'm a relative or friend staying with the family. If she does find out the truth, she'll have to be kept in the house. Your father had better stay in the house in any case. He won't like that, said Sarah. Can't be helped. Now, since you have no others living with you... You know all about us, apparently, whispered Norman. Quite a bit, agreed Handley. In any case, those are all my instructions to you for the moment. I'll try to cooperate as much as I can and be as little of a nuisance as possible. The government will pay for my maintenance, so I won't be an expense to you. I'll be relieved each night by someone who will sit up in this room, so there will be no problem about sleeping accommodations. Now, Mr. Muller. Sir? You can call me Phil, said the agent again. The purpose of the two-day preliminary before formal announcement is to get you used to your position. We prefer to have you face multivac in as normal a state of mind as possible. Just relax and try to feel this is all in a day's work, okay? Okay, said Norman, and then shook his head violently. But I don't want the responsibility. Why me? All right, said Handley. Let's get that straight to begin with. Multivac weighs all sorts of known factors, billions of them. One factor isn't known, though, and won't be known for a long time. That's the reaction pattern of the human mind. All Americans are subjected to the molding pressure of what other Americans do and say, to the things that are done to him and the things he does to others. Any American can be brought to Multivac to have the bent of his mind surveyed. 
From that, the bent of all other minds in the country can be estimated. Some Americans are better for the purpose than others at some given time, depending upon the happenings of that year. Multivac picked you as most representative this year. Not the smartest or the strongest or the luckiest, but just the most representative. Now, we don't question Multivac, do we? Couldn't it make a mistake? asked Norman. Sarah, who listened impatiently, interrupted to say, Don't listen to him, sir. He's just nervous, you know. Actually, he's very well read, and he always follows politics very closely. Handley said, Multivac makes the decisions, Mrs. Muller. It picked your husband. But does it know everything? insisted Norman wildly. Couldn't it have made a mistake? Yes, it can. There's no point in not being frank. In 1992, a selected voter died of a stroke two hours before it was time for him to be notified. Multivac didn't predict that. It couldn't. A voter might be mentally unstable, morally unsuitable, or for that matter, disloyal. Multivac can't know everything about everybody until he's fed all the data there is. That's why alternate selections are always held in readiness. I don't think we'll be using one this time. You're in good health, Mr. Muller, and you've been carefully investigated. You qualify. Norman buried his face in his hands and sat motionless. By tomorrow morning, sir, said Sarah, he'll be perfectly all right. He just has to get used to it, that's all. Of course, said Handley. In the privacy of their bedchamber, Sarah Muller expressed herself in other and stronger fashion. The burden of her lecture was, So get hold of yourself, Norman. You're trying to throw away the chance of a lifetime. Norman whispered desperately, It frightens me, Sarah, the whole thing. For goodness sake, why? What's there to it but answering a question or two? The responsibility is too great. I couldn't face it. What responsibility? There isn't any. Multivac picked you. It's Multivac's responsibility. Everyone knows that. Norman sat up in bed in a sudden excess of rebellion and anguish. Everyone is supposed to know that, but they don't. They... Lower your voice, hissed Sarah icily. They'll hear you downtown. They don't, said Norman, declining quickly to a whisper. When they talk about the Ridgely administration of 1988, do they say he won them over with pie-in-the-sky promises and racist baloney? No. They talk about the goddamn McComber vote, as though Humphrey McComber was the only man who had anything to do with it because he faced multivac. I've said it myself. Only now I think the poor guy was just a truck farmer who didn't ask to be picked. Why was it his fault more than anyone else? Now his name is a curse. You're just being childish, said Sarah. I'm being sensible. I tell you, Sarah, I won't accept. They can't make me vote if I don't want to. I'll say I'm sick. I'll say... But Sarah had had enough. Now you listen to me, she whispered in a cold fury. You don't have only yourself to think about. You know what it means to be voter of the year? A presidential year at that. It means publicity and fame and maybe buckets of money. And then I go back to being a clerk. You will not. You'll have a branch managership at the least, if you have any brains at all, and you will have, because I'll tell you what to do. You control the kind of publicity if you play your cards right. And you can force Canal Stores, Inc. into a tight contract and an escalator clause in connection with your salary and a decent pension plan. That's not the point in being voters, Sarah. That will be your point. If you don't owe anything to yourself or to me, I'm not asking for myself. You owe something to Linda. Norman groaned. Well, don't you? snapped Sarah. Yes, dear, murmured Norman. On November 3rd, the official announcement was made, and it was too late for Norman to back out even if he had been able to find the courage to make the attempt. Their house was sealed off. Secret Service agents made their appearance in the open, blocking off all approach. At first the telephone rang incessantly. 
but Philip Handley, with an engagingly apologetic smile, took all calls. Eventually, the exchange shunted all calls directly to the police station. Norman imagined that, in that way, he was spared not only the bubbling and envious congratulations of friends, but also the egregious pressure of salesmen scenting a prospect and the designing smoothness of politicians from all over the nation, perhaps even death threats from the inevitable cranks. Newspapers were forbidden to enter the house now in order to keep out weighted pressures, and television was gently but firmly disconnected over Linda's loud protests. Matthew growled and stayed in his room. Linda, after the first flurry of excitement, sulked and whined because she could not leave the house. Sarah divided her time between preparation of meals for the present and plans for the future, and Norman's depression lived and fed upon itself. And the morning of Tuesday, November 4, 2008, came at last, and it was election day. It was early breakfast, but only Norman Muller ate, and that mechanically. Even a shower and shave had not succeeded in either restoring him to reality or removing his own conviction that he was as grimy without as he felt grimy within. Handley's friendly voice did its best to shed some normality over the gray and unfriendly dawn. The weather prediction had been for a cloudy day with prospects of rain before noon. Handley said, "'We'll keep this house insulated till Mr. Muller is back.' but after that we'll be off your necks. The Secret Service agent was in full uniform now, including sidearms in heavily brassed holsters. You've been no trouble at all, Mr. Handley, simpered Sarah. Norman drank through two cups of black coffee, wiped his lips with a napkin, stood up and said haggardly, I'm ready. Handley stood up too. Very well, sir. And thank you, Mrs. Muller, for your very kind hospitality. The armored car purred down empty streets. They were empty even for that hour of the morning. Handley indicated that and said, They always shift traffic away from the line of drive ever since the attempted bombing that nearly ruined the Leverett election of 92. When the car stopped, Norman was helped out by the always polite Handley into an underground drive whose walls were lined with soldiers at attention. He was led into a brightly lit room in which three white-uniformed men greeted him smilingly. Norman said sharply, But this is the hospital. There's no significance to that, said Handley at once. It's just that the hospital has the necessary facilities. Well, what do I do? Handley nodded. One of the three men in white advanced and said, I'll take over now, Agent. Handley saluted in an offhand manner and left the room. The man in white said, Won't you sit down, Mr. Muller? I'm John Paulson, senior computer. These are Samson Levine and Peter de Rogebush, my assistants. Norman shook hands numbly all about. Paulson was a man of middle height, with a soft face that seemed used to smiling and a very obvious toupee. He wore plastic-rimmed glasses of an old-fashioned cut, and he lit a cigarette as he talked. Norman refused his offer of one. Paulson said, In the first place, Mr. Muller, I want you to know we are in no hurry. We want you to stay with us all day, if necessary, just so that you get used to your surroundings and get over any thoughts you might have that there is anything unusual in this, anything clinical, if you know what I mean. It's all right, said Norman. I'd just as soon this were over. I understand your feelings. Still, we want you to know exactly what's going on. In the first place, Multivac isn't here. It isn't? Somehow, through all his depression, he had still looked forward to seeing Multivac. They said it was half a mile long and three stories high, that fifty technicians walked the corridors within its structure continuously. It was one of the wonders of the world. Paulson smiled. No, it's not portable, you know. It's located underground, in fact, and very few people know exactly where. 
You can understand that, since it is our greatest resource. Believe me, elections aren't the only things it's used for. Norman thought he was being deliberately chatty and found himself intrigued all the same. I thought I'd see it. I'd like to. I'm sure of that. But it takes a presidential order, and even then it has to be countersigned by security. However, we are plugged into Multivac right here by beam transmission. What Multivac says can be interpreted here, and what we say is beamed directly to Multivac, so in a sense we're in its presence. Norman looked about. The machines within the room were all meaningless to him. Now let me explain, Mr. Muller, Paulson went on. Multivac already has most of the information it needs to decide all the elections, national, state, and local. It needs only to check certain imponderable attitudes of mind, and it will use you for that. We can't predict what questions it will ask, but they may not make much sense to you or even to us. It may ask you how you feel about garbage disposal in your town, whether you favor central incinerators. It might ask you whether you have a doctor of your own or whether you make use of National Medicine, Inc. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Whatever it asks, you answer in your own words in any way you please. If you feel you must explain quite a bit, do so. Talk an hour if necessary. Yes, sir. Now, one more thing. We will have to make use of some simple devices which will automatically record your blood pressure, heartbeat, skin conductivity, and brain wave pattern while you speak. The machinery will seem formidable, but it's all absolutely painless. You won't even know what's going on. The other two technicians were already busying themselves with smooth, gleaming apparatus on oiled wheels. Norman said, Is that to check on whether I'm lying or not? Not at all, Mr. Muller. There's no question of lying. It's only a matter of emotional intensity. If the machine asks you your opinion of your child's school, you may say, I think it is overcrowded. Those are only words. From the way your brain and heart and hormones and sweat glands work, Multivac can judge exactly how intensely you feel about the matter. It will understand your feelings better than you yourself. I never heard of this, said Norman. No, I'm sure you didn't. Most of the details of Multivax workings are top secret. For instance, when you leave, you will be asked to sign a paper swearing that you will never reveal the nature of the questions you were asked, the nature of your responses, what was done, or how it was done. The less is known about the Multivac, the less chance of attempted outside pressures upon the men who service it. He smiled grimly. Our lives are hard enough as it is. Norman nodded. I understand. And now, would you like anything to eat or drink? No, nothing right now. Do you have any questions? Norman shook his head. Then you tell us when you're ready. I'm ready right now. You're certain? Quite. Paulson nodded and raised his hand in a gesture to the others. They advanced with their frightening equipment, and Norman Muller felt his breath come a little quicker as he watched. The ordeal lasted nearly three hours, with one short break for coffee and an embarrassing session with a chamber pot. During all this time, Norman Muller remained encased in machinery. He was bone-weary at the close. He thought sardonically that his promise to reveal nothing of what had passed would be an easy one to keep. Already the questions were a hazy mishmash in his mind. Somehow, he had thought Multivac would speak in a sepulchral, superhuman voice, resonant and echoing. But that, after all, was just an idea he had from seeing too many television shows, he now decided. The truth was distressingly undramatic. The questions were slips of a kind of metallic foil, patterned with numerous punctures. A second machine converted the pattern into words, and Paulson read the words to Norman, then gave him the question and let him read it for himself. Norman's answers were taken down by a recording machine, played back to Norman for confirmation, with emendations and added remarks also taken down. All that was fed into a pattern-making instrument, and that, in turn, was radiated to Multivac. The one question Norman could remember at the moment was an incongruously gossipy, what do you think of the price of eggs? 
Now it was over, and gently they removed the electrodes from various portions of his body, unwrapped the pulsating band from his upper arm, moved the machinery away. He stood up, drew a deep, shuddering breath, and said, Is that all? Am I through? Not quite. Paulson hurried to him, smiling in reassuring fashion. We'll have to ask you to stay another hour. Why? asked Norman sharply. It will take that long for Multivac to weave its new data into the trillions of items it has. Thousands of elections are concerned, you know. It's very complicated. And it may be that an odd contest here or there, a controllership in Phoenix, Arizona, or some council seat in Wilkesboro, North Carolina, may be in doubt. In that case, Multivac may be compelled to ask you a deciding question or two. No, said Norman. I won't go through this again. It probably won't happen, Paulson said soothingly. It rarely does. But just in case you'll have to stay. A touch of steel, just a touch, entered his voice. You have no choice, you know. You must. Norman sat down wearily. He shrugged. Paulson said, We can't let you read a newspaper, but if you'd care for a murder mystery, or if you'd like to play chess, or if there's anything we can do for you to help pass the time, I wish you'd mention it. It's all right. I'll just wait. They ushered him into a small room just next to the one in which he had been questioned. He let himself sink into a plastic-covered armchair and closed his eyes. As well as he could, he must wait out this final hour. He sat perfectly still, and slowly the tension left him. His breathing grew less ragged, and he could clasp his hands without being quite so conscious of the trembling of his fingers. Maybe there would be no questions. Maybe it was all over. If it were over, then the next thing would be torchlight processions and invitations to speak at all sorts of functions. The Voter of the Year. He, Norman Muller, ordinary clerk of a small department store in Bloomington, Indiana, who had neither been born great nor achieved greatness, would be in the extraordinary position of having had greatness thrust upon him. The historians would speak soberly of the Muller election of 2008. That would be its name, the Muller election. The publicity, the better job, the flash flood of money that interested Sarah so much occupied only a corner of his mind. It would all be welcome, of course. He couldn't refuse it. But at the moment something else was beginning to concern him. A latent patriotism was stirring. After all, he was representing the entire electorate. He was the focal point for them. He was, in his own person, for this one day, all of America. The door opened, snapping him to open-eyed attention. For a moment his stomach constricted. Not more questions. But Paulson was smiling. That will be all, Mr. Muller. No more questions, sir? None needed. Everything was quite clear-cut. You will be escorted back to your home, and then you will be a private citizen once more. Or as much so as the public will allow. Thank you. Thank you. Norman flushed and said, I wonder who was elected. Paulson shook his head. That will have to wait for the official announcement. The rules are quite strict. We can't even tell you. You understand. Of course, yes. Norman felt embarrassed. Secret Service will have the necessary papers for you to sign. Yes. Suddenly, Norman Muller felt proud. It was on him now in full strength. He was proud. In this imperfect world, the sovereign citizens of the first and greatest electronic democracy had, through Norman Muller, through him, exercised once again its free, untrammeled franchise. Jokester Noel Meyerhoff consulted the list he had prepared and chose which item was to be first. As usual, he relied mainly on intuition. He was dwarfed by the machine he faced, though only the smallest portion of the latter was in view. That didn't matter. 
He spoke with the offhand confidence of one who thoroughly knew he was master. Johnson, he said, came home unexpectedly from a business trip to find his wife in the arms of his best friend. He staggered back and said, Max, I'm married to the lady, so I have to. But why you? Meyerhoff thought, Okay, let that trickle down into its guts and gurgle about a bit. And a voice behind him said, Hey! Meyerhoff erased the sound of that monosyllable and put the circuit he was using into neutral. He whirled and said, I'm working, don't you knock? He did not smile as he customarily did in greeting Timothy Whistler, a senior analyst with whom he dealt as often as with any. He frowned as he would have for an interruption by a stranger, wrinkling his thin face into a distortion that seemed to extend to his hair, rumpling it more than ever. Whistler shrugged. He wore his white lab coat with his fists pressing down within its pockets and creasing it into tense vertical lines. I knocked. You didn't answer. The operation signal wasn't on. Meyerhoff grunted. It wasn't at that. He'd been thinking about this new project too intensively, and he was forgetting little details. And yet he could scarcely blame himself for that. This thing was important. He didn't know why it was, of course. Grand Masters rarely did. That's what made them Grand Masters. The fact that they were beyond reason. How else could the human mind keep up with that ten-mile-long lump of solidified reason that men called Multivac, the most complex computer ever built? Meyerhoff said, I am working. Is there something important on your mind? Nothing that can't be postponed. There are a few holes in the answer on the hyperspatial... Whistler did a double take, and his face took on a rueful look of uncertainty. Working? Yes. What about it? But... He looked about, staring into the crannies of the shallow room that faced the banks upon banks of relays that formed a small portion of multivac. There isn't anyone here at that. Who said there was, or should be? You were telling one of your jokes, weren't you? And? Whistler forced a smile. Don't tell me you were telling a joke to Multivac. Meyerhoff stiffened. Why not? Were you? Yes. Why? Meyerhoff stared the other down. I don't have to account to you, or to anyone. Good Lord, of course not. I was curious, that's all. But then, if you're working, I'll leave. He looked about once more, frowning. Do so, said Meyerhoff. His eyes followed the other out, and then he activated the operation signal with a savage punch of his finger. He strode the length of the room and back, getting himself in hand. Damn Whistler, damn them all, because he didn't bother to hold those technicians, analysts, and mechanics at the proper social distance, because he treated them as though they too were creative artists, they took these liberties. He thought grimly, they can't even tell jokes decently. And instantly that brought him back to the task in hand. He sat down again. Devil take them all. He threw the proper multivac circuit back into operation and said, the ship's steward stopped at the rail of the ship during a particularly rough ocean crossing and gazed compassionately at the man whose slumped position over the rail and whose intensity of gaze toward the depths betokened all too well the ravages of seasickness. Gently, the steward patted the man's shoulder. Cheer up, sir, he murmured. I know it seems bad, but really, you know, nobody ever dies of seasickness. The afflicted gentleman lifted his greenish, tortured face to his comforter and gasped in hoarse accents, Don't say that, man. For heaven's sake, don't say that. It's only the hope of dying that's keeping me alive. Timothy Whistler, a bit preoccupied, nevertheless smiled and nodded as he passed the secretary's desk. She smiled back at him. Here, he thought, was an archaic item in this computer-ridden world of the 21st century, a human secretary. But then perhaps it was natural that such an institution should survive here in the very citadel of computerdom, in the gigantic world corporation that handled multivac. 
with multivac filling the horizons, lesser computers for trivial tasks would have been in poor taste. Whistler stepped into Abram Trask's office. That government official paused in his careful task of lighting a pipe. His dark eyes flicked in Whistler's direction, and his beaked nose stood out sharply and prominently against the rectangle of window behind him. Ah, there, Whistler, sit down, sit down. Whistler did so. I think we've got a problem, Trask. Trask half smiled. Not a technical one, I hope. I'm just an innocent politician. It was one of his favorite phrases. It involves Meyerhoff. Trask sat down instantly and looked acutely miserable. Are you sure? Reasonably sure. Whistler understood the other's sudden unhappiness well. Trask was the government official in charge of the Division of Computers and Automation of the Department of the Interior. He was expected to deal with matters of policy involving the human satellites of Multivac, just as those technically trained satellites were expected to deal with Multivac itself. But a Grand Master was more than just a satellite, more even than just a human. Early in the history of Multivac, it had become apparent that the bottleneck was the questioning procedure. Multivac could answer the problem of humanity. All the problems, if. If it were asked meaningful questions. But as knowledge accumulated at an ever faster rate, it became ever more difficult to locate those meaningful questions. Reason alone wouldn't do. What was needed was a rare type of intuition, the same faculty of mind, only much more intensified, that made a grand master at chess. A mind was needed of the sort that could see through the quadrillions of chess patterns to find the one best move and do it in a matter of minutes. Trask moved restlessly. What's Meyerhoff been doing? He's introduced a line of questioning that I find disturbing. Oh, come on, Whistler. Is that all? You can't stop a Grand Master from going through any line of questioning he chooses. Neither you nor I are equipped to judge the worth of his questions. You know that. I know you know that. I do, of course. But I also know Meyerhoff. Have you ever met him socially? Good Lord, no. Does anyone meet any Grand Master socially? Don't take that attitude, Trask. They're human and they're to be pitied. Have you ever thought what it must be like to be a Grand Master? To know there are only some twelve like you in the world? To know that only one or two come up per generation? That the world depends on you? That a thousand mathematicians, logicians, psychologists, and physical scientists wait on you? Trask shrugged and muttered, Good Lord, I'd feel king of the world. I don't think you would, said the senior analyst impatiently. They feel kings of nothing. They have no equal to talk to, no sensation of belonging. Listen, Meyerhoff never misses a chance to get together with the boys. He isn't married, naturally. He doesn't drink. He has no natural social touch. Yet he forces himself into company because he must. And do you know what he does when he gets together with us, and that's at least once a week? I haven't the least idea, said the government man. This is all new to me. He's a jokester. What? He tells jokes. Good ones. He's terrific. He can take any story, however old and dull, and make it sound good. It's the way he tells it. He has a flair. I see. Well, good. Or bad. These jokes are important to him. Whistler put both elbows on Trask's desk, bit at a thumbnail, and stared into the air. He's different. He knows he's different. And these jokes are the one way he feels he can get the rest of us ordinary schmoes to accept him. We laugh. We howl. We clap him on the back and even forget he's a grand master. It's the only hold he has on the rest of us. This is all interesting. I didn't know you were such a psychologist. Still, where does this lead? Just this. What do you suppose happens if Meyerhoff runs out of jokes? What? The government man stared blankly. If he starts repeating himself, 
if his audience starts laughing less heartily or stops laughing altogether. It's his only hold on our approval. Without it, he'll be alone, and then what would happen to him? After all, Trask, he's one of the dozen men mankind can't do without. We can't let anything happen to him. I don't mean just physical things. We can't even let him get too unhappy. Who knows how that might affect his intuition? Well, has he started repeating himself? Not as far as I know, but I think he thinks he has. Why do you say that? Because I've heard him telling jokes to Multivac. Oh, no. Accidentally. I walked in on him and he threw me out. He was savage. He's usually good-natured enough, and I consider it a bad sign that he was so upset at the intrusion. But the fact remains that he was telling a joke to Multivac, and I'm convinced it was one of a series. But why? Whistler shrugged and rubbed a hand fiercely across his chin. I have a thought about that. I think he's trying to build up a store of jokes in Multivac's memory banks in order to get back new variations. You see what I mean? He's planning a mechanical jokester, so that he can have an infinite number of jokes at hand and never fear running out. Good Lord. Objectively, there may be nothing wrong with that, but I consider it a bad sign when a Grand Master starts using Multivac for his personal problems. Any Grand Master has a certain inherent mental instability, and he should be watched. Meyerhoff may be approaching a borderline beyond which we lose a Grand Master. Trask said blankly, What are you suggesting I do? You can check me. I'm too close to him to judge well, maybe, and judging humans isn't my particular talent anyway. You're a politician. It's more your talent. Judging humans, perhaps, not Grand Masters. They're human, too. Besides, who else is to do it? The fingers on Trask's hand struck his desk in rapid succession over and over, like a slow and muted roll of drums. I suppose I'll have to, he said. Meyerhoff said to Multivac, The ardent swain, picking a bouquet of wild flowers for his loved one, was disconcerted to find himself suddenly in the same field with a large bull of unfriendly appearance which, gazing at him steadily, pawed the ground in a threatening manner. The young man, spying a farmer on the other side of a fairly distant fence, shouted, Hey, mister, is that bull safe? The farmer surveyed the situation with a critical eye, spat to one side and called back, He's safe as anything. He spat again and added, Can't say the same about you, though. Meyerhoff was about to pass on to the next when the summons came. It wasn't really a summons. No one could summon a Grand Master. It was only a message that Division Head Trask would like very much to see Grand Master Meyerhoff if Grand Master Meyerhoff could spare him the time. Meyerhoff might, with impunity, have tossed the message to one side and continued with whatever he was doing. He was not subject to discipline. On the other hand, were he to do that, they would continue to bother him. Oh, very respectfully, but they would continue to bother him. So he neutralized the pertinent circuits of multivac and locked them into place. He put the freeze signal on his office so that no one would dare enter in his absence, and left for Trask's office. Trask coughed and felt a bit intimidated by the sullen fierceness of the other's look. He said, We have not had occasion to know one another, Grand Master, to my great regret. I have reported to you, said Meyerhoff stiffly. Trask wondered what lay behind those keen, wild eyes. It was difficult for him to imagine Meyerhoff with his thin face, his dark, straight hair, his intense air, even unbending long enough to tell funny stories. He said, Reports are not social acquaintance. I... I have been given to understand you have a marvelous fund of anecdotes. I am a jokester, sir. That's the phrase people use. A jokester. They haven't used the phrase to me, Grand Master. They have said, 
The hell with them. I don't care what they've said. See here, Trask, do you want to hear a joke? He leaned forward across the desk, his eyes narrowed. By all means, certainly, said Trask with an effort at heartiness. All right, here's the joke. Mrs. Jones stared at the fortune card that had emerged from the weighing machine in response to her husband's penny. She said, It says here, George, that you're suave, intelligent, far-seeing, industrious, and attractive to women. With that, she turned the card over and added, And they have your weight wrong, too. Trask laughed. It was almost impossible not to. Although the punchline was predictable, the surprising facility with which Meyerhoff had produced just the tone of contemptuous disdain in the woman's voice, and the cleverness with which he had contorted the lines of his face to suit that tone carried the politician helplessly into laughter. Meyerhoff said sharply, Why is that funny? Trask sobered. I beg your pardon? I said, Why is that funny? Why do you laugh? Well said Trask, trying to be reasonable. The last line put everything that preceded in a new light. The unexpectedness. The point is, said Meyerhoff, that I have pictured a husband being humiliated by his wife, a marriage that is such a failure that the wife is convinced that her husband lacks any virtue. Yet you laugh at that. If you were the husband, would you find it funny? He waited a moment in thought, then said, Try this one, Trask. Abner was seated at his wife's sick bed, weeping uncontrollably, when his wife, mustering the dregs of her strength, drew herself up on one elbow. Abner, she whispered. Abner, I cannot go to my maker without confessing my misdeed. Not now, muttered the stricken husband. Not now, my dear. Lie back and rest. I cannot, she cried. I must tell you or my soul will never know peace. I have been unfaithful to you, Abner. In this very house, not one month ago. Hush, dear, soothed Abner. I know all about it. Why else have I poisoned you? Trask tried desperately to maintain equanimity, but did not entirely succeed. He suppressed a chuckle imperfectly. Meyerhoff said, So that's funny, too. Adultery, murder, all funny. Well, now, said Trask, books have been written analyzing humor. True enough, said Meyerhoff, and I've read a number of them. What's more, I've read most of them to Multivac. Still, the people who write the books are just guessing. Some of them say we laugh because we feel superior to the people in the joke. Some say it is because of a suddenly realized incongruity or a sudden relief from tension, or a sudden reinterpretation of events. Is there any simple reason? Different people laugh at different jokes. No joke is universal. Some people don't laugh at any joke. Yet what may be most important is that man is the only animal with a true sense of humor, the only animal that laughs. Trask said suddenly, I understand. You're trying to analyze humor. That's why you're transmitting a series of jokes to Multivac. Who told you I was doing that? Never mind, it was Whistler. I remember now. He surprised me at it. Well, what about it? Nothing at all. You don't dispute my right to add anything I wish to Multivac's general fund of knowledge, or to ask any question I wish? No, not at all, said Trask hastily. As a matter of fact, I have no doubt that this will open the way to new analyses of great interest to psychologists. Humph. Maybe. Just the same, there's something plaguing me that's more important than just the general analysis of humor. There's a specific question I have to ask. Two of them, really. Oh, what's that? Trask wondered if the other would answer. There would be no way of compelling him if he chose not to. But Meyerhoff said, the first question is this, where do all these jokes come from? What? Who makes them up? Listen, about a month ago I spent an evening swapping jokes. As usual, I told most of them, and as usual the fools laughed. Maybe they really thought the jokes were funny, and maybe they were just humoring me. In any case, one creature took the liberty of slapping me on the back and saying, Meyerhoff, 
You know more jokes than any ten people I know. I'm sure he was right, but it gave rise to a thought. I don't know how many hundreds or perhaps thousands of jokes I've told at one time or another in my life, yet the fact is I never made up one, not one. I'd only repeated them. My only contribution was to tell them. To begin with, I'd neither heard them or read them and the source of my hearing or reading didn't make up the jokes either. I never met anyone who ever claimed to have constructed a joke. It's always, I heard a good one the other day, and heard any good ones lately? All the jokes are old. That's why jokes exhibit such a social lag. They still deal with seasickness, for instance, when that's easily prevented these days and never experienced or they'll deal with fortune-giving weighing machines, like the joke I told you, when such machines are found only in antique shops. Well, then, who makes up the jokes? Trask said, Is that what you're trying to find out? It was on the tip of Trask's tongue to add, Good Lord, who cares? He forced that impulse down. A grand master's questions were always meaningful. Of course that's what I'm trying to find out. Think of it this way. It's not just that jokes happen to be old. They must be old to be enjoyed. It's essential that a joke not be original. There's one variety of humor that is or can be original, and that's the pun. I've heard puns that were obviously made up on the spur of the moment. I have made some up myself. But no one laughs at such puns. You're not supposed to. You groan. The better the pun, the louder the groan. Original humor is not laugh-provoking. Why? I'm sure I don't know. All right, let's find out. Having given Multivac all the information I thought advisable on the general topic of humor, I am now feeding it selected jokes. Trask found himself intrigued. Selected how? he asked. I don't know, said Meyerhoff. They felt like the right ones. I'm Grand Master, you know. Oh, agreed, agreed. From those jokes and the general philosophy of humor, my first request will be for Multivac to trace the origin of the jokes, if it can. Since Whistler is in on this and since he has seen fit to report it to you, have him down in analysis day after tomorrow. I think he'll have a bit of work to do. Certainly. May I attend, too? Meyerhoff shrugged. Trask's attendance was obviously a matter of indifference to him. Meyerhoff had selected the last in the series with particular care. What that care consisted of, he could not have said. But he had revolved a dozen possibilities in his mind and over and over again had tested each for some indefinable quality of meaningfulness. He said, Ugh, the caveman, observed his mate running to him in tears, her leopard-skin skirt in disorder. Ugh, she cried, distraught. Do something quickly. A saber-toothed tiger has entered Mother's cave. Do something. Ugh grunted, picked up his well-gnawed buffalo bone, and said, Why do anything? Who the hell cares what happens to a saber-toothed tiger? It was then that Meyerhoff asked his two questions and leaned back closing his eyes. He was done. I saw absolutely nothing wrong, said Trask to Whistler. He told me what he was doing readily enough, and it was odd but legitimate. What he claimed he was doing, said Whistler. Even so, I can't stop a grand master on opinion alone. He seemed queer, but after all, grand masters are supposed to seem queer. I didn't think him insane. Using Multivac to find the source of jokes? muttered the senior analyst in discontent. That's not insane? How can we tell? asked Trask irritably. Science has advanced to the point where the only meaningful questions left are the ridiculous ones. The sensible ones have been thought of, asked, and answered long ago. It's no use. I'm bothered. Maybe. But there's no choice now, Whistler. We'll see Meyerhoff, and you can do the necessary analysis of Multivax response, if any. As for me, my only job is to handle the red tape. 
Good Lord. I don't even know what a senior analyst such as yourself is supposed to do except analyze, and that doesn't help me any. Whistler said, It's simple enough. A grand master like Meyerhoff asks questions and Multivac automatically formulates them into quantities and operations. The necessary machinery for converting words to symbols is what makes up most of the bulk of Multivac. Multivac then gives the answer in quantities and operations, but it doesn't translate that back into words except in the most simple and routine cases. If it were designed to solve the general retranslation problem, its bulk would have to be quadrupled at least. I see. Then it's your job to translate these symbols into words? My job and that of other analysts? We use smaller, specially designed computers whenever necessary. Whistler smiled grimly. Like the Delphic priests of ancient Greece, Multivac gives oracular and obscure answers. Only we have translators, you see. They had arrived. Meyerhoff was waiting. Whistler said briskly, What circuits did you use, Grand Master? Meyerhoff told him and Whistler went to work. Trask tried to follow what was happening, but none of it made sense. The government official watched a spool unreal with a pattern of dots in endless incomprehensibility. Grand Master Meyerhoff stood indifferently to one side while Whistler surveyed the pattern as it emerged. The analyst had put on headphones and a mouthpiece, and at intervals murmured a series of instructions which, at some far-off place, guided assistance through electronic contortions in other computers. Occasionally Whistler listened, then punched combinations on a complex keyboard marked with symbols that looked vaguely mathematical but weren't. A good deal more than an hour's time elapsed. The frown on Whistler's face grew deeper. Once he looked up at the two others and began, This is unbel- and turned back to his work. Finally he said hoarsely, I can't give you an official answer. His eyes were red-rimmed. The official answer awaits complete analysis. Do you want it unofficial? Go ahead, said Meyerhoff. Trask nodded. Whistler darted a hangdog glance at the Grand Master. Ask a foolish question, he said. Then gruffly, Multivac says extraterrestrial origin. What are you saying? demanded Trask. Don't you hear me? The jokes we laugh at were not made up by any man. Multivac has analyzed all data given it, and the one answer that best fits that data is that some extraterrestrial intelligence has composed the jokes, all of them, and placed them in selected human minds at selected times and places in such a way that no man is conscious of having made one up. All subsequent jokes are minor variations and adaptations of these grand originals. Meyerhoff broke in, face flushed with the kind of triumph only a grand master can know who once again has asked the right question. All comedy writers, he said, work by twisting old jokes to new purposes. That's well known. The answer fits. But why? asked Trask. Why make up the jokes? Multivac says, said Whistler, that the only purpose that fits all the data is that the jokes are intended to study human psychology. We study rat psychology by making the rats solve mazes. The rats don't know why and wouldn't even if they were aware of what was going on, which they're not. These outer intelligences study man's psychology by noting individual reactions to carefully selected anecdotes. Each man reacts differently. Presumably these outer intelligences are to us as we are to rats. He shuddered. Trask, eyes staring, said, The Grand Master said man is the only animal with a sense of humor. It would seem, then, that the sense of humor is foisted upon us from without. Meyerhoff added excitedly, And for possible humor created from within, we have no laughter. Puns, I mean. Whistler said, Presumably the extraterrestrials cancel out reactions to spontaneous jokes to avoid confusion. Trask said in sudden agony of spirit, Come on now, good lord. Do either of you believe this? 
The senior analyst looked at him coldly. Multivac says so. It's all that can be said so far. It has pointed out the real jokesters of the universe, and if we want to know more, the matter will have to be followed up. He added in a whisper, If anyone dares follow it up. Grandmaster Meyerhoff said suddenly, I ask two questions, you know. So far, only the first has been answered. I think Multivac has enough data to answer the second. Whistler shrugged. He seemed a half-broken man. When the Grand Master thinks there is enough data, he said, I'll make a book on it. What is your second question? I asked this. What will be the effect on the human race of discovering the answer to my first question? Why did you ask that? demanded Trask. Just a feeling that it had to be asked, said Meyerhoff. Trask said, Insane. It's all insane. And turned away. Even he himself felt how strangely he and Whistler had changed sides. Now it was Trask crying insanity. Trask closed his eyes. He might cry insanity all he wished, but no man in fifty years had doubted the combination of the Grand Master and Multivac and found his doubts verified. Whistler worked silently, teeth clenched. He put Multivac and its subsidiary machines through their paces again. Another hour passed and he laughed harshly. A raving nightmare! What's the answer? asked Meyerhoff. I want Multivac's remarks, not yours. All right, take it. Multivac states that once even a single human discovers the truth of this method of psychological analysis of the human mind, it will become useless as an objective technique to those extraterrestrial powers now using it. You mean there won't be any more jokes handed out to humanity? asked Trask faintly. Or what do you mean? No more jokes, said Whistler. Now. Multivac says now. The experiment is ended now. A new technique will have to be introduced. They stared at each other. The minutes passed. Meyerhoff said slowly, Multivac is right. Whistler said haggardly, I know. Even Trask said in a whisper, Yes, it must be. It was Meyerhoff who put his finger on the proof of it. Meyerhoff, the accomplished jokester. He said, It's over, you know, all over. I've been trying for five minutes now and I can't think of one single joke. Not one. And if I read one in a book, I wouldn't laugh. I know. The gift of humor is gone, said Trask drearily. No man will ever laugh again. And they remained there, staring, feeling the world shrink down to the dimensions of an experimental rat cage, with the maze removed and something, something about to be put in its place. The Last Question the last question was asked for the first time half in jest on May 21st, 2061, at a time when humanity first stepped into the light. The question came about as a result of a $5 bet over highballs, and it happened this way. Alexander Adele and Bertram Lupov were two of the faithful attendants of Multivac. As well as any human beings could, they knew what lay behind the cold, clicking, flashing face, miles and miles of face, of that giant computer. They had at least a vague notion of the general plan of relays and circuits that had long since grown past the point where any single human could possibly have a firm grasp of the whole. Multivac was self-adjusting and self-correcting. It had to be for nothing human could adjust and correct it quickly enough or even adequately enough. So Adele and Lupoff attended the monstrous giant only lightly and superficially, yet as well as any men could. They fed it data, adjusted questions to its needs, and translated the answers that were issued. Certainly they and all others like them were fully entitled to share in the glory that was Multivax. For decades, Multivac had helped design the ships and plot the trajectories that enabled man to reach the moon, Mars, and Venus. But past that, 
Earth's poor resources could not support the ships. Too much energy was needed for the long trips. Earth exploited its coal and uranium with increasing efficiency, but there was only so much of both. But slowly, Multivac learned enough to answer deeper questions more fundamentally. And on May 14, 2061, what had been theory became fact. The energy of the sun was stored, converted, and utilized directly on a planet-wide scale. All Earth turned off its burning coal, its fissioning uranium, and flipped the switch that connected all of it to a small station one mile in diameter, circling the Earth at half the distance of the moon. All Earth ran by invisible beams of sun power. Seven days had not sufficed to dim the glory of it, and Adele and Lupoff finally managed to escape from the public function and to meet in quiet where no one would think of looking for them, in the deserted underground chambers where portions of the mighty buried body of Multivac showed. Unattended, idling, sorting data with contented lazy clickings, Multivac too had earned its vacation and the boys appreciated that. They had no intention, originally, of disturbing it. They had brought a bottle with them, and their only concern at the moment was to relax in the company of each other and the bottle. It's amazing when you think of it, said Adele. His broad face had lines of weariness in it, and he stirred his drink slowly with a glass rod, watching the cubes of ice slur clumsily about. All the energy we could ever use, forever and forever and forever. Lupov cocked his head sideways. He had a trick of doing that when he wanted to be contrary, and he wanted to be contrary now, partly because he had had to carry the ice and glassware. Not forever, he said. Oh, hell, just about forever. Till the sun runs down, Bert. That's not forever. All right, then. Billions and billions of years. Twenty billion, maybe. Are you satisfied? Lupov put his fingers through his thinning hair as though to reassure himself that some was still left, and sipped gently at his own drink. Twenty billion years isn't forever. Well, it will last our time, won't it? So would the coal and uranium. All right, but now we can hook up each individual spaceship to the solar station, and it can go to Pluto and back a million times without ever worrying about fuel. You can't do that on coal and uranium. Ask Multivac if you don't believe me. I don't have to ask Multivac. I know that. Then stop running down what Multivac's done for us, said Adele, blazing up. It did all right. Who says it didn't? What I say is that a sun won't last forever. That's all I'm saying. We're safe for twenty billion years. But then what? Lupov pointed a slightly shaky finger at the other. And don't say we'll switch to another sun. There was silence for a while. Adele put his glass to his lips only occasionally, and Lupov's eyes slowly closed. They rested. Then Lupov's eyes snapped open. You're thinking we'll switch to another sun when ours is done, aren't you? I'm not thinking. Sure you are. You're weak on logic. That's the trouble with you. You're like the guy in the story who was caught in a sudden shower and who ran to a grove of trees and got under one. He wasn't worried, you see, because he figured when one tree got wet through, he would just get under another one. I get it, said Adele. Don't shout. When the sun is done, the other stars will be gone, too. Darn right they will, muttered Lupov. It all had a beginning in the original cosmic explosion, whatever that was, and it'll all have an end when all the stars run down. Some run down faster than others. Hell, the giants won't last a hundred million years. The sun will last twenty billion years, and maybe the dwarfs will last a hundred billion for all the good they are. But just give us a trillion years and everything will be dark. Entropy has to increase to maximum, that's all. I know all about entropy, said Adele, standing on his dignity. The hell you do. I know as much as you do. Then you know everything's got to run down someday. All right, who says they won't? 
You did, you poor sap. You said we had all the energy we needed forever. You said forever. It was Adele's turn to be contrary. Maybe we can build things up again someday, he said. Never. Why not? Someday. Ask Multivac. Never. You ask Multivac. I dare you. Five dollars says it can't be done. Adele was just drunk enough to try, just sober enough to be able to phrase the necessary symbols and operations into a question which, in words, might have corresponded to this. Will mankind one day without the net expenditure of energy be able to restore the sun to its full youthfulness even after it had died of old age? Or maybe it could be put more simply like this. How can the net amount of entropy of the universe be massively decreased? Multivac fell dead and silent. The slow flashing of lights ceased. The distant sounds of clicking relays ended. Then, just as the frightened technicians felt they could hold their breath no longer, there was a sudden springing to life of the teletype attached to that portion of Multivac. Five words were printed. Insufficient data for meaningful answer. Not yet, whispered Lupoff. They left hurriedly. By next morning, the two, plagued with throbbing head and cottony mouth, had forgotten the incident. Jared, Jaredine, and Jaredette the first and second watched the starry picture in the visiplate change as the passage through hyperspace was completed in its non-time lapse. At once, the even powdering of stars gave way to the predominance of a single bright marble disk, centered. That's X-23, said Jared confidently, his thin hands clamped tightly behind his back, and the knuckles whitened. The little Jaredettes, both girls, had experienced the hyperspace passage for the first time in their lives, and were self-conscious over the momentary sensation of inside-outness. They buried their giggles and chased one another wildly about their mother, screaming, We've reached X-23! We've reached X-23! We've... Quiet, children, said Geraldine sharply. Are you sure, Jared? What is there to be but sure? asked Jared, glancing up at the bulge of featureless metal just under the ceiling. It ran the length of the room, disappearing through the wall at either end. It was as long as the ship. Jared scarcely knew a thing about the thick rod of metal except that it was called microvac, that one asked it questions if one wished, that if one did, it still had its task of guiding the ship to a pre-ordered destination, of feeding on energies from the various subgalactic power stations, of computing the equation for the hyperspatial jumps. Jared and his family had only to wait and live in the comfortable residence quarters of the ship. Someone had once told Jared that the AC at the end of the microvac stood for Analog Computer in Ancient English. But he was on the edge of forgetting even that. Geraldine's eyes were moist as she watched the visiplate. I can't help it. I feel funny about leaving Earth. Why, for Pete's sake? demanded Jared. We had nothing there. We'll have everything on X-23. You won't be alone. You won't be a pioneer. There are over a million people on the planet already. Good Lord, our great-grandchildren will be looking for new worlds because X-23 will be overcrowded. Then, after a reflective pause, I tell you it's a lucky thing the computers worked out interstellar travel the way the race is growing. I know, I know, said Geraldine miserably. Geraldette I said promptly, Our microvac is the best microvac in the world. I think so, too, said Jared, tousling her hair. It was a nice feeling to have a microvac of your own, and Jared was glad he was part of his generation and no other. In his father's youth, the only computers had been tremendous machines taking up a hundred square miles of land. There was only one to a planet. Planetary ACs, they were called. 
They had been growing in size steadily for a thousand years, and then, all at once, came refinement. In place of transistors had come molecular valves so that even the largest planetary AC could be put into a space only half the volume of a spaceship. Jared felt uplifted, as he always did when he thought that his own personal microvac was many times more complicated than the ancient and primitive multivac that had first tamed the sun, and almost as complicated as Earth's planetary AC, the largest, that had first solved the problem of hyperspatial travel and had made trips to the stars possible. So many stars, so many planets, sighed Geraldine, busy with her own thoughts. I suppose families will be going to new planets forever the way we are now. Not forever, said Jared with a smile. It will all stop some day, but not for billions of years, many billions. Even the stars run down, you know. Entropy must increase. What's entropy, Daddy? shrilled Jaredet the second. Entropy, little sweet, is just a word which means the amount of running down of the universe. Everything runs down, you know. Like your little walkie-talkie robot, remember? Can't you just put in a new power unit, like with my robot? The stars are the power units, dear. Once they're gone, there are no more power units. Jaredet the first at once set up a howl. Don't let them, Daddy. Don't let the stars run down. Now look what you've done, whispered Jaredine, exasperated. How was I to know it would frighten them? Jared whispered back. Ask the microvac, wailed Jaredet the first. Ask him how to turn the stars on again. Go ahead, said Jaredine. It will quiet them down. Jaredet the second was beginning to cry also. Jared shrugged. Now, now, honeys, I'll ask Microvac. Don't worry, it'll tell us. He asked the Microvac, adding quickly, Print the answer. Jared cupped the strip of thin cellufilm and said cheerfully, See now, the Microvac says it will take care of everything when the time comes, so don't worry. Jaredine said, and now, children, it's time for bed. We'll be in our new home soon. Jared read the words on the cellufilm before destroying it. Insufficient data for meaningful answer. He shrugged and looked at the visiplate. X-23 was just ahead. VJ-23X of Lammoth stared into the black depths of the three-dimensional, small-scale map of the galaxy and said, are we ridiculous, I wonder, in being so concerned about the matter? MQ-17J of Nikron shook his head. I think not. You know the galaxy will be filled in five years at the present rate of expansion. Both seemed in their early twenties. Both were tall and perfectly formed. Still, said VJ-23X, I hesitate to submit a pessimistic report to the Galactic Council. I wouldn't consider any other kind of report. Stir them up a bit. We've got to stir them up. VJ-23X sighed. Space is infinite. A hundred billion galaxies are there for the taking. More. A hundred billion is not infinite, and it's getting less infinite all the time. Consider. Twenty thousand years ago, mankind first solved the problem of utilizing stellar energy, and a few centuries later, interstellar travel became possible. It took mankind a million years to fill one small world, and then only fifteen thousand years to fill the rest of the galaxy. Now the population doubles every ten years. VJ-23X interrupted. We can thank immortality for that. Very well. Immortality exists, and we have to take it into account. I admit it has its seamy side, this immortality. The Galactic AC has solved many problems for us, but in solving the problem of preventing old age and death, it has undone all its other solutions. Yet you wouldn't want to abandon life, I suppose. Not at all, snapped MQ-17J, softening it at once to... Not yet. I'm by no means old enough. How old are you? 223, 
And you? I'm still under 200. But to get back to my point, population doubles every 10 years. Once this galaxy is filled, we'll have filled another in 10 years. Another 10 years and we'll have filled two more. Another decade, four more. In a hundred years, we'll have filled a thousand galaxies. In a thousand years, a million galaxies. In ten thousand years, the entire known universe. Then what? VJ23X said, As a side issue, there's a problem of transportation. I wonder how many sun power units it will take to move galaxies of individuals from one galaxy to the next. A very good point. Already mankind consumes two sun power units per year. Most of it's wasted. After all, our own galaxy alone pours out a thousand sun power units a year and we only use two of those. Granted. But even with a hundred percent efficiency, we only stave off the end. Our energy requirements are going up in a geometric progression even faster than our population. We'll run out of energy even sooner than we run out of galaxies. A good point, a very good point. We'll just have to build new stars out of interstellar gas. Or out of dissipated heat? asked MQ-17J sarcastically. There may be some way to reverse entropy. We ought to ask the Galactic AC. BJ-23X was not really serious, but MQ-17J pulled out his AC contact from his pocket and placed it on the table before him. I've half a mind to, he said. It's something the human race will have to face someday. He stared somberly at his small AC contact. It was only two inches cubed and nothing in itself, but it was connected through hyperspace with the great galactic AC that served all mankind. Hyperspace considered, it was an integral part of the galactic AC. MQ-17J paused to wonder if someday in his immortal life he would get to see the galactic AC. It was on a little world of its own, a spider webbing of force beams holding the matter within which surges of sub-mesons took the place of the old clumsy molecular valves. Yet despite its sub-etheric workings, the galactic AC was known to be a full thousand feet across. MQ-17J asked suddenly of his AC contact, Can entropy ever be reversed? VJ-23X looked startled and said at once, Oh, say, I didn't really mean you have to ask that. Why not? We both know entropy can't be reversed. You can't turn smoke and ash back into a tree. Do you have trees on your world? asked MQ-17J. The sound of the galactic AC startled them into silence. Its voice came thin and beautiful out of the small AC contact on the desk. It said, There is insufficient data for a meaningful answer. VJ-23X said, See? The two men thereupon returned to the question of the report they were to make to the Galactic Council. Z Prime's mind spanned the new galaxy with a faint interest in the countless twists of stars that powdered it. He had never seen this one before. Would he ever see them all? So many of them, each with its load of humanity. But a load that was almost a dead weight. More and more the real essence of men was to be found out here, in space. Minds, not bodies. The immortal bodies remained back on the planets in suspension over the eons. Sometimes they roused for material activity, but that was growing rarer. Few new individuals were coming into existence to join the incredibly mighty throng, but what matter? There was little room in the universe for new individuals. Z Prime was roused out of his reverie upon coming across the wispy tendrils of another mind. I am Z Prime, said Z Prime. And you? I am D Sub One. Your galaxy? We call it only the galaxy. And you? We call ours the same. All men call their galaxy their galaxy and nothing more. Why not? True, since all galaxies are the same. Not all galaxies. On one particular galaxy, the race of man must have originated. 
That makes it different. Z Prime said, on which one? I cannot say. The Universal AC would know. Shall we ask him? I am suddenly curious. Z Prime's perceptions broadened until the galaxies themselves shrank and became a new, more diffuse powdering on a much larger background. So many hundreds of billions of them, all with their immortal beings, all carrying their load of intelligence with minds that drifted freely through space. And yet one of them was unique among them all in being the original galaxy. One of them had, in its vague and distant past, a period when it was the only galaxy populated by man. Z Prime was consumed with curiosity to see this galaxy, and he called out, Universal AC, on which galaxy did mankind originate? The Universal AC heard, for on every world and throughout space it had its receptors ready, and each receptor led through hyperspace to some unknown point where the Universal AC kept itself aloof. Z Prime knew of only one man whose thoughts had penetrated within sensing distance of Universal AC, and he reported only a shining globe, two feet across, difficult to see. But how can that be all of Universal AC? Z Prime had asked. Most of it, had been the answer, is in hyperspace. In what form it is there I cannot imagine. Nor could anyone. For the day had long since passed, Z Prime knew, when any man had any part of the making of a Universal AC. Each Universal AC designed and constructed its successor. Each, during its existence of a million years or more, accumulated the necessary data to build a better and more intricate, more capable successor in which its own store of data and individuality would be submerged. The Universal AC interrupted Z Prime's wandering thoughts, not with words, but with guidance. Z Prime's mentality was guided into the dim sea of galaxies and one in particular enlarged into stars. A thought came, infinitely distant but infinitely clear. This is the original galaxy of man. But it was the same after all, the same as any other, and Z Prime stifled his disappointment. D sub one, whose mind had accompanied the other, said suddenly, And is one of these stars the original star of man? The universal AC said, Man's original star has gone nova. It is a white dwarf. Did the men upon it die? asked Z prime, startled and without thinking. The universal AC said, A new world as in such cases, was constructed for their physical bodies in time. Yes, of course, said Z Prime, but a sense of loss overwhelmed him even so. His mind released its hold on the original galaxy of man, let it spring back and lose itself among the blurred pinpoints. He never wanted to see it again. D Sub One said, What is wrong? The stars are dying. The original star is dead. They must all die. Why not? But when all energy is gone, our bodies will finally die, and you and I with them. It will take billions of years. I do not wish it to happen even after billions of years. Universal AC. How may stars be kept from dying? D Sub 1 said in amusement, you're asking how entropy might be reversed in direction. And the Universal AC answered, There is as yet insufficient data for a meaningful answer. Z Prime's thoughts fled back to his own galaxy. He gave no further thought to D Sub 1, whose body might be waiting on a galaxy a trillion light years away, or on the star next to Z Prime's own. It didn't matter. Unhappily, Z Prime began collecting interstellar hydrogen out of which to build a small star of his own. If the stars must someday die, at least some could yet be built. Man considered with himself, for in a way, man mentally was one. He consisted of a trillion, trillion, trillion ageless bodies, each in its place, each resting quiet and incorruptible each cared for by perfect automatons, equally incorruptible, 
while the minds of all the bodies freely melted one into the other, indistinguishable. Man said, The universe is dying. Man looked about at the dimming galaxies. The giant stars, spendthrifts, were gone long ago, back in the dimmest of the dim far past. Almost all stars were white dwarfs, fading to the end. New stars had been built, of the dust between the stars, some by natural processes, some by man himself, and those were going too. White dwarfs might yet be crashed together, and of the mighty forces so released, new stars built, but only one star for every thousand white dwarfs destroyed, and those would come to an end too. Man said, carefully husbanded, as directed by the cosmic AC, the energy that is even yet left in all the universe will last for billions of years. But even so, said man, eventually it will all come to an end. However it may be husbanded, however stretched out, the energy once expended is gone and cannot be restored. Entropy must increase forever to the maximum. Man said, Can entropy not be reversed? Let us ask the cosmic A.C. The cosmic A.C. surrounded them, but not in space. Not a fragment of it was in space. It was in hyperspace and made of something that was neither matter nor energy. The question of its size and nature no longer had meaning in any terms that man could comprehend. Cosmic A.C., said man, how can entropy be reversed? The cosmic A.C. said, there is as yet insufficient data for a meaningful answer. Man said, Collect additional data. The cosmic AC said, I will do so. I have been doing so for a hundred billion years. My predecessors have been asked this question many times. All the data I have remains insufficient. Will there come a time, said man, when data will be sufficient, or is the problem insoluble in all conceivable circumstances? The cosmic AC said, No problem is insoluble in all conceivable circumstances. Man said, When will you have enough data to answer the question? The cosmic AC said, There is as yet insufficient data for a meaningful answer. Will you keep working on it? asked man. The cosmic A.C. said, I will. Man said, We shall wait. The stars and galaxies died and snuffed out, and space grew black after ten trillion years of running down. One by one man fused with A.C., each physical body losing its mental identity in a manner that was somehow not a loss but a gain. Man's last mind paused before fusion, looking over a space that included nothing but the dregs of one last dark star, and nothing besides but incredibly thin matter, agitated randomly by the tag ends of heat wearing out, asymptotically, to the absolute zero. Man said, A.C., is this the end? Can this chaos not be reversed into the universe once more? Can that not be done? A.C. said, there is as yet insufficient data for a meaningful answer. Man's last mind fused and only A.C. existed, and that in hyperspace. Matter and energy had ended and with it space and time. Even A.C. existed only for the sake of the one last question that it had never answered from the time a half-drunken technician ten trillion years before had asked the question of a computer that was to A.C. far less than was a man to man. All other questions had been answered, and until this last question was answered also, A.C. might not release his consciousness. All collected data had come to a final end. Nothing was left to be collected, but all collected data had yet to be completely correlated and put together in all possible relationships. A timeless interval was spent in doing that. And it came to pass that A.C. learned how to reverse the direction of entropy. But there was now no man to whom A.C. might give the answer of the last question. No matter. The answer, by demonstration, 
would take care of that, too. For another timeless interval, A.C. thought how best to do this. Carefully, A.C. organized the program. The consciousness of A.C. encompassed all of what had once been a universe and brooded over what was now chaos. Step by step it must be done. And A.C. said, Let there be light. And there was light. Does a bee care? The ship began as a metal skeleton. Slowly a shining skin was layered on without, and odd-shaped vitals were crammed within. Thornton Hammer, of all the individuals but one involved in the growth, did the least physically. Perhaps that was why he was most highly regarded. He handled the mathematical symbols that formed the basis for lines on drafting paper, which in turn formed the basis for the fitting together of the various masses and different forms of energy that went into the ship. Hammer watched now through close-fitting spectacles somberly. Their lenses caught the light of the fluorescent tubes above and sent them out again as highlights. Theodore Lengiel, representing personnel of the corporation that was footing the bill for the project, stood beside him and said, as he pointed with a rigid stabbing finger, There he is. That's the man. Hammer peered. You mean Kane? The fellow in the green overalls, holding a wrench. That's Kane. Now, what is this you've got against him? I want to know what he does. The man's an idiot. Lengiel had a round, plump face, and his jowls quivered a bit. Hammer turned to look at the other, his spare body assuming an air of displeasure along every inch. Have you been bothering him? Bothering him? I've been talking to him. It's my job to talk to the men, to get their viewpoints, to get information out of which I can build campaigns for improved morale. How does Kane disturb that? He's insolent. I asked him how it felt to be working on a ship that would reach the moon. I talked a little about the ship being a pathway to the stars. Perhaps I made a little speech about it, built it up a bit, when he turned away in the rudest possible manner. I called him back and said, Where are you going? And he said, I get tired of that kind of talk. I'm going out to look at the stars. Hammer nodded. All right. Cain likes to look at the stars. It was daytime. The man's an idiot. I've been watching him since, and he doesn't do any work. I know that. Then why is he kept on? Hammer said with a sudden tight fierceness, Because I want him around. Because he's my luck. Your luck? faltered Langell. What the hell does that mean? It means that when he's around, I think better. When he passes me, holding his damned wrench, I get ideas. It's happened three times. I don't explain it. I'm not interested in explaining it. It's happened. He stays. You're joking. No, I'm not. Now leave me alone. Kane stood there in his green overalls, holding his wrench. Dimly, he was aware that the ship was almost ready. It was not designed to carry a man, but there was space for a man. He knew that the way he knew a lot of things, like keeping out of the way of most people most of the time, like carrying a wrench until people grew used to him carrying a wrench and stopped noticing it. Protective coloration consisted of little things, really, like carrying the wrench. He was full of drives he did not fully understand, like looking at the stars. At first, many years back, he had just looked at the stars with a vague ache. Then, slowly, his attention had centered itself on a certain region of the sky, then to a certain pinpointed spot. There were no stars in that spot. There was nothing to see. That spot was high in the night sky in the late spring and in the summer months, and he sometimes spent most of the night watching the spot until it sank toward the southwestern horizon. At other times in the year he would stare at the spot during the day. There was some thought in connection with that spot which he couldn't quite crystallize. It had grown stronger, come nearer to the surface as the years passed, and it was almost bursting for expression now. But still it had not quite come clear. 
Kane shifted restlessly and approached the ship. It was almost complete, almost whole. Everything fitted just so. Almost. For within it, far forward, was a hole a little larger than a man. And leading to that hole was a pathway a little wider than a man. Tomorrow that pathway would be filled with the last of the vitals, and before that was done the hole had to be filled too. But not with anything they planned. Kane moved still closer and no one paid any attention to him. They were used to him. There was a metal ladder that had to be climbed and a catwalk that had to be moved along to enter the last opening. He knew where the opening was as exactly as if he had built the ship with his own hands. He climbed the ladder and moved along the catwalk. There was no one there at the mo- He was wrong. One man. That one said sharply, What are you doing here? Kane straightened and his vague eyes stared at the speaker. He lifted his wrench and brought it down on the speaker's head lightly. The man who was struck, and who had made no effort to ward off the blow, dropped, partly from the effect of the blow. Kane let him lie there without concern. The man would not remain unconscious for long, but long enough to allow Kane to wriggle into the hole. When the man revived, he would recall nothing about Kane or about the fact of his own unconsciousness. There would simply be five minutes taken out of his life that he would never find and never miss. It was dark in the hole, and, of course, there was no ventilation, but Kane paid no attention to that. With the sureness of instinct, he clambered upward toward the hole that would receive him, then lay there, panting, fitting the cavity neatly, as though it were a womb. In two hours they would begin inserting the last of the vitals, close the passage, and leave Cain there unknowingly. Cain would be the sole bit of flesh and blood in a thing of metal and ceramics and fuel. Cain was not afraid of being prematurely discovered. No one in the project knew the hole was there. The design didn't call for it. The mechanics and construction men weren't aware of having put it in. Cain had arranged that entirely by himself. He didn't know how he had arranged it, but he knew he had. He could watch his own influence without knowing how it was exerted. Take the man Hammer, for instance, the leader of the project and the most clearly influenced. Of all the indistinct figures about Kane, he was the least indistinct. Kane would be very aware of him at times, when he passed near him in his slow and hazy journeys about the grounds. It was all that was necessary, passing near him. Kane recalled it had been so before, particularly with theoreticians. When Lisa Meitner decided to test for barium among the products of the neutron bombardment of uranium, Kane had been there, an unnoticed plodder along a corridor nearby. He had been picking up leaves and trash in a park in 1904 when the young Einstein had passed by, pondering. Einstein's steps had quickened with the impact of sudden thought. Kane felt it like an electric shock. But he didn't know how it was done. Does a spider know architectural theory when it begins to construct its first web? It went further back. The day the young Newton had stared at the moon with the dawn of a certain thought, Cain had been there, and further back still. The panorama of New Mexico, ordinarily deserted, was alive with human ants crawling about the metal shaft lancing upward. This one was different from all the similar structures that had preceded it. This would go free of Earth more nearly than any other. It would reach out and circle the moon before falling back. It would be crammed with instruments that would photograph the moon and measure its heat emissions, probe for radioactivity, and test by microwave for chemical structure. It would, by automation, do almost everything that could be expected of a manned vehicle. And it would learn enough to make certain that the next ship sent out would be a manned vehicle. Except that, in a way, this first one was a manned vehicle after all. There were representatives of various governments, of various industries, of various social and economic groupings. 
There were television cameras and feature writers. Those who could not be there watched in their homes and heard numbers counted backward in painstaking monotone in the manner grown traditional in a mere three decades. At zero, the reaction motors came to life and ponderously the ship lifted. Kane heard the noise of the rushing gases as though from a distance, and felt the gathering acceleration press against him. He detached his mind, lifting it up and outward, freeing it from direct connection with his body in order that he might be unaware of the pain and discomfort. Dizzily, he knew his long journey was nearly over. He would no longer have to maneuver carefully to avoid having people realize he was immortal. He would no longer have to fade into the background, no longer wander eternally from place to place, changing names and personality, manipulating minds. It had not been perfect, of course. The myths of the wandering Jew and the flying Dutchman had arisen, but he was still here. He had not been disturbed. He could see his spot in the sky. Through the mass and solidity of the ship he could see it. Or not see, really. He didn't have the proper word. He knew there was a proper word, though. He could not say how he knew a fraction of the things he knew, except that as the centuries had passed he had gradually grown to know them with a sureness that required no reason. He had begun as an ovum or as something for which ovum was the nearest word he knew, deposited on earth before the first cities had been built by the wandering hunting creatures since called men. Earth had been chosen carefully by his progenitor. Not every world would do. What world would? What was the criterion? That he still didn't know. Does an ichneumon wasp study ornithology before it finds the one species of spider that will do for her eggs, and stings it just so in order that it may remain alive? The ovum spilt him forth at length, and he took the shape of a man and lived among men and protected himself against men, and his one purpose was to arrange to have men travel along a path that would end with a ship, and within the ship a hole and within the hole himself. It had taken eight thousand years of slow striving and stumbling. The spot in the sky became sharper now as the ship moved out of the atmosphere. That was the key that opened his mind. That was the piece that completed the puzzle. Stars blinked within that spot that could not be seen by a man's eye unaided. One in particular shone brilliantly and Cain yearned toward it. The expression that had been building within him for so long burst out now. Home, he whispered. He knew? Does a salmon study cartography to find the headwaters of the freshwater stream in which years before it had been born? The final step was taken in the slow maturing that had taken eight thousand years, and Cain was no longer larval, but adult. The adult Cain fled from the human flesh that had protected the larva, and fled the ship too. It hastened onward at inconceivable speeds toward home, from which some day it too might set off on wanderings through space to fertilize some planet with its own. It sped through space, giving no thought to the ship carrying an empty chrysalis. It gave no thought to the fact that it had driven a whole world toward technology and space travel, in order only that the thing that had been Cain might mature and reach its fulfillment. Does a bee care what has happened to a flower when the bee has done and gone its way? Light Verse The very last person anyone would expect to be a murderer was Mrs. Alvis Lardner. Widow of the great astronaut Martyr, she was a philanthropist, an art collector, a hostess extraordinary, and everyone agreed, an artistic genius. But above all, she was the gentlest and kindest human being one could imagine. Her husband, William J. Lardner, died, as we all know, of the effects of radiation from a solar flare, after he had deliberately remained in space so that a passenger vessel might make it safely to Space Station 5. Mrs. Lardner had received a generous pension for that, and she had then invested wisely and well. 
By late middle age, she was very wealthy. Her house was a showplace, a veritable museum, containing a small but extremely select collection of extraordinary beautiful jeweled objects. From a dozen different cultures, she had obtained relics of almost every conceivable artifact that could be embedded with jewels and made to serve the aristocracy of that culture. She had one of the first jeweled wristwatches manufactured in America, a jeweled dagger from Cambodia, a jeweled pair of spectacles from Italy, and so on almost endlessly. All was open for inspection. The artifacts were not insured, and there were no ordinary security provisions. There was no need for anything conventional, for Mrs. Lardner maintained a large staff of robot servants, all of whom could be relied on to guard every item with imperturbable concentration, irreproachable honesty, and irrevocable efficiency. Everyone knew of the existence of those robots, and there is no record of any attempt at theft, ever. And then, of course, there was her light sculpture. How Mrs. Lardner discovered her own genius at the art, no guest at her many lavish entertainments could guess. On each occasion, however, when her house was thrown open to guests, a new symphony of light shone throughout the rooms. Three-dimensional curves and solids in melting color, some pure and some fusing in startling crystalline effects that bathed every guest in wonder, and somehow always adjusted itself so as to make Mrs. Lardner's blue-white hair and soft, unlined face gently beautiful. It was for the light sculpture more than anything else that the guests came. It was never the same twice, and never failed to explore new experimental avenues of art. Many people who could afford light consoles prepared light sculptures for amusement, but no one could approach Mrs. Lardner's expertise. Not even those who considered themselves professional artists. She herself was charmingly modest about it. No, no, she would protest when someone waxed lyrical. I wouldn't call it poetry and light. That's far too kind. At most, I would say it was mere light verse. And everyone smiled at her gentle wit. Though she was often asked, she would never create light sculpture for any occasion but her own parties. That would be commercialization, she said. She had no objection, however, to the preparation of elaborate holograms of her sculptures so that they might be made permanent and reproduced in museums of art all over the world. Nor was there ever a charge for any use that might be made of her light sculptures. I couldn't ask a penny, she said, spreading her arms wide. It's free to all. After all, I have no further use for it myself. It was true. She never used the same light sculpture twice. When the holograms were taken, she was cooperation itself. Watching benignly at every step, she was always ready to order her robot servants to help. Please, Courtney, she would say, would you be so kind as to adjust the stepladder? It was her fashion. She always addressed her robots with the most formal courtesy. Once, years before, she had been almost scolded by a government functionary from the Bureau of Robots and Mechanical Men. You can't do that, he said severely. It interferes with their efficiency. They are constructed to follow orders, and the more clearly you give those orders, the more efficiently they follow them. When you ask with elaborate politeness, it is difficult for them to understand that an order is being given. They react more slowly. Mrs. Lardner lifted her aristocratic head. I do not ask for speed and efficiency, she said. I ask goodwill. My robots love me. The government functionary might have explained that robots cannot love, but he withered under her hurt but gentle glance. It was notorious that Mrs. Lardner never even returned a robot to the factory for adjustment. Their positronic brains are enormously complex, and once in ten times or so the adjustment is not perfect as it leaves the factory. Sometimes the error does not show up for a period of time, but whenever it does, U.S. Robots and Mechanical Men Incorporated always makes the adjustment free of charge. Mrs. Lardner shook her head. 
Once a robot is in my house, she said, and has performed his duties, any minor eccentricities must be borne with. I will not have him manhandled. It was the worst thing possible to try to explain that a robot was but a machine. She would say very stiffly, Nothing that is as intelligent as a robot can ever be but a machine. I treat them as people. And that was that. She kept even Max, although he was almost helpless. He could scarcely understand what was expected of him. Mrs. Lardner denied that strenuously, however. Not at all. She would say firmly, he can take hats and coats and store them very well indeed. He can hold objects for me. He can do many things. But why not have him adjusted? asked a friend once. Oh, I couldn't. He's himself. He's very lovable, you know. After all, a positronic brain is so complex that no one can ever tell in just what way it's off. If he were made perfectly normal, there would be no way to adjust him back to the lovability he now has. I won't give that up. But if he's maladjusted, said the friend, looking at Max nervously, might he not be dangerous? Never, laughed Mrs. Lardner. I've had him for years. He's completely harmless and quite a dear. Actually, he looked like all the other robots, smooth, metallic, vaguely human but expressionless. To the gentle Mrs. Lardner, however, they were all individual, all sweet, all lovable. It was the kind of woman she was. How could she commit murder? The very last person anyone would expect to be murdered would be John Semper Travis. Introverted and gentle, he was in the world but not of it. He had that peculiar mathematical turn of mind that made it possible for him to work out in his mind the complicated tapestry of the myriad positronic brain paths in a robot's mind. He was chief engineer of U.S. Robots and Mechanical Men, Incorporated. But he was also an enthusiastic amateur in light sculpture. He had written a book on the subject, trying to show that the type of mathematics he used in working out positronic brain paths might be modified into a guide to the production of aesthetic light sculpture. His attempt at putting theory into practice was a dismal failure, however. The sculptures he himself produced, following his mathematical principles, were stodgy, mechanical, and uninteresting. It was the only reason for unhappiness in his quiet, introverted, and secure life, and yet it was reason enough for him to be very unhappy indeed. He knew his theories were right, yet he could not make them work, if he could not produce one great piece of light sculpture. Naturally, he knew of Mrs. Lardner's light sculpture. She was universally hailed as a genius. Yet Travis knew she could not understand even the simplest aspect of robotic mathematics. He had corresponded with her, but she consistently refused to explain her methods, and he wondered if she had any at all. Might it not be mere intuition? But even intuition might be reduced to mathematics. Finally, he managed to receive an invitation to one of her parties. He simply had to see her. Mr. Travis arrived rather late. He had made one last attempt at a piece of light sculpture and had failed dismally. He greeted Mrs. Lardner with a kind of puzzled respect and said, That was a peculiar robot who took my hat and coat. That is Max, said Mrs. Lardner. He is quite maladjusted and he's a fairly old model. How is it you did not return it to the factory? Oh, no said Mrs. Lardner. It would be too much trouble. None at all, Mrs. Lardner, said Travis. You would be surprised how simple a task it was. Since I am with U.S. Robots, I took the liberty of adjusting him myself. It took no time, and you'll find he is now in perfect working order. A queer change came over Mrs. Lardner's face. Fury found a place on it for the first time in her gentle life, and it was as though the lines did not know how to form. You adjusted him? she shrieked. But it was he who created my light sculptures. It was the maladjustment, the maladjustment, 
which you can never restore, that, that... It was really unfortunate that she had been showing her collection at the time, and that the jeweled dagger from Cambodia was on the marble tabletop before her. Travis's face was also distorted. You mean if I had studied his uniquely maladjusted positronic brain paths, I might have learned... She lunged with the knife too quickly for anyone to stop her, and he did not try to dodge. Some said he came to meet it, as though he wanted to die. The Feeling of Power Jean Schumann was used to dealing with the man in authority on long embattled Earth. He was only a civilian, but he originated programming patterns that resulted in self-directing war computers of the highest sort. Generals consequently listened to him. Heads of congressional committees, too. There was one of each in the special lounge of New Pentagon. General Wider was space-burnt and had a small mouth puckered almost into a cipher. Congressman Brandt was smooth-cheeked and clear-eyed. He smoked Denebian tobacco, with the air of one whose patriotism was so notorious he could be allowed such liberties. Schumann, tall, distinguished, and programmer first class, faced them fearlessly. He said, This gentleman is my Renob. The one with the unusual gift that you discovered quite by accident, said Congressman Brandt placidly. Ah. He inspected the little man with the egg-bald head with amiable curiosity. The little man, in return, twisted the fingers of his hands anxiously. He had never been near such great men before. He was only an aging, low-grade technician who had long ago failed all tests designed to smoke out the gifted ones among mankind and had settled into the rut of unskilled labor. There was just this hobby of his that the great programmer had found out about and was now making such a frightening fuss over. General Wider said, I find this atmosphere of mystery childish. You won't in a moment, said Schumann. This is not something we can leak to the first comer. Ob. There was something imperative about his manner of biting off that one-syllable name, but then he was a great programmer speaking to a mere technician. Ob, how much is nine times seven? Ob hesitated a moment. His pale eyes glimmered with a feeble anxiety. Sixty-three, he said. Congressman Brandt lifted his eyebrows. Is that right? Check it for yourself, Congressman. The Congressman took out his pocket computer nudged the milled edges twice, looked at its face as it lay there in the palm of his hand, and put it back. He said, Is this the gift you brought us here to demonstrate? An illusionist? More than that, sir. Obe has memorized a few operations, and with them he computes on paper. A paper computer? said the general. He looked pained. No, sir, said Schumann patiently not a paper computer. Simply a sheet of paper. General, would you be so kind as to suggest a number? Seventeen, said the general. And you, congressman? Twenty-three. Good. Ob, multiply those numbers and please show the gentleman your manner of doing it. Yes, programmer, said Ob, ducking his head. He fished a small pad out of one shirt pocket and an artist's hairline stylus out of the other. His forehead corrugated as he made painstaking marks on the paper. General Wider interrupted him sharply. Let's see that. Obe passed him the paper and Wider said, Well, it looks like the figure 17. Congressman Brandt nodded and said, So it does, but I suppose anyone can copy figures off a computer. I think I could make a passable seventeen myself, even without practice. If you will let Obe continue, gentlemen, said Schumann without heat. Obe continued, his hand trembling a little. Finally, he said in a low voice, The answer is 391. Congressman Brandt took out his computer a second time and flicked it. By Godfrey, so it is. 
How did he guess? No guess, Congressman, said Schumann. He computed that result. He did it on this sheet of paper. Humbug, said the general impatiently. A computer is one thing, and marks on paper are another. Explain, Ob, said Schumann. Yes, programmer. Well, gentlemen, I write down 17, and just underneath it, I write 23. Next, I say to myself, 7 times 3. The congressman interrupted smoothly. Now, Ob, the problem is 17 times 23. Yes, I know, said the little technician earnestly. But I start by saying 7 times 3, because that's the way it works. Now, 7 times 3 is 21. And how do you know that? asked the congressman. I just remember it. It's always 21 on the computer. I've checked it any number of times. That doesn't mean it always will be, though, does it? said the congressman. Maybe not, stammered Ob. I'm not a mathematician, but I always get the right answers, you see. Go on. Seven times three is twenty-one, so I write down twenty-one. Then one times three is three, so I write down a three under the two of twenty-one. Why under the two? asked Congressman Brandt at once. Because... Ob looked helplessly at his superior for support. It's difficult to explain. Schumann said, If you will accept his work for the moment, we can leave the details for the mathematicians. Brandt subsided. Ob said, Three plus two makes five, you see, so the twenty-one becomes a fifty-one. Now, you let that go for a while and start fresh. You multiply seven and two, that's fourteen, and one and two, that's two. Put them down like this, and it adds up to thirty-four. Now, if you put the thirty-four under the fifty-one this way and add them, you get three hundred and ninety-one, and that's the answer. There was an instant silence, and then General Wider said, I don't believe it. He goes through this rigmarole and makes up numbers and multiplies and adds them this way and that, but I don't believe it. It's too complicated to be anything but hornswoggling. Oh, no, sir, said Obe in a sweat. It only seems complicated because you're not used to it. Actually, the rules are quite simple and will work for any numbers. Any numbers, eh? said the general. Come, then. He took out his own computer, a severely styled GI model, and struck it at random. Make a 5738 on the paper. That's 5,738. Yes, sir, said Obe, taking a new sheet of paper. Now, more punching of his computer. 7239. 7,239. Yes, sir. And now multiply those two. It will take some time, quavered Obe. Take a time, said the general. Go ahead, Obe, said Schumann crisply. Obe set to work, bending low. He took another sheet of paper and another. The general took out his watch, finally, and stared at it. Are you through with your magic-making, technician? I'm almost done, sir. Here it is, sir. Forty-one million five hundred and thirty-seven thousand three hundred and eighty-two. He showed the scrawled figures of the result. General Wider smiled bitterly. He pushed the multiplication contact on his computer and let the numbers whirl to a halt. And then he stared and said in a surprised squeak, Great! Galaxy, the fellow's right. The president of the Terrestrial Federation had grown haggard in office and, in private, he allowed a look of settled melancholy to appear on his sensitive features. The Denebian War, after its early start of vast movement and great popularity, had trickled down into a sordid matter of maneuver and countermaneuver, with discontent rising steadily on earth. Possibly it was rising on Deneb, too. And now Congressman Brandt, head of the important Committee on Military Appropriations, was cheerfully and smoothly spending his half-hour appointment spouting nonsense. Computing without a computer, said the President impatiently, is a contradiction in terms. Computing, said the Congressman, is only a system for handling data. 
A machine might do it, or the human brain might. Let me give you an example. And using the new skills he had learned, he worked out sums and products until the president, despite himself, grew interested. Does this always work? Every time, Mr. President. It is foolproof. Is it hard to learn? It took me a week to get the real hang of it. I think you would do better. Well, said the president, considering, it's an interesting parlor game, but what is the use of it? What is the use of a newborn baby, Mr. President? At the moment, there is no use. But don't you see that this points the way toward liberation from the machine? Consider, Mr. President. The congressman rose, and his deep voice automatically took on some of the cadences he used in public debate. That the Denebian War is a war of computer against computer. Their computers forge an impenetrable shield of counter-missiles against our missiles, and ours forge one against theirs. If we advance the efficiency of our computers, so do they theirs and for five years a precarious and profitless balance has existed. Now we have in our hands a method for going beyond the computer, leapfrogging it, passing through it. We will combine the mechanics of computation with human thought. We will have the equivalent of intelligent computers, billions of them. I can't predict what the consequences will be in detail, but they will be incalculable. And if Deneb beats us to the punch, they may be unimaginably catastrophic. The president said, troubled, What would you have me do? Put the power of the administration behind the establishment of a secret project on human computation. Call it Project Number, if you like. I can vouch for my committee, but I will need the administration behind me. But how far can human computation go? There is no limit. According to programmer Schumann, who first introduced me to this discovery. I've heard of Schumann, of course. Yes. Well, Dr. Schumann tells me that in theory there is nothing the computer can do that the human mind cannot do. The computer merely takes a finite amount of data and performs a finite number of operations upon them. The human mind can duplicate the process. The president considered that. He said, If Schumann says this, I'm inclined to believe him, in theory. But in practice, how can anyone know how a computer works? Grant laughed genially. Well, Mr. President, I asked the same question. It seems that at one time computers were designed directly by human beings. Those were simple computers, of course, this being before the time of the rational use of computers to design more advanced computers had been established. Yes, yes. Go on. Technician Obe apparently had, as his hobby, the reconstruction of some of these ancient devices, and in so doing, he studied the details of their workings and found he could imitate them. The multiplication I just performed for you is an imitation of the workings of a computer. Amazing! The congressman coughed gently. If I may make another point, Mr. President. The further we can develop this thing, the more we can divert our federal effort from computer production and computer maintenance. As the human brain takes over, more of our energy can be directed into peacetime pursuits and the impingement of war on the ordinary man will be less. This will be most advantageous for the party in power, of course. Ah, said the President, I see your point. Well, sit down, Congressman, sit down. I want some time to think about this. But meanwhile, show me that multiplication trick again. Let's see if I can't catch the point of it. Programmer Schumann did not try to hurry matters. Lesser was conservative, very conservative, and liked to deal with computers as his father and grandfather had. Still, he controlled the West European computer combine, and if he could be persuaded to join Project Number in full enthusiasm, a great deal would be accomplished. But Lesser was holding back. He said, I'm not sure I like the idea of relaxing our hold on computers. The human mind is a capricious thing. 
The computer will give the same answer to the same problem each time. What guarantee have we that the human mind will do the same? The human mind, computer lesser, only manipulates facts. It doesn't matter whether the human mind or a machine does it. They are just tools. Yes, yes, I've gone over your ingenious demonstration that the mind can duplicate the computer, but it seems to me a little in the air. I'll grant the theory, but what reason have we for thinking that theory can be converted to practice? I think we have reason, sir. After all, computers have not always existed. The cavemen with their triremes, stone axes, and railroads had no computers. And possibly they did not compute. You know better than that. Even the building of a railroad or a ziggurat called for some computing and that must have been without computers as we know them. Do you suggest they computed in the fashion you demonstrate? Probably not. After all this method, we call it graphitics, by the way, from the old European word grapho, meaning to write, is developed from the computers themselves, so it cannot have antedated them. Still, the cavemen must have had some method, eh? Lost arts! If you're going to talk about lost arts... No, no. I'm not a lost art enthusiast, though I don't say there may not be some. After all, man was eating grain before hydroponics, and if the primitives ate grain, they must have grown it in soil. What else could they have done? I don't know, but I'll believe in soil growing when I see someone grow grain in soil. And I'll believe in making fire by rubbing two pieces of flint together when I see that, too. Schumann grew placative. Well, let's stick to graphitics. It's just part of the process of etherealization. Transportation by means of bulky contrivances is giving way to direct mass transference. Communications devices become less massive and more efficient constantly. For that matter, compare your pocket computer with the massive jobs of a thousand years ago. Why not, then, the last step of doing away with computers altogether? Come, sir, project number is a going concern. Progress is already headlong. But we want your help. If patriotism doesn't move you, consider the intellectual adventure involved. Lesser said skeptically, What progress? What can you do beyond multiplication? Can you integrate a transcendental function? In time, sir, in time. In the last month, I have learned to handle division. I can determine, and correctly, integral quotients and decimal quotients. Decimal quotients? To how many places? Programmer Schumann tried to keep his tone casual. Any number. Lesser's lower jaw dropped. Without a computer? Set me a problem. Divide 27 by 13. Take it to six places. Five minutes later, Schumann said, 2.076923. Lesser checked it. Well, now, that's amazing. Multiplication didn't impress me too much because it involved integers after all, and I thought trick manipulation might do it, but decimals. And that is not all. There is a new development that is, so far, top secret and which, strictly speaking, I ought not to mention. Still, we may have made a breakthrough on the square root front. Square roots? It involves some tricky points, and we haven't licked the bugs yet, but Technician Obe, the man who invented the science and who has an amazing intuition in connection with it, maintains he has the problem almost solved. And he is only a technician, a man like yourself, a trained and talented mathematician, ought to have no difficulty. Square roots, muttered Lesser, attracted. Cube roots, too. Are you with us? Lesser's hand thrust out suddenly. Count me in. General Wider stumped his way back and forth at the head of the room and addressed his listeners after the fashion of a savage teacher facing a group of recalcitrant students. It made no difference to the general that they were the civilian scientists heading Project Number. The general was the overall head, 
and he so considered himself at every waking moment. He said, Now, square roots are all fine. I can't do them myself, and I don't understand the methods, but they're fine. Still, the project will not be sidetracked into what some of you call the fundamentals. You can play with graphitics any way you want to after the war is over, but right now we have specific and very practical problems to solve. In a far corner, Technician Ob listened with painful attention. He was no longer a technician, of course, having been relieved of his duties and assigned to the project, with a fine-sounding title and good pay. But, of course, the social distinction remained, and the highly placed scientific leaders could never bring themselves to admit him to their ranks on a footing of equality. Nor, to do Ob justice, did he himself wish it. He was as uncomfortable with them as they with him. The general was saying, Our goal is a simple one, gentlemen, the replacement of the computer. A ship that can navigate space without a computer on board can be constructed in one-fifth the time and at one-tenth the expense of a computer-laden ship. We could build fleets five times, ten times as great as Deneb could if we could but eliminate the computer. And I see something even beyond this. It may be fantastic now, a mere dream, but in the future I see the manned missile. There was an instant murmur from the audience. The general drove on. At the present time, our chief bottleneck is the fact that missiles are limited in intelligence. The computer controlling them can only be so large, and for that reason they can meet the changing nature of anti-missile defenses in an unsatisfactory way. Few missiles, if any, accomplish their goal, and missile warfare is coming to a dead end. For the enemy, fortunately, as well as for ourselves. On the other hand, a missile with a man or two within, controlling flight by graphitics, would be lighter, more mobile, more intelligent. It would give us a lead that might well mean the margin of victory. Besides which, gentlemen, the exigencies of war compel us to remember one thing. A man is much more dispensable than a computer. Manned missiles could be launched in numbers and under circumstances that no good general would care to undertake as far as computer-directed missiles are concerned. He said much more, but Technician Obe did not wait. Technician Obe, in the privacy of his quarters, labored long over the note he was leaving behind. It read finally as follows. When I began the study of what is now called graphitics, it was no more than a hobby. I saw no more in it than an interesting amusement, an exercise of mind. When Project Number began, I thought that others were wiser than I, that graphitics might be put to practical use as a benefit to mankind, to aid the production of really practical mass transference devices, perhaps, but now I see it is to be used only for death and destruction. I cannot face the responsibility involved in having invented graphitics. He then deliberately turned the focus of a protein depolarizer on himself and fell instantly and painlessly dead. They stood over the grave of the little technician while tribute was paid to the greatness of his discovery. Programmer Schumann bowed his head along with the rest of them, but remained unmoved. The technician had done his share and was no longer needed, after all. He might have started graphitics, but now that it had started, it would carry on by itself overwhelmingly, triumphantly, until manned missiles were possible with who knew what else. Nine times seven, thought Schumann with deep satisfaction, is sixty-three, and I don't need a computer to tell me so. The computer is in my own head and it was amazing the feeling of power that gave him. Spell my name with an S. Marshal Zabatinsky felt foolish. He felt as though there were eyes staring through the grimy storefront glass and across the scarred wooden partition, eyes watching him. He felt no confidence in the old clothes he had resurrected, nor the turned-down brim of a hat he never otherwise wore, nor the glasses he had left in their case. He felt foolish, and it made the lines in his forehead deeper and his young old face a little paler. 
He would never be able to explain to anyone why a nuclear physicist such as himself should visit a numerologist. Never, he thought. Never. Hell, he could not explain it to himself except that he had let his wife talk him into it. The numerologist sat behind an old desk that must have been second-hand when bought. No desk could get that old with only one owner. The same might almost be said of his clothes. He was little and dark and peered at Zabotinsky with little dark eyes that were brightly alive. He said, I have never had a physicist for a client before, Dr. Zabotinsky. Zabotinsky flushed at once. You understand this is confidential. The numerologist smiled so that wrinkles creased about the corners of his mouth and the skin around his chin stretched. All my dealings are confidential. Zabotinsky said, I think I ought to tell you one thing. I don't believe in numerology and I don't expect to begin believing in it. If that makes a difference, say so now. But why are you here then? My wife thinks you may have something, whatever it is. I promised her and I am here. He shrugged and the feeling of folly grew more acute. And what is it you are looking for? Money? Security? Long life? What? Zabotinsky sat for a long moment while the numerologist watched him quietly and made no move to hurry his client. Zabotinsky thought, What do I say, anyway? That I'm thirty-four and without a future? He said, I want success. I want recognition. A better job? A different job. A different kind of job. Right now I'm part of a team working under orders. Teams. That's all government research is. You're a violinist lost in a symphony orchestra. And you want to solo. I want to get out of a team and into... into me. Zabotinsky felt carried away, almost lightheaded, just putting this into words to someone other than his wife. He said, Twenty-five years ago, with my kind of training and my kind of ability, I would have gotten to work on the first nuclear power plants. Today I'd be running one of them, or I'd be head of a pure research group at a university. But with my start these days, where will I be twenty-five years from now? Nowhere. Still on the team. Still carrying my two percent of the ball. I'm drowning in an anonymous crowd of nuclear physicists, and what I want is room on dry land, if you see what I mean. The numerologist nodded slowly. You realize, Dr. Zebatinsky, that I don't guarantee success. Zebatinsky, for all his lack of faith, felt a sharp bite of disappointment. You don't? Then what the devil do you guarantee? An improvement in the probabilities. My work is statistical in nature. Since you deal with atoms, I think you understand the laws of statistics. Do you? asked the physicist sourly. I do, as a matter of fact. I am a mathematician and I work mathematically. I don't tell you this in order to raise my fee. That is standard. Fifty dollars. But since you are a scientist, you can appreciate the nature of my work better than my other clients. It is even a pleasure to be able to explain to you. Zebatinsky said, I'd rather you wouldn't, if you don't mind. It's no use telling me about the numerical values of letters, their mystic significance, and that kind of thing. I don't consider that mathematics. Let's get to the point, the numerologist said. Then you want me to help you, provided I don't embarrass you by telling you the silly non-scientific basis of the way in which I helped you. Is that it? All right, that's it. But you still work on the assumption that I am a numerologist and I am not. I call myself that so that the police won't bother me and... The little man chuckled dryly so that the psychiatrists won't either. I am a mathematician, an honest one. Zebatinsky smiled. The numerologist said, 
I build computers. I study probable futures. What? Does that sound worse than numerology to you? Why? Given enough data and a computer capable of sufficient numbers of operations in unit time, the future is predictable, at least in terms of probabilities. When you compute the motions of a missile in order to aim an anti-missile, isn't it the future you're predicting? The missile and anti-missile would not collide if the future were predicted incorrectly. I do the same thing. Since I work with a greater number of variables, my results are less accurate. You mean you'll predict my future? Very approximately. Once I have done that, I will modify the data by changing your name and no other fact about you. I throw that modified datum into the operation program. Then I try other modified names. I study each modified future and find one that contains a greater degree of recognition for you than the future that now lies ahead of you. Or, no, let me put it another way. I will find you a future in which the probability of adequate recognition is higher than the probability of that in your present future. Why change my name? That is the only change I ever make, for several reasons. Number one, it is a simple change. After all, if I make a great change or many changes, so many new variables enter that I can no longer interpret the result. My machine is still crude. Number two, it is a reasonable change. I can't change your height, can I, or the color of your eyes, or even your temperament. Number three, it is a significant change. Names mean a lot to people. Finally, number four, it is a common change that is done every day by various people. Zabotinsky said, What if you don't find a better future? That is the risk you will have to take. You will be no worse off than now, my friend. Zabotinsky stared at the little man uneasily. I don't believe any of this. I'd sooner believe numerology. The numerologist sighed. I thought a person like yourself would feel more comfortable with the truth. I want to help you, and there is much yet for you to do. If you believed me a numerologist, you would not follow through. I thought if I told you the truth, you would let me help you. Zabotinsky said, If you can see the future, why am I not the richest man on earth? Is that it? But I am rich, in all I want. You want recognition, and I want to be left alone. I do my work. No one bothers me. That makes me a billionaire. I need a little real money, and this I get from people such as yourself. Helping people is nice, and perhaps a psychiatrist would say it gives me a feeling of power and feeds my ego. Now, do you want me to help you? How much did you say? Fifty dollars. I will need a great deal of biographical information from you, but I have prepared a form to guide you. It's a little long, I'm afraid. Still, if you can get it in the mail by the end of the week, I will have an answer for you by the... He put out his lower lip and frowned in mental calculation. The twentieth of next month. Five weeks? So long? I have other work, my friend, and other clients. If I were a fake, I could do it much more quickly. Is it agreed, then? Zabotinsky rose. Well, agreed. This is all confidential now. Perfectly. You will have all your information back when I tell you what change to make, and you have my word that I will never make any further use of any of it. The nuclear physicist stopped at the door. Aren't you afraid I might tell someone you're not a numerologist? The numerologist shook his head. Who would believe you, my friend? Even supposing you were willing to admit to anyone that you've been here. On the 20th, Marshal Zebatinsky was at the paint-peeling door, glancing sideways at the shop front with the little card up against the glass reading numerology, 
dimmed and scarcely legible through the dust. He peered in, almost hoping that someone else would be there already so that he might have an excuse to tear up the wavering intention in his mind and go home. He had tried wiping the thing out of his mind several times. He could never stick at filling out the necessary data for long. It was embarrassing to work at it. He felt incredibly silly filling out the names of his friends, the cost of his house, whether his wife had had any miscarriages, if so, when. He abandoned it. But he couldn't stick at stopping altogether either. He returned to it each evening. It was the thought of the computer that did it, perhaps. The thought of the infernal gall of the little man pretending he had a computer. The temptation to call the bluff, see what would happen, proved irresistible after all. He finally sent off the completed data by ordinary mail, putting on nine cents worth of stamps without weighing the letter. If it comes back, he thought, I'll call it off. It didn't come back. He looked into the shop now and it was empty. Zabotinsky had no choice but to enter. A bell tinkled. The old numerologist emerged from a curtained door. Yes? Ah, Dr. Zabotinsky. You remember me? Zabotinsky tried to smile. Oh, yes. What's the verdict? The numerologist moved one gnarled hand over the other. Before that, sir, there's a little... A little matter of the fee? I have already done the work, sir. I have earned the money. Zabotinsky raised no objection. He was prepared to pay. If he had come this far, it would be silly to turn back just because of the money. He counted out five ten-dollar bills and shoved them across the counter. Well? The numerologist counted the bills again slowly, then pushed them into a cash drawer in his desk. He said, Your case was very interesting. I would advise you to change your name to Sebatinsky. Seba, how do you spell that? S-E-B-A-T-I-N-S-K-Y. Zebatinsky stared indignantly. You mean change the initial? Change the Z to an S? That's all? It's enough. As long as the change is adequate, a small change is safer than a big one. But how could the change affect anything? How could any name? asked the numerologist softly. I can't say. It may somehow, and that's all I can say. Remember, I don't guarantee results. Of course, if you do not wish to make the change, leave things as they are. But in that case, I cannot refund the fee. Zabotinsky said, What do I do? Just tell everyone to spell my name with an S? If you want my advice, consult a lawyer. Change your name legally. He can advise you on little things. How long will it all take? I mean, for things to improve for me. How can I tell? Maybe never. Maybe tomorrow. But you saw the future. You claim you see it. Not as in a crystal ball. No, no, Dr. Zebatinsky. All I get out of my computer is a set of coded figures. I can recite probabilities to you, but I saw no pictures. Zabotinsky turned and walked rapidly out of the place. Fifty dollars to change a letter. Fifty dollars for Zabotinsky. Lord, what a name. Worse than Zabotinsky. It took another month before he could make up his mind to see a lawyer, and then he finally went. He told himself he could always change the name back. Give it a chance, he told himself. Hell, there was no law against it. Henry Brand looked through the folder page by page with the practiced eye of one who had been in security for fourteen years. He didn't have to read every word. Anything peculiar would have leaped off the paper and punched him in the eye. He said, The man looks clean to me. Henry Brand looked clean, too with a soft, rounded paunch and a pink and freshly scrubbed complexion. 
It was as though continuous contact with all sorts of human failings, from possible ignorance to possible treason, had compelled him into frequent washings. Lieutenant Albert Quincy, who had brought him the folder, was young and filled with the responsibility of being security officer at the Hanford Station. But why Sabatinsky? he demanded. Why not? Because it doesn't make sense. Zabatinsky is a foreign name, and I'd change it myself if I had it, but I'd change it to something Anglo-Saxon. If Zabatinsky had done that, it would make sense, and I wouldn't give it a second thought. But why change a Z to an S? I think we must find out what his reasons were. Has anyone asked him directly? Certainly. In ordinary conversation, of course. I was careful to arrange that. He won't say anything more than that he's tired of being last in the alphabet. That could be, couldn't it, Lieutenant? It could, but why not change his name to Sands or Smith, if he wants an S? Or if he's that tired of Z, why not go the whole way and change it to an A? Why not a name like, uh, Aaron's? Not Anglo-Saxon enough, muttered Brand. Then, but there's nothing to pin against the man. No matter how queer a name change may be, that alone can't be used against anyone. Lieutenant Quincy looked markedly unhappy. Brand said, Tell me, Lieutenant, there must be something specific that bothers you. Something in your mind. Some theory. Some gimmick. What is it? The lieutenant frowned. His light eyebrows drew together and his lips tightened. Well, damn it, sir, the man's a Russian. Brand said, He's not that. He's a third-generation American. I mean, his name's Russian. Brand's face lost some of its deceptive softness. No, Lieutenant, wrong again. Polish. The Lieutenant pushed his hands out impatiently, palms up. Same thing. Brand, whose mother's maiden name had been Wischewski, snapped, Don't tell that to a Pole, Lieutenant. Then, more thoughtfully, Or to a Russian either, I suppose. What I'm trying to say, sir, said the Lieutenant, reddening, is that the Poles and Russians are both on the other side of the curtain. We all know that. And Zebatinsky or Sebatinsky, whatever you want to call him, may have relatives there. He's third generation. He might have second cousins there, I suppose. So what? Nothing in itself. Lots of people may have distant relatives there. But Zebatinsky changed his name. Go on. Maybe he's trying to distract attention. Maybe a second cousin over there is getting too famous, and R. Zabatinsky is afraid that the relationship may spoil his own chances of advancement. Changing his name won't do any good. He'd still be a second cousin. Sure, but he wouldn't feel as though he were shoving the relationship in our face. Have you ever heard of any Zabatinsky on the other side? No, sir. Then he can't be too famous. How would R. Zabatinsky know about him? He might keep in touch with his own relatives. That would be suspicious under the circumstances, he being a nuclear physicist. Methodically, Brand went through the folder again. This is awfully thin, Lieutenant. It's thin enough to be completely invisible. Can you offer any other explanation, sir, of why he ought to change his name in just this way? No, I can't. I admit that. Then I think, sir, we ought to investigate. We ought to look for any men named Zebatinsky on the other side and see if we can draw a connection. The lieutenant's voice rose a trifle as a new thought occurred to him. He might be changing his name to withdraw attention from them. I mean to protect them. He's doing just the opposite, I think. He doesn't realize that, maybe, but protecting them could be his motive. Brand sighed. All right, we'll tackle the Zabatinsky angle. But if nothing turns up, Lieutenant, we drop the matter. Leave the folder with me. When the information finally reached Brand, he had all but forgotten the lieutenant and his theories. His first thought on receiving data that included a list of 17 biographies of 17 Russian and Polish citizens, all named Zabatinsky, was, What the devil is this? Then he remembered, swore mildly, and began reading. It started on the American side. Marshal Zabatinsky, fingerprints, had been born in Buffalo, New York. Date, hospital, statistics. 
His father had been born in Buffalo as well, his mother in Oswego, New York. His paternal grandparents had both been born in Białystok, Poland. Date of entry into the United States, dates of citizenship, photographs. The seventeen Russian and Polish citizens named Zabatinsky were all descendants of people who, some half-century earlier, had lived in or near Białystok. Presumably they could be relatives, but this was not explicitly stated in any particular case. Vital statistics in East Europe, during the aftermath of World War I, were kept poorly, if at all. Brand passed through the individual life histories of the current Zabotinsky men and women. Amazing how thoroughly intelligence did its work, probably the Russians was as thorough. He stopped at one and his smooth forehead sprouted lines as his eyebrows shot upward. He put that one to one side and went on. Eventually he stacked everything but that one and returned it to its envelope. Staring at that one, he tapped a neatly kept fingernail on the desk. With a certain reluctance, he went to call on Dr. Paul Christo of the Atomic Energy Commission. Dr. Christo listened to the matter with a stony expression. He lifted a little finger occasionally to dab at his bulbous nose and remove a non-existent speck. His hair was iron gray, thinning and cut short. He might as well have been bald. He said, No, I never heard of any Russian Zebatinsky, but then I never heard of the American one either. Well, Brand scratched at his hairline over one temple and said slowly, I don't think there's anything to this, but I don't like to drop it too soon. I have a young lieutenant on my tail, and you know what they can be like. I don't want to do anything that will drive him to a congressional committee. Besides, the fact is that one of the Russian Zebatinsky fellows, Mikhail Andreevich Zebatinsky, is a nuclear physicist. Are you sure you never heard of him? Mikhail Andreevich Zebatinsky? No, no, I never did. Not that that proves anything. I could say it was coincidence, but you know that would be piling it a trifle high. One Zebatinsky here and one Zebatinsky there both nuclear physicists, and the one here suddenly changes his name to Sebatinsky and goes around anxious about it, too. He won't allow misspelling. He says emphatically, spell my name with an S. It all just fits well enough to make my spy-conscious lieutenant begin to look a little too good. And another peculiar thing is that the Russian Zebatinsky dropped out of sight just about a year ago. Dr. Christo said stolidly, Executed. He might have been. Ordinarily, I would even assume so, though the Russians are not more foolish than we are and don't kill any nuclear physicist they can avoid killing. The thing is, there's another reason why a nuclear physicist of all people might suddenly disappear. I don't have to tell you. Crash research, top secret. I take it that's what you mean. Do you believe that's it? Put it together with everything else, add in the lieutenant's intuition, and I just begin to wonder. Give me that biography. Dr. Christo reached for the sheet of paper and read it over twice. He shook his head. Then he said, I'll check this in Nuclear Abstracts. Nuclear Abstracts lined one wall of Dr. Christo's study in neat little boxes, each filled with its square of microfilm. The AEC man used his projector on the indices while Brand watched with what patience he could muster. Dr. Christo muttered, A Mikhail Zabotinsky authored or co-authored half a dozen papers in the Soviet journals in the last half dozen years. We'll get out the abstracts and maybe we can make something out of it. I doubt it. A selector flipped out the appropriate squares. Dr. Christo lined them up, ran them through the projector, and by degrees an expression of odd intentness crossed his face. He said, That's odd. Brand said, What's odd? Dr. Christo sat back. I'd rather not say just yet. 
Can you get me a list of other nuclear physicists who have dropped out of sight in the Soviet Union in the last year? You mean you see something? Not really. Not if I were just looking at any one of these papers. It's just that looking at all of them and knowing that this man may be on a crash research program and, on top of that, having you putting suspicions in my head. He shrugged. It's nothing. Brand said earnestly, I wish you'd say what's on your mind. We may as well be foolish about this together. If you feel that way, it's just possible this man may have been inching toward gamma ray reflection. And the significance? If a reflecting shield against gamma rays could be devised, individual shelters could be built to protect against fallout. It's fallout that's the real danger, you know. A hydrogen bomb might destroy a city, but the fallout could slow kill the population over a strip thousands of miles long and hundreds wide. Brand said quickly, Are we doing any work on this? No. And if they get it and we don't, they can destroy the United States in toto at the cost of, say, ten cities after they have their shelter program completed. That's far in the future. And what are we getting in a hurrah about? All this is built on one man changing one letter in his name. All right, I'm insane, said Brand, but I don't leave the matter at this point. Not at this point. I'll get you your list of disappearing nuclear physicists if I have to go to Moscow to get it. He got the list. They went through all the research papers authored by any of them. They called a full meeting of the Commission, then of the nuclear brains of the nation. Dr. Christo walked out of an all-night session, finally, part of which the President himself had attended. Brand met him. Both looked haggard and in need of sleep. Brand said, Well? Christo nodded. Most agree. Some are doubtful even yet, but most agree. How about you? Are you sure? I'm far from sure, but let me put it this way. It's easier to believe that the Soviets are working on a gamma-ray shield than to believe that all the data we've uncovered has no interconnection. Has it been decided that we're to go on shield research, too? Yes. Christo's hand went back over his short, bristly hair, making a dry, whispery sound. We're going to give it everything we've got. Knowing the papers written by the men who disappeared, we can get right on their heels. We may even beat them to it. Of course, they'll find out we're working on it. Let them, said Brand. Let them. It will keep them from attacking. I don't see any percentage in selling ten of our cities just to get ten of theirs, if we're both protected and they're too dumb to know that. But not too soon. We don't want them finding out too soon. What about the American Zebatinsky Zebatinsky? Brand looked solemn and shook his head. There's nothing to connect him with any of this even yet. Hell, we've looked. I agree with you, of course. He's in a sensitive spot where he is now, and we can't afford to keep him there even if he's in the clear. We can't kick him out just like that either, or the Russians will start wondering. Do you have any suggestions? They were walking down the long corridor toward the distant elevator in the emptiness of four in the morning. Dr. Christo said, I've looked into his work. He's a good man, better than most, and not happy in his job either. He hasn't the temperament for teamwork. So? But he is the type for an academic job. If we can arrange to have a large university offer him a chair in physics, I think he would take it gladly. There would be enough non-sensitive areas to keep him occupied. We would be able to keep him in close view, and it would be a natural development. The Russians might not start scratching their heads. What do you think? Brand nodded. It's an idea. Even sounds good. I'll put it up to the chief. They stepped into the elevator and Brand allowed himself to wonder about it all. What an ending to what had started with one letter of a name.
Marshal Sabatinsky could hardly talk. He said to his wife, I swear I don't see how this happened. I wouldn't have thought they knew me from a meson detector. Good Lord, Sophie, Associate Professor of Physics at Princeton. Think of it. Sophie said, Do you suppose it was your talk at the APS meetings? I don't see how. It was a thoroughly uninspired paper once everyone in the division was done hacking at it. He snapped his fingers. It must have been Princeton that was investigating me. That's it. You know all those forms I've been filling out in the last six months? Those interviews they wouldn't explain? Honestly, I was beginning to think I was under suspicion as a subversive. It was Princeton investigating me. They're thorough. Maybe it was your name, said Sophie. I mean the change. Watch me now. My professional life will be my own, finally. I'll make my mark. Once I have a chance to do my work without... He stopped and turned to look at his wife. My name? You mean the S? You didn't get the offer till after you changed your name, did you? Not till long after. No, that part's just coincidence. I've told you before, Sophie, it was just a case of throwing out fifty dollars to please you. Lord, what a fool I felt all these months insisting on that stupid S. Sophie was instantly on the defensive. I didn't make you do it, Marshall. I suggested it, but I didn't nag you about it. Don't say I did. Besides, it did turn out well. I'm sure it was the name that did this. Sabatinsky smiled indulgently. Now that's superstition. I don't care what you call it, but you're not changing your name back. Well, no, I suppose not. I've had so much trouble getting them to spell my name with an S that the thought of making everyone move back is more than I want to face. Maybe I ought to change my name to Jones, eh? He laughed almost hysterically. But Sophie didn't. You leave it alone. Oh, all right, I'm just joking. Tell you what, I'll step down to that old fellow's place one of these days and tell him everything worked out and slip him another tenor. Will that satisfy you? He was exuberant enough to do so the next week. He assumed no disguise this time. He wore his glasses and his ordinary suit and was minus a hat. He was even humming as he approached the storefront and stepped to one side to allow a weary, sour-faced woman to maneuver her twin baby carriage past. He put his hand on the door handle and his thumb on the iron latch. The latch didn't give to his thumb's downward pressure. The door was locked. The dusty, dim card with numerologist on it was gone, now that he looked. Another sign, printed and beginning to yellow and curl with the sunlight, said, To Let. Sabatinsky shrugged. That was that. He had tried to do the right thing. Ha round, happily divested of corporeal excrescence, capered happily, and his energy vortices glowed a dim purple over cubic hypermiles. He said, Have I won? Have I won? Meestack was withdrawn, his vortices almost a sphere of light in hyperspace. I haven't calculated it yet. Well, go ahead. You won't change the results any by taking a long time. Woof! It's a relief to get back into clean energy. It took me a microcycle of time as a corporeal body, a nearly used up one, too. But it was worth it to show you. Meestack said, all right, I admit you stopped a nuclear war on the planet. Is that or is that not a Class A effect? It is a Class A effect. Of course it is. All right. Now check and see if I didn't get that Class A effect with a Class F stimulus. I changed one letter of one name. What? Oh, never mind. It's all there. I've worked it out for you. Meestack said reluctantly, I yield. A Class F stimulus. Then I win. Admit it. Neither one of us will win when the watchman gets a look at this. Ha round. 
who had been an elderly numerologist on earth and was still somewhat unsettled with relief at no longer being one, said, You weren't worried about that when you made the bet. I didn't think you'd be fool enough to go through with it. Heat waste. Besides, why worry? The watchman will never detect a Class F stimulus. Maybe not, but he'll detect a Class A effect. Those corporeals will still be around after a dozen microcycles. A watchman will notice that. The trouble with you, me stack, is that you don't want to pay off. You're stalling. I'll pay. But just wait till the watchman finds out we've been working on an unassigned problem and made an unallowed for change. Of course, if we... He paused. Haran said, All right, we'll change it back. He'll never know. There was a crafty glow to Meestack's brightening energy pattern. You'll need another Class F stimulus if you expect him not to notice. Harround hesitated. I can do it. I doubt it. I could. Would you be willing to bet on that, too? Jubilation was creeping into Meestack's radiations. Sure, said the goaded Harround. I'll put those corporeals right back where they were, and the watchman will never know the difference. Meestack followed through his advantage. Suspend the first bet, then. Triple the stakes on the second. The mounting eagerness of the gamble caught at Ha Round, too. All right, I'm game. Triple the stakes. Done, then. Done. The Ugly Little Boy Edith Fellows smoothed her working smock as she always did before opening the elaborately locked door and stepping across the invisible dividing line between the is and is not. She carried her notebook and her pen, although she no longer took notes, except when she felt the absolute need for some report. This time she also carried a suitcase. Gains for the boy she had said, smiling to the guard, who had long since stopped even thinking of questioning her and who waved her on. And, as always, the ugly little boy knew that she had entered and came running to her, crying. Miss Fellows! Miss Fellows! in his soft, slurring way. Timmy, she said, and passed her hand over the shaggy brown hair on his misshapen little head. What's wrong? He said, Will Jerry be back to play again? I'm sorry about what happened. Never mind that now, Timmy. Is that why you've been crying? He looked away. Not just about that, Miss Fellows. I dreamed again. The same dream? Miss Fellows' lips set. Of course, the Jerry affair would bring back the dream. He nodded. His two large teeth showed as he tried to smile, and the lips of his forward-thrusting mouth stretched wide. When will I be big enough to go out there, Miss Fellows? Soon, she said softly, feeling her heart break. Soon. Miss Fellows let him take her hand and enjoyed the warm touch of the thick, dry skin of his palm. He led her through the three rooms that made up the whole of Stasis Section 1. Comfortable enough, yes. But an eternal prison for the ugly little boy all the seven, was it seven, years of his life. He led her to the one window, looking out onto a scrubby woodland section of the world of Is, now hidden by night, where a fence and painted instructions allowed no men to wander without permission. He pressed his nose against the window. Out there, Miss Fellows? Better places, nicer places, she said sadly as she looked at his poor little imprisoned face outlined in profile against the window. The forehead retreated flatly and his hair lay down in tufts upon it. The back of his skull bulged and seemed to make the head over heavy, so that it sagged and bent forward forcing the whole body into a stoop. Already bony ridges were beginning to bulge the skin above his eyes. His wide mouth thrust forward more prominently than did his wide and flattened nose, and he had no chin to speak of, 
only a jawbone that curved smoothly down and back. He was small for his years, and his stumpy legs were bowed. He was a very ugly little boy, and Edith Fellows loved him dearly. Her own face was behind his line of vision, so she allowed her lips the luxury of a tremor. They would not kill him. She would do anything to prevent it. Anything. She opened the suitcase and began taking out the clothes it contained. Edith Fellows had crossed the threshold of Stasis, Inc. for the first time just a little over three years before. She hadn't at that time the slightest idea as to what Stasis meant or what the place did. No one did then except those who worked there. In fact, it was only the day after she arrived that the news broke upon the world. At the time, it was just that they had advertised for a woman with knowledge of physiology, experience with clinical chemistry, and a love for children. Edith Fellows had been a nurse in a maternity ward and believed she fulfilled those qualifications. Gerald Hoskins, whose name plate on the desk included a Ph.D. after the name, scratched his cheek with his thumb and looked at her steadily. Miss Fellows automatically stiffened and felt her face, with its slightly asymmetric nose and its a trifle too heavy eyebrows, twitch. He's no dreamboat himself, she thought resentfully. He's getting fat and bald and he's got a sullen mouth. But the salary mentioned had been considerably higher than she had expected, so she waited. Hoskins said, Now, do you really love children? I wouldn't say I did if I didn't. Or do you just love pretty children? Nice chubby children with cute little button noses and gurgly ways. Miss Fellows said, Children are children, Dr. Hoskins, and the ones that aren't pretty are just the ones who may happen to need help most. Then suppose we take you on. You mean you're offering me the job now? He smiled briefly, and for a moment his broad face had an absent-minded charm about it. He said, I make quick decisions. So far, the offer is tentative, however. I may make as quick a decision to let you go. Are you ready to take the chance? Miss Fellows clutched at her purse and calculated just as swiftly as she could, then ignored calculations and followed impulse. All right. Fine. We're going to form the stasis tonight, and I think you had better be there to take over at once. That will be at 8 p.m., and I'd appreciate it if you could be here at 7.30. But what? Fine, fine. That will be all now. On signal, a smiling secretary came in to usher her out. Miss Fellows stared back at Dr. Hoskins' closed door for a moment. What was stasis? What had this large barn of a building, with its badged employees, its makeshift corridors, and its unmistakable air of engineering, to do with children. She wondered if she should go back that evening or stay away and teach that arrogant man a lesson. But she knew she would be back if only out of sheer frustration. She would have to find out about the children. She came back at 7.30 and did not have to announce herself. One after another, men and women seemed to know her and to know her function. She found herself all but placed on skids as she was moved inward. Dr. Hoskins was there, but he only looked at her distantly and murmured, Miss Fellows. He did not even suggest that she take a seat, but she drew one calmly up to the railing and sat down. They were on a balcony looking down into a large pit, filled with instruments that looked like a cross between the control panel of a spaceship and the working face of a computer. On one side were partitions that seemed to make up an unsealing department, a giant dollhouse into the rooms of which she could look from above. She could see an electronic cooker and a freeze space unit in one room and a washroom arrangement off another, and surely the object she made out in another room could only be part of a bed, a small bed. Hoskins was speaking to another man and, with Miss Fellows, they made up the total occupancy of the balcony. Hoskins did not offer to introduce the other man, 
and Miss Fellows eyed him surreptitiously. He was thin and quite fine-looking in a middle-aged way. He had a small mustache and keen eyes that seemed to busy themselves with everything. He was saying, I won't pretend for one moment that I understand all this, Dr. Hoskins. I mean, except as a layman, a reasonably intelligent layman may be expected to understand it. Still, if there's one part I understand less than another, it's this matter of selectivity. You can only reach out so far. That seems sensible. Things get dimmer the further you go. It takes more energy. But then, you can only reach out so near. That's the puzzling part. I can make it seem less paradoxical, Devaney, if you will allow me to use an analogy. Miss Fellows placed the new man the moment she heard his name, and despite herself was impressed. This was obviously Candide Devaney, the science writer of the Telenews, who was notoriously at the scene of every major scientific breakthrough. She even recognized his face as one she saw on the news plate when the landing on Mars had been announced. So Dr. Hoskins must have something important here. By all means use an analogy, said Devaney ruefully, if you think it will help. Well, then, you can't read a book with ordinary-sized print if it is held six feet from your eyes. But you can read it if you hold it one foot from your eyes. So far, the closer, the better. If you bring the book to within one inch of your eyes, however, you've lost it again. There is such a thing as being too close, you see. Hmm, said Devaney. Or take another example. Your right shoulder is about thirty inches from the tip of your right forefinger, and you can place your right forefinger on your right shoulder. Your right elbow is only half the distance from the tip of your right forefinger. It should, by all ordinary logic, be easier to reach, and yet you cannot place your right finger on your right elbow. Again, there is such a thing as being too close. Devaney said, May I use these analogies in my story? Well, of course. Only too glad. I've been waiting long enough for someone like you to have a story. I'll give you anything else you want. It is time, finally, that we want the world looking over our shoulder. They'll see something. Miss Fellows found herself admiring his calm certainty despite herself. There was strength there. Devaney said, How far out will you reach? Forty thousand years. Miss Fellows drew in her breath sharply. Years? There was tension in the air. The men at the controls scarcely moved. One man at a microphone spoke into it in a soft monotone, in short phrases that made no sense to Miss Fellows. Devaney, leaning over the balcony railing with an intense stare, said, Will we see anything, Dr. Hoskins? What? No. Nothing till the job is done. We detect indirectly, something on the principle of radar, except that we use mesons rather than radiation. Mesons reach backward under the proper conditions. Some are reflected, and we must analyze the reflections. That sounds difficult. Hoskins smiled again briefly, as always. It is the end product of fifty years of research. Forty years of it before I entered the field. Yes, it's difficult. The man at the microphone raised one hand. Hoskins said, We've had the fix on one particular moment in time for weeks, breaking it, remaking it after calculating our own movements in time, making certain that we could handle time flow with sufficient precision. This must work now. But his forehead glistened. Edith Fellows found herself out of her seat and at the balcony railing, but there was nothing to see. The man at the microphone said quietly, Now. There was a space of silence, sufficient for one breath, and then the sound of a terrified little boy's scream from the dollhouse rooms. Terror. Piercing terror. Miss Fellows' head twisted in the direction of the cry. A child was involved. She had forgotten. And Hoskins' fist pounded on the railing, and he said in a tight voice, trembling with triumph, Did it. 
Miss Fellows was urged down the short spiral flight of steps by the hard press of Hoskins' palm between her shoulder blades. He did not speak to her. The men who had been at the controls were standing about now, smiling, smoking, watching the three as they entered on the main floor. A very soft buzz sounded from the direction of the dollhouse. Hoskins said to Devaney, It's perfectly safe to enter stasis. I've done it a thousand times. There's a queer sensation which is momentary and means nothing. He stepped through an open door in mute demonstration and Devaney, smiling stiffly and drawing an obviously deep breath, followed him. Hoskins said, Miss Fellows, please. He crooked his forefinger impatiently. Miss Fellows nodded and stepped stiffly through. It was as though a ripple went through her, an internal tickle. But once inside all seemed normal. There was the smell of the fresh wood of the dollhouse and of... of soil somehow. There was silence now, no voice at least, but there was the dry shuffling of feet, a scrabbling as of a hand over wood, then a low moan. Where is it? asked Miss Fellows in distress. Didn't these fool men care? The boy was in the bedroom, at least the room with the bed in it. It was standing naked with its small, dirt-smeared chest heaving raggedly. A bushel of dirt and coarse grass spread over the floor at his bare brown feet. The smell of soil came from it and a touch of something fetid. Hoskins followed her horrified glance and said with annoyance, You can't pluck a boy cleanly out of time, Miss Fellows. We had to take some of the surroundings with it for safety. Or would you have preferred to have it arrive here, minus a leg or with only half a head? Please, said Miss Fellows, in an agony of revulsion. Are we just to stand here? The poor child is frightened, and it's filthy. She was quite correct. It was smeared with encrusted dirt and grease and had a scratch on its thigh that looked red and sore. As Hoskins approached him, the boy, who seemed to be something over three years in age, hunched low and backed away rapidly. He lifted his upper lip and snarled in a hissing fashion like a cat. With a rapid gesture, Hoskins seized both the child's arms and lifted him, writhing and screaming, from the floor. Miss Fellows said, Hold him now. He needs a warm bath first. He needs to be cleaned. Have you the equipment? If so, have it brought here, and I'll need to have help in handling him just at first. Then, too, for heaven's sake, have all this trash and filth removed. She was giving the orders now, and she felt perfectly good about that. And because now she was an efficient nurse, rather than a confused spectator, she looked at the child with a clinical eye and hesitated for one shocked moment. She saw past the dirt and shrieking, past the thrashing of limbs and useless twisting. She saw the boy himself. It was the ugliest little boy she had ever seen. It was horribly ugly, from misshapen head to bandy legs. She got the boy cleaned with three men helping her and with others milling about in their efforts to clean the room. She worked in silence and with a sense of outrage, annoyed by the continued strugglings and outcries of the boy and by the undignified drenchings of soapy water to which she was subjected. Dr. Hoskins had hinted that the child would not be pretty, but that was far from stating that it would be repulsively deformed. And there was a stench about the boy that soap and water was only alleviating little by little. She had the strong desire to thrust the boy, soaked as he was, into Hoskins' arms and walk out. But there was the pride of profession. She had accepted an assignment, after all. And there would be the look in his eyes, a cold look that would read, Only pretty children, Miss Fellows. He was standing apart from them, watching coolly from a distance with a half-smile on his face when he caught her eyes, as though amused at her outrage. She decided she would wait a while before quitting. To do so now would only demean her. Then, when the boy was a bearable pink and smelled of scented soap, she felt better anyway. 
His cries changed to whimpers of exhaustion as he watched carefully, eyes moving in quick frightened suspicion from one to another of those in the room. His cleanness accentuated his thin nakedness as he shivered with cold after his bath. Miss Fellows said sharply, Bring me a nightgown for the child. A nightgown appeared at once. It was as though everything were ready and yet nothing were ready unless she gave orders. As though they were deliberately leaving this in her charge without help to test her. The newsman Devaney approached and said, I'll hold him, miss. You won't get it on yourself. Thank you, said Miss Fellows, and it was a battle indeed. But the nightgown went on, and when the boy made as though to rip it off, she slapped his hand sharply. The boy reddened, but did not cry. He stared at her, and the splayed fingers of one hand moved slowly across the flannel of the nightgown, feeling the strangeness of it. Miss Fellows thought desperately, Well, what next? Everyone seemed in suspended animation waiting for her, even the ugly little boy. Miss Fellows said sharply, Have you provided food, milk? They had. A mobile unit was wheeled in, with its refrigeration compartment containing three quarts of milk, with a warming unit and a supply of fortifications in the form of vitamin drops, copper cobalt iron syrup, and others she had not time to be concerned with. There was a variety of canned, self-warming junior foods. She used milk, simply milk, to begin with. The radar unit heated the milk to a set temperature in a matter of ten seconds and clicked off, and she put some in a saucer. She had a certainty about the boy's savagery. He wouldn't know how to handle a cup. Miss Fellows nodded and said to the boy, Drink, drink. She made a gesture as though to raise the milk to her mouth. The boy's eyes followed, but he made no move. Suddenly the nurse resorted to direct measures. She seized the boy's upper arm in one hand and dipped the other in the milk. She dashed the milk across his lips so that it dripped down cheeks and receding chin. For a moment the child uttered a high-pitched cry, then his tongue moved over his wetted lips. Miss Fellows stepped back. The boy approached the saucer, bent toward it, then looked up and behind sharply as though expecting a crouching enemy, bent again and licked at the milk eagerly, like a cat. He made a slurping noise. He did not use his hands to lift the saucer. Miss Fellows allowed a bit of the revulsion she felt show on her face. She couldn't help it. Devaney caught that, perhaps. He said, does the nurse know Dr. Hoskins? Know what? demanded Miss Fellows. Devaney hesitated, but Hoskins, again that look of detached amusement on his face, said, Well, tell her. Devaney addressed Miss Fellows. You may not suspect it, miss, but you happen to be the first civilized woman in history ever to be taking care of a Neanderthal youngster. She turned on Hoskins with a kind of controlled ferocity. You might have told me, doctor. Why? What difference does it make? You said a child. Isn't that a child? Have you ever had a puppy or a kitten, Miss Fellows? Are those closer to the human? If that were a baby chimpanzee, would you be repelled? You're a nurse, Miss Fellows. Your record places you in a maternity ward for three years. Have you ever refused to take care of a deformed infant? Miss Fellows felt her case slipping away. She said with much less decision, You might have told me. And you would have refused the position? Well, do you refuse it now? He gazed at her coolly while Devaney watched from the other side of the room, and the Neanderthal child, having finished the milk and licked the plate, looked up at her with a wet face and wide, longing eyes. The boy pointed to the milk and suddenly burst out in a short series of sounds repeated over and over, sounds made up of gutturals and elaborate tongue clickings. Miss Fellows said in surprise, Why, he talks. Of course, said Hoskins. Homo neanderthalensis is not a truly separate species, but rather a subspecies of Homo sapiens, 
why shouldn't he talk, is probably asking for more milk. Automatically, Miss Fellows reached for a bottle of milk, but Hoskins seized her wrist. Now, Miss Fellows, before we go any further, are you staying on the job? Miss Fellows shook free in annoyance. Won't you feed him if I don't? I'll stay with him for a while. She poured the milk. Hoskins said, We are going to leave you with the boy, Miss Fellows. This is the only door to stasis number one, and it is elaborately locked and guarded. I'll want you to learn the details of the locks, which will, of course, be keyed to your fingerprints as they are already keyed to mine. The space is overhead. He looked upward to the open ceilings of the dollhouse. Are also guarded, and we will be warned if anything untoward takes place in here. Miss Fellows said indignantly, You mean I'll be under view? She thought suddenly of her own survey of the room interiors from the balcony. No, no, said Hoskins seriously. Your privacy will be respected completely. The view will consist of electronic symbolism only, which only a computer will deal with. Now you will stay with him tonight, Miss Fellows, and every night until further notice. You will be relieved during the day according to some schedule you will find convenient. We will allow you to arrange that. Miss Fellows looked about the dollhouse with a puzzled expression. But why all this, Dr. Hoskins? Is the boy dangerous? It's a matter of energy, Miss Fellows. He must never be allowed to leave these rooms. Never. Not for an instant. Not for any reason. Not to save his life. Not even to save your life, Miss Fellows. Is that clear? Miss Fellows raised her chin. I understand the orders, Dr. Hoskins, and the nursing profession is accustomed to placing its duties ahead of self-preservation. Good. You can always signal if you need anyone. And the two men left. Miss Fellows turned to the boy. He was watching her and there was still milk in the saucer. Laboriously, she tried to show him how to lift the saucer and place it to his lips. He resisted but let her touch him without crying out. Always his frightened eyes were on her, watching, watching for the one false move. She found herself soothing him, trying to move her hand very slowly toward his hair, letting him see it every inch of the way. See, there was no harm in it. And she succeeded in stroking his hair for an instant. She said, I'm going to have to show you how to use the bathroom. Do you think you can learn? She spoke quietly, kindly, knowing he would not understand the words, but hoping he would respond to the calmness of her tone. The boy launched into a clicking phrase again. She said, May I take your hand? She held out hers, and the boy looked at it. She felt it outstretched and waited. The boy's own hand crept forward toward hers. That's right she said. It approached within an inch of hers, and then the boy's courage failed him. He snatched it back. Well, said Miss Fellows calmly, we'll try again later. Would you like to sit down here? She patted the mattress of the bed. The hours passed slowly, and progress was minute. She did not succeed either with bathroom or with the bed. In fact, after the child had given unmistakable signs of sleepiness, he lay down on the bare ground and then, with a quick movement, rolled beneath the bed. She bent to look at him, and his eyes gleamed out at her as he tongue-clicked at her. All right, she said. If you feel safer there, you sleep there. She closed the door to the bedroom and retired to the cot that had been placed for her use in the largest room. At her insistence, a makeshift canopy had been stretched over it. She thought, Those stupid men will have to place a mirror in this room, and a larger chest of drawers, and a separate washroom if they expect me to spend nights here. It was difficult to sleep. She found herself straining to hear possible sounds in the next room. He couldn't get out, could he? The walls were sheer and impossibly high, but suppose the child could climb like a monkey. 
Well, Hoskins said there were observational devices watching through the ceiling. Suddenly, she thought, can he be dangerous, physically dangerous? Surely Hoskins couldn't have meant that. Surely he would not have left her here alone if... She tried to laugh at herself. It was only a three- or four-year-old child. Still, she had not succeeded in cutting his nails. If he should attack her with nails and teeth while she slept... Her breath came quickly. Oh, ridiculous. And yet... She listened with painful attentiveness, and this time she heard the sound. The boy was crying. Not shrieking in fear or anger, not yelling or screaming. It was crying softly, and the cry was the heartbroken sobbing of a lonely, lonely child. For the first time, Miss Fellows thought with a pang, Poor thing. Of course it was a child. What did the shape of its head matter? It was a child that had been orphaned as no child had ever been orphaned before. Not only its mother and father were gone, but all its species. Snatched callously out of time, it was now the only creature of its kind in the world. The last. The only. She felt pity for it strengthen and with it shame at her own callousness. Tucking her own nightgown carefully about her calves, incongruously, she thought, Tomorrow I'll have to bring in a bathrobe. She got out of bed and went into the boy's room. Little boy, she called in a whisper. Little boy. She was about to reach under the bed, but she thought of a possible bite and did not. Instead, she turned on the nightlight and moved the bed. The poor thing was huddled in the corner, knees up against his chin, looking up at her with blurred and apprehensive eyes. In the dim light, she was not aware of his repulsiveness. Poor boy, she said. Poor boy. She felt him stiffen as she stroked his hair, then relax. Poor boy, may I hold you? She sat down on the floor next to him and slowly and rhythmically stroked his hair, his cheek, his arm. Softly, she began to sing a slow and gentle song. He lifted his head at that, staring at her mouth in the dimness, as though wondering at the sound. She maneuvered him closer while he listened to her. Slowly, she pressed gently against the side of his head until it rested on her shoulder. She put her arm under his thighs and with a smooth and unhurried motion lifted him into her lap. She continued singing the same simple verse over and over while she rocked back and forth, back and forth. He stopped crying and after a while the smooth burr of his breathing showed he was asleep. With infinite care she pushed his bed back against the wall and laid him down. She covered him and stared down. His face looked so peaceful and little boy as he slept. It didn't matter so much that it was so ugly. Really. She began to tiptoe out, then thought, if he wakes up? She came back, battled irresolutely with herself, then sighed and slowly got into bed with the child. It was too small for her. She was cramped and uneasy at the lack of canopy, but the child's hand crept into hers and somehow she fell asleep in that position. She awoke with a start and a wild impulse to scream. The latter she just managed to suppress into a gurgle. The boy was looking at her, wide-eyed. It took her a long moment to remember getting into bed with him, and now, slowly, Without unfixing her eyes from his, she stretched one leg carefully and let it touch the floor, then the other one. She cast a quick and apprehensive glance toward the open ceiling, then tensed her muscles for quick disengagement. But at that moment the boy's stubby fingers reached out and touched her lips. He said something. She shrank at the touch. He was terribly ugly in the light of day. The boy spoke again. He opened his own mouth and gestured with his hand as though something were coming out. Miss Fellows guessed at the meaning and said tremulously, Do you want me to sing? The boy said nothing but stared at her mouth. In a voice slightly off-key with tension, Miss Fellows began the little song she had sung the night before, 
and the ugly little boy smiled. He swayed clumsily in rough time to the music and made a little gurgly sound that might have been the beginnings of a laugh. Miss Fellows sighed inwardly. Music hath charms to soothe the savage breast. It might help. She said, You wait. Let me get myself fixed up. It will just take a minute. Then I'll make breakfast for you. She worked rapidly, conscious of the lack of ceiling at all times. The boy remained in bed, watching her when she was in view. She smiled at him at those times and waved. At the end, he waved back, and she found herself being charmed by that. Finally, she said, Would you like oatmeal with milk? It took a moment to prepare, and then she beckoned to him. Whether he understood the gesture or followed the aroma, Miss Fellows did not know, but he got out of bed. She tried to show him how to use a spoon, but he shrank away from it in fright. Time enough, she thought. She compromised on insisting that he lift the bowl in his hands. He did it clumsily enough, and it was incredibly messy, but most of it did get into him. She tried the drinking milk in a glass this time, and the little boy whined when he found the opening too small for him to get his face into conveniently. She held his hand, forcing it around the glass, making him tip it, forcing his mouth to the rim. Again a mess, but again most went into him, and she was used to messes. The washroom, to her surprise and relief, was a less frustrating matter. He understood what it was she expected him to do. She found herself patting his head, saying, Good boy, smart boy. And to Miss Fellow's exceeding pleasure, the boy smiled at that. She thought, When he smiles, he's quite bearable, really. Later in the day, the gentleman of the press arrived. She held the boy in her arms, and he clung to her wildly while across the open door they set cameras to work. The commotion frightened the boy, and he began to cry, but it was ten minutes before Miss Fellows was allowed to retreat and put the boy in the next room. She emerged again, flushed with indignation, walked out of the apartment, for the first time in eighteen hours, and closed the door behind her. I think you've had enough. It will take me a while to quiet him. Go away. Sure, sure, said the gentleman from the Times Herald. But is that really a Neanderthal, or is this some kind of gag? I assure you, said Hoskins' voice suddenly from the background, that this is no gag. The child is authentic Homo Neanderthalensis. Is it a boy or a girl? Boy said Miss Fellows briefly. Ape boy, said the gentleman from the news. That's what we've got here, ape boy. How does he act, nurse? He acts exactly like a little boy, snapped Miss Fellows, annoyed into the defensive. And he is not an ape boy. His name is, is Timothy, Timmy, and he is perfectly normal in his behavior. She had chosen the name Timothy at a venture. It was the first that had occurred to her. Timmy the Ape Boy, said the gentleman from the news, and, as it turned out, Timmy the Ape Boy was the name under which the child became known to the world. The gentleman from the Globe turned to Hoskins and said, Doc, what do you expect to do with the Ape Boy? Hoskins shrugged. My original plan was completed when I proved it possible to bring him here. However, the anthropologists will be very interested, I imagine, and the physiologists. We have here, after all, a creature which is at the edge of being human. We should learn a great deal about ourselves and our ancestry from him. How long will you keep him? Until such a time as we need the space more than we need him. Quite a while, perhaps. The gentleman from the news said, can you bring it out into the open so we can set up sub-etheric equipment and put on a real show? I'm sorry, but the child cannot be removed from stasis. Exactly what is stasis? Ah. Hoskins permitted himself one of his short smiles. That would take a great deal of explanation, gentlemen. In stasis, time as we know it doesn't exist. 
Those rooms are inside an invisible bubble that is not exactly part of our universe. That is why the child could be plucked out of time as it was. Well, wait now, said the gentleman from the news discontentedly. What are you giving us? The nurse goes into the room and out of it. And so can any of you, said Hoskins matter-of-factly. You would be moving parallel to the lines of temporal force, and no great energy gain or loss would be involved. The child, however, was taken from the far past. It moved across the lines and gained temporal potential. To move it into the universe and into our own time would absorb enough energy to burn out every line in the place and probably blank out all power in the city of Washington. We had to store trash brought with him on the premises, and we'll have to remove it little by little. The newsmen were writing down sentences busily as Hoskins spoke to them. They did not understand, and they were sure their readers would not, but it sounded scientific, and that was what counted. The gentleman from the Times-Herald said, Would you be available for an all-circuit interview tonight? I think so, said Hoskins at once, and they all moved off. Miss Fellows looked after them. She understood all this about stasis and temporal force as little as the newsman, but she managed to get this much. Timmy's imprisonment, she found herself suddenly thinking of the little boy as Timmy, was a real one and not one imposed by the arbitrary fiat of Hoskins. Apparently it was impossible to let him out of stasis at all, ever. Poor child, poor child. She was suddenly aware of his crying, and she hastened in to console him. Miss Fellows did not have a chance to see Hoskins on the all-circuit hookup, and though his interview was beamed to every part of the world and even to the outpost on the moon, it did not penetrate the apartment in which Miss Fellows and the ugly little boy lived. But he was down the next morning, radiant and joyful. Miss Fellows said, Did the interview go well? Extremely. And how is... Timmy? Miss Fellows found herself pleased at the use of the name. Doing quite well. Now come out here, Timmy. The nice gentleman will not hurt you. But Timmy stayed in the other room with a lock of his matted hair showing behind the barrier of the door and, occasionally, the corner of an eye. Actually, said Miss Fellows, he is settling down amazingly. He is quite intelligent. Are you surprised? She hesitated just a moment, then said, Yes, I am. I suppose I thought he was an ape boy. Well, ape boy or not, he's done a great deal for us. He's put Stasis Inc. on the map. We're in, Miss Fellows, we're in. It was as though he had to express his triumph to someone, even if only to Miss Fellows. Oh? She let him talk. He put his hands in his pockets and said, We've been working on a shoestring for ten years, scrounging funds a penny at a time wherever we could. We had to shoot the works on one big show. It was everything or nothing. And when I say the works, I mean it. This attempt to bring a Neanderthal took every cent we could borrow or steal, and some of it was stolen. Funds for other projects, used for this one without permission. If that experiment hadn't succeeded, I'd have been through. Miss Fellows said abruptly, Is that why there are no ceilings? Eh? Hoskins looked up. Was there no money for ceilings? Oh. Well, that wasn't the only reason. We didn't really know in advance how old the Neanderthal might be exactly. We can detect only dimly in time, and he might have been large and savage. It was possible we might have had to deal with him from a distance, like a caged animal. But since that hasn't turned out to be so, I suppose you can build a ceiling now. Now, yes. We have plenty of money now. Funds have been promised from every source. This is all wonderful, Miss Fellows. His broad face gleamed with a smile that lasted, and when he left, even his back seemed to be smiling. Miss Fellows thought, He's quite a nice man when he's off guard and forgets about being scientific. She wondered for an idle moment if he was married, then dismissed the thought in embarrassment. Timmy, she called. Come here, Timmy. 
In the months that passed, Miss Fellows felt herself grow to be an integral part of Stasis, Inc. She was given a small office of her own with her name on the door, an office quite close to the dollhouse, as she never stopped calling Timmy's stasis bubble. She was given a substantial raise. The dollhouse was covered by a ceiling. Its furnishings were elaborated and improved. A second washroom was added. And even so, she gained an apartment of her own on the Institute grounds and, on occasion, did not stay with Timmy during the night. An intercom was set up between the dollhouse and her apartment, and Timmy learned how to use it. Miss Fellows got used to Timmy. She even grew less conscious of his ugliness. One day she found herself staring at an ordinary boy in the street and finding something bulgy and unattractive in his high-domed forehead and jutting chin. She had to shake herself to break the spell. It was more pleasant to grow used to Hoskins' occasional visits. It was obvious he welcomed escape from his increasingly harried role as head of Stasis, Inc., and that he took a sentimental interest in the child who had started it all. But it seemed to Miss Fellows that he also enjoyed talking to her. She had learned some facts about Hoskins, too. He had invented the method of analyzing the reflection of the past penetrating mesonic beam. He had invented the method of establishing stasis. His coldness was only an effort to hide a kindly nature. And, oh yes, he was married. What Miss Fellows could not get used to was the fact that she was engaged in a scientific experiment. Despite all she could do, she found herself getting personally involved to the point of quarreling with the physiologists. On one occasion, Hoskins came down and found her in the midst of a hot urge to kill. They had no right. They had no right. Even if he was a Neanderthal, he still wasn't an animal. She was staring after them in a blind fury, staring out the open door and listening to Timmy's sobbing when she noticed Hoskins standing before her. He might have been there for minutes. He said, May I come in? She nodded curtly, then hurried to Timmy, who clung to her, curling his little bandy legs, still thin, so thin, about her. Hoskins watched, then said gravely, He seems quite unhappy. Miss Fellows said, I don't blame him. They're at him every day now with their blood samples and their probings. They keep him on synthetic diets that I wouldn't feed a pig. It's the sort of thing they can't try on a human, you know. And they can't try it on Timmy either. Dr. Hoskins, I insist. You told me it was Timmy's coming that put Stasis Inc. on the map. If you have any gratitude for that at all... You've got to keep them away from the poor thing at least until he's old enough to understand a little more. After he's had a bad session with them, he has nightmares. He can't sleep. Now I warn you. She reached a sudden peak of fury. I'm not letting them in here anymore. She realized that she had screamed that, but she couldn't help it. She said more quietly, I know he's Neanderthal, but there's a great deal we don't appreciate about Neanderthals. I've read up on them. They had a culture of their own. Some of the greatest human inventions arose in Neanderthal times. The domestication of animals, for instance, the wheel, various techniques in grinding stone. They even had spiritual yearnings. They buried their dead and buried possessions with the body, showing they believed in a life after death. It amounts to the fact that they invented religion. Doesn't that mean Timmy has a right to human treatment? She patted the little boy gently on his buttocks and sent him off into his playroom. As the door was opened, Hoskins smiled briefly at the display of toys that could be seen. Miss Fellows said defensively, The poor child deserves his toys. It's all he has, and he earns them with what he goes through. No, no, no objections, I assure you. I was just thinking how you've changed since the first day, when you were quite angry, I had foisted a Neanderthal on you. Miss Fellows said in a low voice, I suppose I didn't, and faded off. Hoskins changed the subject. How old would you say he is, Miss Fellows? She said, I can't say, since we don't know how Neanderthals develop. 
In size, he'd only be three, but Neanderthals are smaller generally, and with all the tampering they do with him, he probably isn't growing. The way he's learning English, though, I'd say he was well over four. Really? I haven't noticed anything about learning English in the reports. He won't speak to anyone but me. For now, anyway. He's terribly afraid of others, and no wonder. But he can ask for an article of food. He can indicate any need, practically. And he understands almost anything I say. Of course, she watched him shrewdly, trying to estimate if this was the time. His development may not continue. Why not? Any child needs stimulation, and this one lives a life of solitary confinement. I do what I can, but I'm not with him all the time, and I'm not all he needs. What I mean, Dr. Hoskins, is that he needs another boy to play with. Hoskins nodded slowly. Unfortunately, there's only one of him, isn't there? Poor child. Miss Fellows warmed to him at once. She said, You do like Timmy, don't you? It was so nice to have someone else feel like that. Oh, yes, said Hoskins, and with his guard down she could see the weariness in his eyes. Miss Fellows dropped her plans to push the matter at once. She said with real concern, You look worn out, Dr. Hoskins. Do I, Miss Fellows? I'll have to practice looking more lifelike, then. I suppose Stasis Inc. is very busy and that that keeps you very busy. Hoskins shrugged. You suppose right. It's a matter of animal, vegetable, and mineral in equal parts, Miss Fellows. But then I suppose you haven't ever seen our displays. Actually, I haven't. But it's not because I'm not interested. It's just that I've been so busy. Well, you're not all that busy right now, he said with impulsive decision. I'll call for you tomorrow at eleven and give you a personal tour. How's that? She smiled happily. I'd love it. He nodded and smiled in his turn and left. Miss Fellows hummed at intervals for the rest of the day. Really, to think so was ridiculous, of course, but really it was almost like, like making a date. He was quite on time the next day, smiling and pleasant. She had replaced her nurse's uniform with a dress. One of conservative cut, to be sure, but she hadn't felt so feminine in years. He complimented her on her appearance with staid formality and she accepted with equally formal grace. It was really a perfect prelude, she thought. And then the additional thought came. Prelude to what? She shut that off by hastening to say goodbye to Timmy and to assure him she would be back soon. She made sure he knew all about what and where lunch was. Hoskins took her into the new wing into which she had never yet gone. It still had the odor of newness about it, and the sound of construction, softly heard, was indication enough that it was still being extended. Animal, vegetable, and mineral, said Hoskins, as he had the day before. Animal right there, our most spectacular exhibits. The space was divided into many rooms, each a separate stasis bubble. Hoskins brought her to the view glass of one and she looked in. What she saw impressed her first as a scaled-tailed chicken. Skittering on two thin legs, it ran from wall to wall with its delicate bird-like head, surmounted by a bony keel like the comb of a rooster, looking this way and that. The paws on its small forelimbs clenched and unclenched constantly. Hoskins said, It's our dinosaur. We've had it for months. I don't know when we'll be able to let go of it. Dinosaur? Did you expect a giant? She dimpled. One does, I suppose. I know some of them are small. A small one is all we aimed for, believe me. Generally, it's under investigation. But this seems to be an open hour. Some interesting things have been discovered. For instance, it is not entirely cold-blooded. It has an imperfect method of maintaining internal temperatures higher than that of its environment. Unfortunately, it's a male. Ever since we brought it in, we've been trying to get a fix on another that may be female, but we've had no luck yet. 
Why female? He looked at her quizzically. So that we might have a fighting chance to obtain fertile eggs and baby dinosaurs. Of course. He led her to the trilobite section. That's Professor Duane of Washington University, he said. He's a nuclear chemist. If I recall correctly, he's taking an isotope ratio on the oxygen of the water. Why? It's primeval water, at least half a billion years old. The isotope ratio gives the temperature of the ocean at that time. He himself happens to ignore the trilobites, but others are chiefly concerned in dissecting them. They're the lucky ones because all they need are scalpels and microscopes. Duane has to set up a mass spectrograph each time he conducts an experiment. Why is that? Can't he? No, he can't. He can't take anything out of the room as far as can be helped. There were samples of primordial plant life, too, and chunks of rock formations. Those were the vegetable and mineral. And every specimen had its investigator. It was like a museum, a museum brought to life and serving as a superactive center of research. And you have to supervise all of this, Dr. Hoskins? Only indirectly, Miss Fellows. I have subordinates, thank heaven. My own interest is entirely in the theoretical aspects of the matter. The nature of time, the technique of mesonic intertemporal detection, and so on. I would exchange all of this for a method of detecting objects closer in time than 10,000 years ago. If we could get into historical times. He was interrupted by a commotion at one of the distant booths. A thin voice raised querulously. He frowned, muttered hastily, excuse me, and hastened off. Miss Fellows followed as best she could without actually running. An elderly man, thinly bearded and red-faced, was saying, I had vital aspects of my investigations to complete. Don't you understand that? A uniformed technician with the interwoven SI monogram, or Stasis Inc., on his lab coat, said, Dr. Hoskins, it was arranged with Professor Adamuski at the beginning that the specimen could only remain here two weeks. I did not know then how long my investigation would take. I'm not a prophet, said Adam Yusky heatedly. Dr. Hoskins said, You understand, Professor, we have limited space. We must keep specimens rotating. That piece of chalcopyrite must go back. There are men waiting for the next specimen. Why can't I have it for myself, then? Let me take it out of there. You know you can't have it. A piece of chalcopyrite? A miserable five-kilogram piece? Why not? We can't afford the energy expense, said Hoskins brusquely. You know that. The technician interrupted. The point is, Dr. Hoskins, that he tried to remove the rock against the rules and I almost punctured stasis while he was in there, not knowing he was in there. There was a short silence and Dr. Hoskins turned on the investigator with a cold formality. Is that so, Professor? Professor Adamuski coughed. I saw no harm. Hoskins reached up to a hand pole dangling just within reach, outside the specimen room in question. He pulled it. Miss Fellows, who had been peering in, looking at the totally undistinguished sample of rock that occasioned the dispute, drew in her breath sharply as its existence flickered out. The room was empty. Hoskins said, Professor, your permit to investigate matters in stasis will be permanently voided. I am sorry. But wait. I am sorry. You have violated one of the stringent rules. I will appeal to the International Association. Appeal away. In a case like this, you will find I can't be overruled. He turned away deliberately, leaving the professor still protesting, and said to Miss Fellows, his face still white with anger. Would you care to have lunch with me, Miss Fellows? He took her into the small administration alcove of the cafeteria. He greeted others and introduced Miss Fellows with complete ease, although she herself felt painfully self-conscious. What must they think, she thought, and tried desperately to appear businesslike. 
she said. Do you have that kind of trouble often, Dr. Hoskins? I mean, like that you just had with the professor? She took her fork in hand and began eating. No, said Hoskins forcefully. That was the first time. Of course, I'm always having to argue men out of removing specimens, but this is the first time one actually tried to do it. I remember you once talked about the energy it would consume. That's right. Of course, we've tried to take it into account. Accidents will happen, and so we've got special power sources designed to stand the drain of accidental removal from stasis. But that doesn't mean we want to see a year's supply of energy gone in half a second or can afford to without having our plans of expansion delayed for years. Besides, imagine the professors being in the room while Stasis was about to be punctured. What would have happened to him if it had been? Well, we've experimented with inanimate objects and with mice, and they've disappeared. Presumably, they've traveled back in time, carried along, so to speak, by the pull of the object simultaneously snapping back into its natural time. For that reason, we have to anchor objects within stasis that we don't want to move, and that's complicated procedure. The professor would not have been anchored, and he would have gone back to the Pliocene at the moment when we abstracted the rock, plus, of course, the two weeks it had remained here in the present. How dreadful it would have been. Not on account of the professor, I assure you. If he were fool enough to do what he did, it would serve him right. But imagine the effect it would have on the public if the fact came out. All people would need is to become aware of the dangers involved, and funds could be choked off like that. He snapped his fingers and played moodily with his food. Miss Fellows said, Couldn't you get him back, the way you got the rock in the first place? No, because once an object is returned, the original fix is lost unless we deliberately plan to retain it, and there was no reason to do that in this case. There never is. Finding the professor again would mean relocating a specific fix, and that would be like dropping a line into the oceanic abyss for the purpose of dredging up a particular fish. My God, when I think of the precautions we take to prevent accidents, it makes me mad. We have every individual stasis unit set up with its own puncturing device. We have to, since each unit has its separate fix and must be collapsible independently. The point is, though, none of the puncturing devices is ever activated until the last minute. And then we deliberately make activation impossible except by the pull of a rope carefully let outside the stasis. The pull is a gross mechanical motion that requires a strong effort, not something that is likely to be done accidentally. Miss Fellows said, but doesn't it change history to move something in and out of time? Hoskins shrugged. Theoretically, yes. Actually, except in unusual cases, no. We move objects out of stasis all the time. Air molecules, bacteria, dust. About 10% of our energy consumption goes to make up micro-losses of that nature. But moving even large objects in time sets up changes that damp out. Take that chalcopyrite from the Pliocene. Because of its absence for two weeks, some insect didn't find the shelter it might have found and is killed. That could initiate a whole series of changes. But the mathematics of stasis indicates that this is a converging series. The amount of change diminishes with time, and then things are as before. You mean reality heals itself? In a manner of speaking, abstract a human from time or send one back, and you make a larger wound. If the individual is an ordinary one, that wound still heals itself. Of course, there are a great many people who write to us each day and want us to bring Abraham Lincoln into the present, or Mohammed or Lenin. That can't be done, of course. Even if we could find them, the change in reality and moving one of the history molders would be too great to be healed. There are ways of calculating when a change is likely to be too great, and we avoid even approaching that limit. Miss Fellows said, Then Timmy... No, he represents no problem in that direction. Reality is safe. 
but he gave her a quick sharp glance then went on but never mind yesterday you said timmy needed companionship yes miss fellows smiled her delight i didn't think you paid that any attention of course i did i'm fond of the child i appreciate your feelings for him and i was concerned enough to want to explain to you now i have you've seen what we do you've gotten some insight into the difficulties involved so you know why with the best will in the world we can't supply companionship for timmy you can't said miss fellows with sudden dismay but i've just explained we couldn't possibly expect to find another neanderthal his age without incredible luck and if we could it wouldn't be fair to multiply risks by having another human being in stasis miss fellows put down her spoon and said energetically but dr hoskins that is not at all what i meant i don't want you to bring another neanderthal into the present i know that's impossible but it isn't impossible to bring another child to play with timmy hoskins stared at her in concern a human child another child said miss fellows completely hostile now timmy is human i couldn't dream of such a thing why not why couldn't you what is wrong with the notion you pulled that child out of time and made him an eternal prisoner don't you owe him something dr hoskins if there is any man who in this world is that child's father in every sense but the biological it is you why can't you do this little thing for him hoskins said his father he rose somewhat unsteadily to his feet miss fellows i think i'll take you back now if you don't mind they returned to the dollhouse in a complete silence that neither broke it was a long time after that before she saw hoskins again except for an occasional glimpse in passing she was sorry about that at times then at other times when timmy was more than usually woebegone or when he spent silent hours at the window with its prospect of little more than nothing she thought fiercely stupid man timmy's speech grew better and more precise every day it never entirely lost a certain soft slurriness that miss fellows found rather endearing in times of excitement he fell back into tongue clicking but those times were becoming fewer he must be forgetting the days before he came into the present except for dreams as he grew older the physiologists grew less interested and the psychologists more so miss fellows was not sure that she did not like the new group even less than the first the needles were gone the injections and withdrawals of fluid the special diets but now timmy was made to overcome barriers to reach food and water he had to lift panels move bars reach for cords and the mild electric shocks made him cry and drove miss fellows to distraction she did not wish to appeal to hoskins she did not wish to have to go to him for each time she thought of him she thought of his face over the luncheon table that last time her eyes moistened and she thought stupid stupid man and then one day hoskins voice sounded unexpectedly calling into the dollhouse miss fellows she came out coldly smoothing her nurse's uniform then stopped in confusion at finding herself in the presence of a pale woman slender and of middle height the woman's fair hair and complexion gave her an appearance of fragility standing behind her and clutching at her skirt was a round-faced large-eyed child of four hoskins said dear this is miss fellows the nurse in charge of the boy miss fellows this is my wife was this his wife she was not as miss fellows had imagined her to be but then why not a man like hoskins would choose a weak thing to be his foil if that was what he wanted she forced a matter-of-fact greeting good afternoon mrs hoskins is this your your little boy that was a surprise she had thought of hoskins as a husband but not as a father except of course 
She suddenly caught Hoskins' grave eyes and flushed. Hoskins said, Yes, this is my boy Jerry. Say hello to Miss Fellows, Jerry. Had he stressed the word this just a bit? Was he saying this was his son and not? Jerry receded a bit further into the folds of the maternal skirt and muttered his hello. Mrs. Hoskins' eyes were searching over Miss Fellows' shoulders, peering into the room, looking for something. Hoskins said, Well, let's go in. Come, dear. There's a trifling discomfort at the threshold, but it passes. Miss Fellows said, Do you want Jerry to come in, too? Of course. He is to be Timmy's playmate. You said that Timmy needed a playmate, or have you forgotten? But... She looked at him with a colossal, surprised wonder. Your boy? He said peevishly, Well, whose boy, then? Isn't this what you want? Come on in, dear. Come on in. Mrs. Hoskins lifted Jerry into her arms with a distinct effort and, hesitantly, stepped over the threshold. Jerry squirmed as she did so, disliking the sensation. Mrs. Hoskins said in a thin voice, Is the creature here? I don't see him. Miss Fellows called, Timmy, come out. Timmy peered around the edge of the door, staring up at the little boy who was visiting him. The muscles in Mrs. Hoskins' arms tensed visibly. She said to her husband, Gerald, are you sure it's safe? Miss Fellows said at once, If you mean is Timmy safe, why, of course he is. He's a gentle little boy. But he's a sa savage. The ape boy stories in the newspapers. Miss Fellows said emphatically, He is not a savage. He is just as quiet and reasonable as you can possibly expect a five-and-a-half-year-old to be. It is very generous of you, Mrs. Hoskins, to agree to allow your boy to play with Timmy, but please have no fears about it. Mrs. Hoskins said with mild heat, I'm not sure that I agree. We've had it out, dear, said Hoskins. Let's not bring up the matter for new argument. Put Jerry down. Mrs. Hoskins did so when the boy backed against her, staring at the pair of eyes which were staring back at him from the next room. Come here, Timmy, said Miss Fellows. Don't be afraid. Slowly, Timmy stepped into the room. Hoskins bent to disengage Jerry's fingers from his mother's skirt. Step back, dear. Give the children a chance. The youngsters faced one another. Although the younger, Jerry was nevertheless an inch taller, and in the pressure of his straightness and his high-held, well-proportioned head, Timmy's grotesqueries were suddenly almost as pronounced as they had been in the first days. Miss Fellow's lips quivered. It was the little Neanderthal who spoke first in childish treble. What's your name? And Timmy thrust his face suddenly forward as though to inspect the other's features more closely. Startled, Jerry responded with a vigorous shove that sent Timmy tumbling. Both began crying loudly and Mrs. Hoskins snatched up her child, while Miss Fellows, flushed with repressed anger, lifted Timmy and comforted him. Mrs. Hoskins said, They just instinctively don't like one another. No more instinctively, said her husband wearily, than any two children dislike each other. Now put Jerry down and let him get used to the situation. In fact, we had better leave. Miss Fellows can bring Jerry to my office after a while, and I'll have him taken home. The two children spent the next hour very aware of each other. Jerry cried for his mother, struck out at Miss Fellows, and, finally, allowed himself to be comforted with a lollipop. Timmy sucked at another, and at the end of an hour Miss Fellows had them playing with the same set of blocks, though at opposite ends of the room. She found herself almost maudlinly grateful to Hoskins when she brought Jerry to him. She searched for ways to thank him, but his very formality was a rebuff. Perhaps he could not forgive her for making him feel like a cruel father. Perhaps the bringing of his own child was an attempt, after all, to prove himself both a kind father to Timmy and also not his father at all, both at the same time. 
So all she could say was, Thank you. Thank you very much. And all he could say was, It's all right. Don't mention it. It became a settled routine. Twice a week, Jerry was brought in for an hour's play, later extended to two hours' play. The children learned each other's names and ways and played together. And yet, after the first rush of gratitude, Miss Fellows found herself disliking Jerry. He was larger and heavier and in all things dominant, forcing Timmy into a completely secondary role. All that reconciled her to the situation was the fact that, despite difficulties, Timmy looked forward with more and more delight to the periodic appearances of his playfellow. It was all he had, she mourned to herself. And once, as she watched them, she thought, Hoskins' two children, one by his wife and one by Stasis. While she herself, heavens, she thought, putting her fists to her temples and feeling ashamed. I'm jealous. Miss Fellows, said Timmy, carefully, she had never allowed him to call her anything else. When will I go to school? She looked down at those eager brown eyes turned up to hers and passed her hand softly through his thick curly hair. It was the most disheveled portion of his appearance, for she cut his hair herself while he sat restlessly under the scissors. She did not ask for professional help, for the very clumsiness of the cut served to mask the retreating forepart of the skull and the bulging hinder part. She said, Where did you hear about school? Jerry goes to school. Kindergarten. He said it carefully. There are lots of places he goes. Outside. When can I go outside, Miss Fellows? A small pain centered in Miss Fellows' heart. Of course, she saw there would be no way of avoiding the inevitability of Timmy's hearing more and more of the outer world he could never enter. She said with an attempt at gaiety, Why, whatever would you do in kindergarten, Timmy? Jerry says they play games. They have picture tapes. He says there are lots of children. He says, he says. A thought, then a triumphant upholding of both small hands with the fingers splayed apart. He says this many. Miss Fellows said, Would you like picture tapes? I can get you picture tapes, very nice ones, and music tapes too. So that Timmy was temporarily comforted. He poured over the picture tapes in Jerry's absence, and Miss Fellows read to him out of ordinary books by the hours. There was so much to explain in even the simplest story, so much that was outside the perspective of his three rooms. Timmy took to having his dreams more often now that the outside was being introduced to him. They were always the same, about the outside. He tried haltingly to describe them to Miss Fellows. In his dreams, he was outside, an empty outside, but very large, with children and queer indescribable objects half digested in his thought out of bookish descriptions half understood or out of distant Neanderthal memories half recalled. But the children and objects ignored him, and though he was in the world, he was never part of it but was as alone as though he were in his own room, and would wake up crying. Miss Fellows tried to laugh at the dreams, but there were nights in her own apartment when she cried too. One day, as Miss Fellows read, Timmy put his hand under her chin and lifted it gently so that her eyes left the book and met his. He said, How do you know what to say, Miss Fellows? She said, you see these marks? They tell me what to say. These marks make words. He stared at them long and curiously, taking the book out of her hands. Some of these marks are the same. She laughed with pleasure at this sign of his shrewdness and said, So they are. Would you like to have me show you how to make the marks? All right. That would be a nice game. 
it did not occur to her that he could learn to read. Up to the very moment that he read a book to her, it did not occur to her that he could learn to read. Then, weeks later, the enormity of what had been done struck her. Timmy sat in her lap, following word by word the printing in a child's book, reading to her. He was reading to her. She struggled to her feet in amazement and said, Now, Timmy, I'll be back later. I want to see Dr. Hoskins. Excited nearly to frenzy, it seemed to her she might have an answer to Timmy's unhappiness. If Timmy could not leave to enter the world, the world must be brought into those three rooms to Timmy. The whole world in books and film and sound. He must be educated to his full capacity. So much the world owed him. She found Hoskins in a mood that was oddly analogous to her own, a kind of triumph of glory. His offices were unusually busy, and for a moment she thought she would not get to see him, as she stood abashed in the anteroom. But he saw her and a smile spread over his broad face. Miss Fellows, come here. He spoke rapidly into the intercom, then shut it off. Have you heard? No, of course you couldn't have. We've done it. We've actually done it. We have intertemporal detection at close range. You mean? She tried to detach her thought from her own good news for a moment. That you can get a person from historical times into the present? That's just what I mean. We have a fix on a 14th century individual right now. Imagine. Imagine. If you could only know how glad I'll be to shift from the eternal concentration on the Mesozoic, replace the paleontologists with the historians, but there's something you wish to say to me, eh? Well, go ahead. Go ahead. You find me in a good mood. Anything you want, you can have. Miss Fellows smiled. I'm glad, because I wonder if we might not establish a system of instruction for Timmy. Instruction? In what? Well, in everything. A school. So that he might learn. But can he learn? Certainly he is learning. He can read. I've taught him so much myself. Hoskins sat there, seeming suddenly depressed. I don't know, Miss Fellows. She said, You just said that anything I wanted. I know, and I should not have. You see, Miss Fellows, I'm sure you must realize that we cannot maintain the Timmy experiment forever. She stared at him with sudden horror, not really understanding what he had said. How did he mean, cannot maintain? With an agonizing flash of recollection, she recalled Professor Adamuski and his mineral specimen that was taken away after two weeks. She said, But you're talking about a boy. Not about a rock. Dr. Hoskins said uneasily, Even a boy can't be given undue importance, Miss Fellows. Now that we expect individuals out of historical time, we will need stasis space, all we can get. She didn't grasp it. But you can't. Timmy, Timmy... Now, Miss Fellows, please don't upset yourself. Timmy won't go right away, perhaps not for months. Meanwhile, we'll do what we can. She was still staring at him. Let me get you something, Miss Fellows. No, she whispered. I don't need anything. She arose in a kind of nightmare and left. Timmy, she thought, you will not die. You will not die. It was all very well to hold tensely to the thought that Timmy must not die, but how was that to be arranged? In the first weeks, Miss Fellows clung only to the hope that the attempt to bring forward a man from the 14th century would fail completely. Hoskins' theories might be wrong, or his practice defective. Then things could go on as before. Certainly, that was not the hope of the rest of the world, and, irrationally, Miss Fellows hated the world for it. Project Middle Ages reached a climax of white-hot publicity. The press and the public had hungered for something like this. 
Stasis Inc. had lacked the necessary sensation for a long time now. A new rock or another ancient fish failed to stir them. But this was it. An historical human. An adult speaking a known language. Someone who could open a new page of history to the scholar. Zero time was coming, and this time it was not a question of three onlookers from a balcony. This time there would be a worldwide audience. This time the technicians of Stasis Inc. would play their role before nearly all of mankind. Miss Fellows was herself all but savage with waiting. When young Jerry Hoskins showed up for his scheduled playtime with Timmy, she scarcely recognized him. He was not the one she was waiting for. The secretary who brought him left hurriedly after the barest nod for Miss Fellows. She was rushing for a good place from which to watch the climax of Project Middle Ages. And so ought Miss Fellows, with far better reason, she thought bitterly, if only that stupid girl would arrive. Jerry Hoskins sidled toward her, embarrassed. Miss Fellows? He took the reproduction of a news strip out of his pocket. Yes, what is it, Jerry? Is this a picture of Timmy? Miss Fellows stared at him, then snatched the strip from Jerry's hand. The excitement of Project Middle Ages had brought about a pale revival of interest in Timmy on the part of the press. Jerry watched her narrowly, then said, It says Timmy is an ape boy. What does that mean? Miss Fellows caught the youngster's wrist and repressed the impulse to shake him. Never say that, Jerry. Never, do you understand? It is a nasty word and you mustn't use it. Jerry struggled out of her grip, frightened. Miss Fellows tore up the news strip with a vicious twist of the wrist. Now go inside and play with Timmy. He's got a new book to show you. And then, finally, the girl appeared. Miss Fellows did not know her. None of the usual stand-ins she had used when business took her elsewhere was available now, not with Project Middle Ages at Climax, but Hoskins' secretary had promised to find someone, and this must be the girl. Miss Fellows tried to keep querulousness out of her voice. Are you the girl assigned to Stasis Section 1? Yes, I'm Mandy Terrace. You're Miss Fellows, aren't you? That's right. I'm sorry I'm late. There's just so much excitement. I know. Now I want you, Mandy said, you'll be watching, I suppose. Her thin, vacuously pretty face filled with envy. Never mind that. Now I want you to come inside and meet Timmy and Jerry. They will be playing for the next two hours, so they'll be giving you no trouble. They've got milk candy and plenty of toys. In fact, it will be better if you leave them alone as much as possible. Now I'll show you where everything is located, and... Is it Timmy that's the eight book? Timmy is the stasis subject, said Miss Fellows firmly. I mean, he's the one who's not supposed to get out, is that right? Yes. Now come in. There isn't much time. And when she finally left, Mandy Terrace called after her shrilly, I hope you get a good seat, and golly, I sure hope it works. Miss Fellows did not trust herself to make a reasonable response. She hurried on without looking back. But the delay meant she did not get a good seat. She got no nearer than the wall viewing plate in the assembly hall. Bitterly, she regretted that. If she could have been on the spot, if she could somehow have reached out for some sensitive portion of the instrumentations, if she were in some way able to wreck the experiment, she found the strength to beat down her madness. Simple destruction would have done no good. They would have rebuilt and reconstructed and made the effort again. And she would never be allowed to return to Timmy. Nothing would help. Nothing but that the experiment itself fail. That it break down irretrievably. So she waded through the countdown, watching every move on the giant screen, scanning the faces of the technicians as the focus shifted from one to the other, watching for the look of worry and uncertainty that would mark something going unexpectedly wrong. Watching. Watching. There was no such luck. 
the count reached zero, and very quietly, very unassumingly, the experiment succeeded. In the new stasis that had been established, there stood a bearded, stoop-shouldered peasant of indeterminate age, in ragged, dirty clothing and wooden shoes, staring in dull horror at the sudden mad change that had flung itself over him. And while the world went mad with jubilation, Miss Fellows stood frozen in sorrow, jostled and pushed, all but trampled, surrounded by triumph while bowed down with defeat. And when the loudspeaker called her name with strident force, it sounded it three times before she responded. Miss Fellows! Miss Fellows! You are wanted in stasis section one immediately, Miss Fellows! Miss Fell! Let me through! she cried breathlessly, while the loudspeaker continued its repetitions without pause. She forced her way through the crowd with wild energy, beating at it, striking out with closed fists, flailing, moving toward the door in a nightmare slowness. Mandy Terrace was in tears. I don't know how it happened. I just went down to the edge of the corridor to watch a pocket viewing plate they had put up. Just for a minute, and then before I could move or do anything, she cried out in sudden accusation. You said they would make no trouble. You said to leave them alone. Miss Fellows, disheveled and trembling uncontrollably, glared at her. Where's Timmy? A nurse was swabbing the arm of a wailing Jerry with disinfectant, and another was preparing an anti-tetanus shot. There was blood on Jerry's clothes. He bit me, Miss Fellows, Jerry cried in rage. He bit me. But Miss Fellows didn't even see him. What did you do with Timmy? She cried out. I locked him in the bathroom, said Mandy. I just threw the little monster in there and locked him in. Miss Fellows ran into the dollhouse. She fumbled at the bathroom door. It took an eternity to get it open and to find the ugly little boy cowering in the corner. Don't whip me, Miss Fellows, he whispered. His eyes were red, his lips quivering. I didn't mean to do it. Oh, Timmy, who told you about whips? She caught him to her, hugging him wildly. He said tremulously, she said with a long rope. She said you would hit me and hit me. You won't be. She was wicked to say so. But what happened? What happened? He called me an ape boy. He said I wasn't a real boy. He said I was an animal. Timmy dissolved in a flood of tears. He said he wasn't going to play with a monkey anymore. I said I wasn't a monkey. I wasn't a monkey. He said I was all funny looking. He said I was horrible ugly. He kept saying and saying and I bit him. They were both crying now. Miss Fellows sobbed. But it isn't true. You know that, Timmy. You're a real boy. You're a dear boy and the best boy in the world. And no one, no one will ever take you away from me. It was easy to make up her mind now. Easy to know what to do. Only it had to be done quickly. Hoskins wouldn't wait much longer, with his own son mangled. No, it would have to be done this night, this night. With the place four-fifths asleep and the remaining fifth intellectually drunk over Project Middle Ages. It would be an unusual time for her to return, but not an unheard-of one. The guard knew her well and would not dream of questioning her. He would think nothing of her carrying a suitcase. She rehearsed the non-committal phrase, games for the boy, and the calm smile. Why shouldn't he believe that? He did. When she entered the dollhouse again, Timmy was still awake, and she maintained a desperate normality to avoid frightening him. She talked about his dreams with him and listened to him ask wistfully after Jerry. There would be few to see her afterward, none to question the bundle she would be carrying. Timmy would be very quiet, and then it would be a fait accompli. It would be done, and what would be the use of trying to undo it? They would leave her be. They would leave them both be. 
She opened the suitcase, took out the overcoat, the woolen cap with the ear flaps and the rest. Timmy sat with the beginning of alarm. Why are you putting all these clothes on me, Miss Fellows? She said, I am going to take you outside, Timmy, to where your dreams are. My dreams? His face twisted in sudden yearning, yet fear was there too. You won't be afraid. You'll be with me. You won't be afraid if you're with me, will you, Timmy? No, Miss Fellows. He buried his little misshapen head against her side, and under her enclosing arm she could feel his small heart thud. It was midnight and she lifted him into her arms. She disconnected the alarm and opened the door softly. And she screamed, for facing her across the open door was Hoskins. There were two men with him and he stared at her as astonished as she. Miss Fellows recovered first by a second and made a quick attempt to push past him, but even with the second's delay he had time. He caught her roughly and hurled her back against a chest of drawers. He waved the men in and confronted her, blocking the door. I didn't expect this. Are you completely insane? She had managed to interpose her shoulder so that it, rather than Timmy, had struck the chest. She said pleadingly, What harm can it do if I take him, Dr. Hoskins? You can't put energy loss ahead of a human life. Firmly, Hoskins took Timmy out of her arms. An energy loss this size would mean millions of dollars lost out of the pockets of investors. It would mean a terrible setback for Stasis, Inc. It would mean eventual publicity about a sentimental nurse destroying all that for the sake of an ape boy. Ape boy? said Miss Fellows, in helpless fury. That's what the reporters would call him, said Hoskins. One of the men emerged now looping a nylon rope through eyelets along the upper portion of the wall. Miss Fellows remembered the rope that Hoskins had pulled outside the room containing Professor Adamuski's rock specimen so long ago. She cried out, No! But Hoskins put Timmy down and gently removed the overcoat he was wearing. You stay here, Timmy. Nothing will happen to you. We're just going outside for a moment, all right? Timmy, white and wordless, managed to nod. Hoskins steered Miss Fellows out of the dollhouse ahead of himself. For the moment, Miss Fellows was beyond resistance. Dully, she noticed the hand pull being adjusted outside the dollhouse. I'm sorry, Miss Fellows, said Hoskins. I would have spared you this. I planned it for the night, so that you would know only when it was over she said in a weary whisper, Because your son was hurt. Because he tormented this child into striking out at him. No, believe me, I understand about the incident today and I know it was Jerry's fault. But the story has leaked out. It would have to, with the press surrounding us on this day of all days. I can't risk having a distorted story about negligence and savage Neanderthalers, so-called, Distract from the success of Project Middle Ages. Timmy has to go soon anyway. He might as well go now and give the sensationalists as small a peg as possible on which to hang their trash. It's not like sending a rock back. You'll be killing a human being. Not killing. There'll be no sensation. He'll simply be a Neanderthal boy in a Neanderthal world. He will no longer be a prisoner and alien. He will have a chance at a free life. What chance? He's only seven years old, used to being taken care of, fed, clothed, sheltered. He will be alone. His tribe may not be at the point where he left them, now that four years have passed. And if they were, they would not recognize him. He will have to take care of himself. How will he know how? Hoskins shook his head in hopeless negative. Lord, Miss Fellows... Do you think we haven't thought of that? Do you think we would have brought in a child if it weren't that it was the first successful fix of a human or near-human we made, and that we did not dare to take the chance of unfixing him and finding another fix as good? Why do you suppose we kept Timmy as long as we did, if it were not for our reluctance to send a child back into the past? It's just... 
His voice took on a desperate urgency. That we can wait no longer. Timmy stands in the way of expansion. Timmy is a source of possible bad publicity. We are on the threshold of great things, and I'm sorry, Miss Fellows, but we can't let Timmy block us. We cannot. We cannot. I'm sorry, Miss Fellows. Well, then, said Miss Fellows, sadly, let me say goodbye. Give me five minutes to say goodbye. Spare me that much. Hoskins hesitated. Go ahead. Timmy ran to her. For the last time he ran to her, and for the last time Miss Fellows clasped him in her arms. For a moment, she hugged him blindly. She caught at a chair with the toe of one foot, moved it against the wall, sat down. Don't be afraid, Timmy. I'm not afraid if you're here, Miss Fellows. Is that man mad at me, the man out there? No, he isn't. He just doesn't understand about us. Timmy, do you know what a mother is? Like Jerry's mother? Did he tell you about his mother? Sometimes. I think maybe a mother is a lady who takes care of you and who's very nice to you and who does good things. That's right. Have you ever wanted a mother, Timmy? Timmy pulled his head away from her so that he could look into her face. Slowly, he put his hand to her cheek and hair and stroked her, as long, long ago she had stroked him. He said, Aren't you my mother? Oh, Timmy. Are you angry because I asked? No, of course not. Because I know your name is Miss Fellows, but sometimes I call you Mother inside. Is that all right? Yes, yes. It's all right. And I won't leave you any more, and nothing will hurt you. I'll be with you to care for you always. Call me mother so I can hear you. Mother, said Timmy contentedly, leaning his cheek against hers. She rose and, still holding him, stepped up on the chair. The sudden beginning of a shout from outside went unheard, and with her free hand, she yanked with all her weight at the cord where it hung suspended between two eyelets. And stasis was punctured, and the room was empty. The Billiard Ball James Priss, I suppose I ought to say Professor James Priss, though everyone is sure to know whom I mean even without the title, always spoke slowly. I know. I interviewed him often enough. He had the greatest mind since Einstein, but it didn't work quickly. He admitted his slowness often. Maybe it was because he had so great a mind that it didn't work quickly. He would say something in slow abstraction, then he would think, and then he would say something more. Even over trivial matters, his giant mind would hover uncertainly, adding a touch here and then another there. Would the sun rise tomorrow? I can imagine him wondering. What do we mean by rise? Can we be certain that tomorrow will come? Is the term sun completely unambiguous in this connection? Add to this habit of speech a bland countenance, rather pale, with no expression except for a general look of uncertainty, gray hair rather thin, neatly combed, business suits of an invariably conservative cut, and you have what Professor James Priss was, a retiring person completely lacking in magnetism. That's why nobody in the world except myself could possibly suspect him of being a murderer. And even I am not sure. After all, he was slow thinking. He was always slow thinking. Is it conceivable that at one crucial moment he managed to think quickly and act at once? It doesn't matter. Even if he murdered, he got away with it. It is far too late now to try to reverse matters, and I wouldn't succeed in doing so even if I decided to let this be published. Edward Bloom was Pris's classmate in college and an associate, through circumstance, for a generation afterward. 
They were equal in age and in their propensity for the bachelor life, but opposites in everything else that mattered. Bloom was a living flash of light, colorful, tall, broad, loud, brash, and self-confident. He had a mind that resembled a meteor strike in the sudden and unexpected way it could seize the essential. He was no theoretician, as Pris was. Bloom had neither the patience for it, nor the capacity to concentrate intense thought upon a single abstract point. He admitted that. He boasted of it. What he did have was an uncanny way of seeing the application of a theory of seeing the manner in which it could be put to use. In the cold marble block of abstract structure, he could see, without apparent difficulty, the intricate design of a marvelous device. The block would fall apart at his touch and leave the device. It is a well-known story, and not too badly exaggerated, that nothing Bloom ever built had failed to work, or to be patentable, or to be profitable. By the time he was forty-five, he was one of the richest men on earth. And if Bloom, the technician, were adapted to one particular matter more than anything else, it was to the way of thought of Pris, the theoretician. Bloom's greatest gadgets were built upon Pris's greatest thoughts, and as Bloom grew wealthy and famous, Pris gained phenomenal respect among his colleagues. Naturally, it was to be expected that when Pris advanced his two-field theory, Bloom would set about at once to build the first practical anti-gravity device. My job was to find human interest in the two-field theory for the subscribers to Telenews Press. And you get that by trying to deal with human beings, and not with abstract ideas. Since my interviewee was Professor Pris, that wasn't easy. Naturally, I was going to ask about the possibilities of anti-gravity, which interested everyone, and not about the two-field theory, which no one could understand. Anti-gravity? Pris compressed his pale lips and considered. I'm not entirely sure that it is possible, or ever will be. I haven't, uh, worked the matter out to my satisfaction. I don't entirely see whether the two field equations would have a finite solution, which they would have to have, of course, if... And then he went off into a brown study. I prodded him. Bloom says he thinks such a device can be built. Chris nodded. Well, yes, but I wonder. Ed Bloom has had an amazing knack at seeing the unobvious in the past. He has an unusual mind. It certainly made him rich enough. We were sitting in Pris's apartment, ordinary middle class. I couldn't help a quick glance this way and that. Pris was not wealthy. I don't think he read my mind. He saw me look. And I think it was on his mind. He said, Wealth isn't the usual reward for the pure scientist, or even a particularly desirable one. Maybe so, at that, I thought. Chris certainly had his own kind of reward. He was the third person in history to win two Nobel Prizes, and the first to have both of them in the sciences and both of them unshared. You can't complain about that. And if he wasn't rich, neither was he poor. But he didn't sound like a contented man. Maybe it wasn't Bloom's wealth alone that irked Chris. Maybe it was Bloom's fame among the people of Earth generally. Maybe it was the fact that Bloom was a celebrity wherever he went, whereas Pris, outside scientific conventions and faculty clubs, was largely anonymous. I can't say how much of all this was in my eyes or in the way I wrinkled the creases in my forehead, but Pris went on to say, But we're friends, you know. We play billiards once or twice a week. I beat him regularly. I never published that statement. I checked it with Bloom, who made a long counter-statement that began, He beats me at billiards, that jackass, and grew increasingly personal thereafter. As a matter of fact, neither one was a novice at billiards, 
I watched them play once for a short while after the statement and counterstatement, and both handled the cue with professional aplomb. What's more, both played for blood, and there was no friendship in the game that I could see. I said, Would you care to predict whether Bloom will manage to build an anti-gravity device? You mean would I commit myself to anything? Hmm. Well, let's consider, young man. Just what do we mean by anti-gravity? Our conception of gravity is built around Einstein's general theory of relativity, which is now a century and a half old, but which, within its limits, remains firm. We can picture it. I listened politely. I'd heard Pris on the subject before, but if I was to get anything out of him, which wasn't certain, I'd have to let him work his way through in his own way. We can picture it, he said, by imagining the universe to be a flat, thin, super-flexible sheet of unterrible rubber. If we picture mass as being associated with weight, as it is on the surface of the earth, then we would expect a mass resting upon the rubber sheet to make an indentation. The greater the mass, the deeper the indentation. In the actual universe, he went on, all sorts of masses exist, and so our rubber sheet must be pictured as riddled with indentations. Any object rolling along the sheet would dip into and out of the indentations it passed, veering and changing direction as it did so. It is this veer and change of direction that we interpret as demonstrating the existence of a force of gravity. If the moving object comes close enough to the center of the indentation and is moving slowly enough, it gets trapped and whirls round and round that indentation. In the absence of friction, it keeps up that whirl forever. In other words, what Isaac Newton interpreted as a force, Albert Einstein interpreted as geometrical distortion. He paused at this point. He had been speaking fairly fluently, for him, since he was saying something he had said often before. But now he began to pick his way. He said, So, in trying to produce anti-gravity, we are trying to alter the geometry of the universe. If we carry on our metaphor, we are trying to straighten out the indented rubber sheet. We could imagine ourselves getting under the indenting mass and lifting it upward, supporting it so as to prevent it from making an indentation. If we make the rubber sheet flat in that way, then we create a universe, or at least a portion of the universe, in which gravity doesn't exist. A rolling body would pass the non-indenting mass without altering its direction of travel a bit and we could interpret this as meaning that the mass was exerting no gravitational force. In order to accomplish this feat, however, we need a mass equivalent to the indenting mass. To produce anti-gravity on Earth in this way, we would have to make sure of a mass equal to that of Earth and poise it above our heads, so to speak. I interrupted him. But your two-field theory... Exactly. General relativity does not explain both the gravitational field and the electromagnetic field in a single set of equations. Einstein spent half his life searching for that single set, for a unified field theory, and failed. All who followed Einstein also failed. I, however, began with the assumption that there were two fields that could not be unified, and followed the consequences which I can explain, in part, in terms of the rubber sheet metaphor. Now we came to something I wasn't sure I had ever heard before. How does that go? I asked. Suppose that instead of trying to lift the indenting mass, we try to stiffen the sheet itself, make it less indentable. It would contract, at least over a small area, and become flatter. Gravity would weaken and so would mass, for the two are essentially the same phenomenon in terms of the indented universe. If we could make the rubber sheet completely flat, both gravity and mass would disappear altogether. Under the proper conditions, 
the electromagnetic field could be made to counter the gravitational field and serve to stiffen the indented fabric of the universe. The electromagnetic field is tremendously stronger than the gravitational field, so the former could be made to overcome the latter. I said uncertainly, but you say under the proper conditions. Can those proper conditions you speak of be achieved, Professor? That is what I don't know, said Pris thoughtfully and slowly. If the universe were really a rubber sheet, its stiffness would have to reach an infinite value before it could be expected to remain completely flat under an indenting mass. If that is also so in the real universe, then an infinitely intense electromagnetic field would be required, and that would mean anti-gravity would be impossible. But Bloom says, yes, I imagine Bloom thinks a finite field will do, if it can be properly applied. Still, however ingenious he is, and Pris smiled narrowly, we needn't take him to be infallible. His grasp on theory is quite faulty. He... He never earned his college degree, did you know that? I was about to say that I knew that. After all, everyone did. But there was a touch of eagerness in Pris's voice as he said it, and I looked up in time to catch animation in his eye, as though he were delighted to spread that piece of news. So I nodded my head as if I were filing it for future reference. Then you would say, Professor Pris, I prodded again, that Bloom is probably wrong and that anti-gravity is impossible? And finally Pris nodded and said, The gravitational field can be weakened, of course, but if by anti-gravity we mean a true zero-gravity field, no gravity at all over a significant volume of space, then I suspect anti-gravity may turn out to be impossible despite Bloom. And I had, after a fashion, what I wanted. I wasn't able to see Bloom for nearly three months after that, and when I did see him, he was in an angry mood. He had grown angry at once, of course, when the news first broke concerning Pris's statement. He let it be known that Pris would be invited to the eventual display of the anti-gravity device as soon as it was constructed, and would even be asked to participate in the demonstration. Some reporter, not I, unfortunately, caught him between appointments and asked him to elaborate on that, and he said, I'll have the device eventually, soon maybe, and you can be there, and so can anyone else the press would care to have there, and Professor James Priss can be there. He can represent theoretical science, and after I have demonstrated anti-gravity, he can adjust his theory to explain it. I'm sure he will know how to make his adjustments in masterly fashion and show exactly why I couldn't possibly have failed. He might do it now and save time, but I suppose he won't. It was all said very politely, but you could hear the snarl under the rapid flow of words. Yet he continued his occasional game of billiards with Pris, and when the two met they behaved with complete propriety. One could tell the progress Bloom was making by their respective attitudes to the press. Bloom grew curt and even snappish, while Pris developed an increasing good humor. When my umpteenth request for an interview with Bloom was finally accepted, I wondered if perhaps that meant a break in Bloom's quest. I had a little daydream of him announcing final success to me. It didn't work out that way. He met me in his office at Bloom Enterprises in upstate New York. It was a wonderful setting, well away from any populated area, elaborately landscaped, and covering as much ground as a rather large industrial establishment. Edison, at his height two centuries ago, had never been as phenomenally successful as Bloom. But Bloom was not in a good humor. He came striding in ten minutes late and went snarling past his secretary's desk with the barest nod in my direction. He was wearing a lab coat unbuttoned. He threw himself into his chair and said, I'm sorry if I've kept you waiting, but I didn't have as much time as I had hoped. Bloom was a born showman and knew better than to antagonize the press. 
but I had the feeling he was having a great deal of difficulty at that moment in adhering to this principle. I had the obvious guess. I am given to understand, sir, that your recent tests have been unsuccessful. Who told you that? I would say it was general knowledge, Mr. Bloom. No, it isn't. Don't say that, young man. There is no general knowledge about what goes on in my laboratories and workshops. You're stating the professor's opinions, aren't you? Chris's, I mean. No, I'm... Of course you are. Aren't you the one to whom he made that statement, that anti-gravity is impossible? He didn't make the statement that flatly. He never says anything flatly. But it was flat enough for him, and not as flat as I'll have his damned rubber sheet universe before I'm finished. Then does that mean you're making progress, Mr. Bloom? You know I am, he said with a snap. Or you should know. Weren't you at the demonstration last week? Yes, I was. I judged Bloom to be in trouble or he wouldn't be mentioning that demonstration. It worked, but it was not a world-beater. Between the two poles of a magnet a region of lessened gravity was produced. It was done very cleverly. A Mossbauer effect balance was used to probe the space between the poles. If you've never seen an M.E. balance in action, it consists primarily of a tight monochromatic beam of gamma rays shot down the low gravity field. The gamma rays change wavelengths slightly but measurably under the influence of the gravitational field, and if anything happens to alter the intensity of the field, the wavelength change shifts correspondingly. It is an extremely delicate method for probing a gravitational field, and it worked like a charm. There was no question but that Bloom had lowered gravity. The trouble was that it had been done before by others. Bloom, to be sure, had made use of circuits that greatly increased the ease with which such an effect had been achieved. His system was typically ingenious and had been duly patented, and he maintained that it was by this method that anti-gravity would become not merely a scientific curiosity, but a practical affair with industrial applications. Perhaps. But it was an incomplete job, and he didn't usually make a fuss over incompleteness. He wouldn't have done so this time if he weren't desperate to display something. I said, It's my impression that what you accomplished at that preliminary demonstration was 0.82 g, and better than that was achieved in Brazil last spring. That so? Well, calculate the energy input in Brazil and here, and then tell me the difference in gravity decrease per kilowatt hour. You'll be surprised. But the point is, can you reach zero g, zero gravity? That's what Professor Priss thinks may be impossible. Everyone agrees that merely lessening the intensity of the field is no great feat. Bloom's fist clenched. I had the feeling that a key experiment had gone wrong that day, and he was annoyed almost past endurance. Bloom hated to be balked by the universe. He said, Theoreticians make me sick. He said it in a low, controlled voice, as though he were finally tired of not saying it, and he was going to speak his mind and be damned. Chris has won two Nobel Prizes for sloshing around a few equations. But what has he done with it? Nothing. I have done something with it, and I'm going to do more with it, whether Pris likes it or not. I'm the one people will remember. I'm the one who gets the credit. He can keep his damned title and his prizes and his kudos from the scholars. Listen, I'll tell you what gripes him. Plain old-fashioned jealousy. It kills him that I get what I get for doing. He wants it for thinking. I said to him once, we play billiards together, you know. It was at this point that I quoted Pris's statement about billiards and got Bloom's counterstatement. I never published either. That was just trivia. We play billiards, said Bloom, when he had cooled down, and I've won my share of games. We keep things friendly enough. What the hell? College chums and all that. Though how he got through, I'll never know. He made it in physics, of course, and in math. But he got a bare pass, out of pity, I think, in every humanities course he ever took. 
You did not get your degree, did you, Mr. Bloom? That was sheer mischief on my part. I was enjoying his eruption. I quit to go into business, damn it. My academic average over the three years I attended was a strong B. Don't imagine anything else, you hear? Hell, by the time Pris got his Ph.D., I was working on my second million. He went on, clearly irritated. Anyway, we were playing billiards, and I said to him, Jim, the average man will never understand why you get the Nobel Prize when I'm the one who gets the results. Why do you need two? Give me one. He stood there chalking up his cue, and then he said in his soft, namby-pamby way, You have two billions, Ed. Give me one. So you see he wants the money. I said, I take it you don't mind his getting the honor. For a minute I thought he was going to order me out, but he didn't. He laughed instead, waved his hand in front of him, as though he were erasing something from an invisible blackboard in front of him. He said, Oh, well, forget it. All that is off the record. Listen, do you want a statement? Okay. Things didn't go right today and I blew my top a bit. But it will clear up. I think I know what's wrong. And if I don't, I'm going to know. Look. You can say that I say that we don't need infinite electromagnetic intensity. We will flatten out the rubber sheet. We will have zero gravity. And when we get it, I'll have the damnedest demonstration you ever saw. Exclusively for the press and for Pris, and you'll be invited. And you can say it won't be long, okay? Okay. I had time after that to see each man once or twice more. I even saw them together when I was present at one of their billiard games. As I said before, both of them were good. But the call to the demonstration did not come as quickly as all that. It arrived six weeks less than a year after Bloom gave me his statement. And at that, perhaps it was unfair to expect quicker work. I had a special engraved invitation with the assurance of a cocktail hour first. Bloom never did things by halves, and he was planning to have a pleased and satisfied group of reporters on hand. There was an arrangement for trimensional TV, too. Bloom felt completely confident, obviously. Confident enough to be willing to trust the demonstration in every living room on the planet. I called up Professor Pris to make sure he was invited, too. He was. Do you plan to attend, sir? There was a pause, and the professor's face on the screen was a study in uncertain reluctance. A demonstration of this sort is most unsuitable where a serious scientific matter is in question. I do not like to encourage such things. I was afraid he would beg off, and the dramatics of the situation would be greatly lessened if he were not there. But then, perhaps, he decided he dared not play the chicken before the world. With obvious distaste, he said, Of course, Ed Bloom is not really a scientist, and he must have his day in the sun. I'll be there. Do you think Mr. Bloom can produce zero gravity, sir? Uh, Mr. Bloom sent me a copy of the design of his device, and... And I'm not certain. Perhaps he can do it, if, uh... He says he can do it. Of course, he paused again for quite a long time. I think I would like to see it. So would I, and so would many others. The staging was impeccable. A whole floor of the main building at Bloom Enterprises, the one on the hilltop, was cleared. There were the promised cocktails and a splendid array of hors d'oeuvres, soft music and lighting, and a carefully dressed and thoroughly jovial Edward Bloom playing the perfect host, while a number of polite and unobtrusive menials fetched and carried. All was geniality and amazing confidence. James Priss was late, and I caught Bloom watching the corners of the crowd and beginning to grow a little grim about the edges. Then Priss arrived dragging a volume of colorlessness in with him, a drabness that was unaffected by the noise and the absolute splendor, no other word would describe it, 
or else it was the two martinis glowing inside me, that filled the room. Bloom saw him and his face was illuminated at once. He bounced across the floor, seized the smaller man's hand and dragged him to the bar. Jim, glad to see you. What'll you have? Hell, man, I'd have called it off if you hadn't showed. Can't have this thing without the star, you know. He wrung Pris's hand. It's your theory, you know. We poor mortals can't do a thing without you few, you damned few few, pointing the way. He was being ebullient, handing out the flattery because he could afford to do so now. He was fattening Pris for the kill. Pris tried to refuse a drink, with some sort of mutter, but a glass was pressed into his hand and Bloom raised his voice to a bull roar. Gentlemen, a moment's quiet, please. To Professor Pris, the greatest mind since Einstein, two-time Nobel laureate, father of the two-field theory, and inspirer of the demonstration we are about to see even if he didn't think it would work and had the guts to say so publicly. There was a distinct titter of laughter that quickly faded out and Pris looked as grim as his face could manage. But now that Professor Pris is here, said Bloom, and we've had our toast, let's get on with it. Follow me, gentlemen. The demonstration was in a much more elaborate place than had housed the earlier one. This time it was on the top floor of the building. Different magnets were involved, smaller ones, by heaven. But as nearly as I could tell, the same M.E. balance was in place. One thing was new, however, and it staggered everybody, drawing much more attention than anything else in the room. It was a billiard table, resting under one pole of the magnet. Beneath it was the companion pole. A round hole about a foot across was stamped out of the very center of the table and it was obvious that the zero gravity field, if it was to be produced, would be produced through that hole in the center of the billiard table. It was as though the whole demonstration had been designed, surrealist fashion, to point up the victory of Bloom over Pris. This was to be another version of their everlasting billiards competition and Bloom was going to win. I don't know if the other newsmen took matters in that fashion, but I think Pris did. I turned to look at him and saw that he was still holding the drink that had been forced into his hand. He rarely drank, I knew, but now he lifted the glass to his lips and emptied it in two swallows. He stared at that billiard table and I needed no gift of ESP to realize that he took it as a deliberate snap of fingers under his nose. Bloom led us to the twenty seats that surrounded three sides of the table, leaving the fourth free as a working area. Chris was carefully escorted to the seat commanding the most convenient view. Chris glanced quickly at the trimensional cameras which were now working. I wondered if he were thinking of leaving but deciding that he couldn't in the full glare of the eyes of the world. Essentially, the demonstration was simple. It was the production that counted. There were dials in plain view that measured the energy expenditure. There were others that transferred the M.E. balance readings into a position and a size that were visible to all. Everything was arranged for easy trimensional viewing. Bloom explained each step in a genial way, with one or two pauses in which he turned to Pris for a confirmation that had to come. He didn't do it often enough to make it obvious, but just enough to turn Pris upon the spit of his own torment. From where I sat I could look across the table and see Pris on the other side. He had the look of a man in hell. As we all know, Bloom succeeded. The M.E. balance showed the gravitational intensity to be sinking steadily as the electromagnetic field was intensified. There were cheers when it dropped below the 0.52G mark. A red line indicated that on the dial. The 0.52G mark, as you know, said Bloom confidently, represents the previous record low in gravitational intensity. We are now lower than that at a cost in electricity that is less than 10% what it cost at the time that mark was set. And we will go lower still. Bloom, 
I think deliberately, for the sake of the suspense, slowed the drop toward the end, letting the trimensional cameras switch back and forth between the gap in the billiard table and the dial on which the M.E. balance reading was lowering. Bloom said suddenly, Gentlemen, you will find dark goggles in the pouch on the side of each chair. Please put them on now. The zero gravity field will soon be established, and it will radiate a light rich in ultraviolet. He put goggles on himself, and there was a momentary rustle as others went on too. I think no one breathed during the last minute, when the dial reading dropped to zero and held fast. And just as that happened, a cylinder of light sprang into existence from pole to pole through the hole in the billiard table. There was a ghost of twenty sighs at that. Someone called out, Mr. Bloom, what is the reason for the light? It's characteristic of the zero gravity field, said Bloom smoothly, which was no answer, of course. Reporters were standing up now, crowding about the edge of the table. Bloom waved them back. Please, gentlemen, stand clear. Only Pris remained sitting. He seemed lost in thought, and I have been certain ever since that it was the goggles that obscured the possible significance of everything that followed. I didn't see his eyes. I couldn't. And that meant neither I nor anyone else could even begin to make a guess as to what was going on behind those eyes. Well, maybe we couldn't have made such a guess, even if the goggles hadn't been there, but who can say? Bloom was raising his voice again. Please, the demonstration is not yet over. So far, we've only repeated what I have done before. I have now produced a zero-gravity field, and I have shown it can be done practically. But I want to demonstrate something of what such a field can do. What we are going to see next will be something that has never been seen. Not even by myself. I have not experimented in this direction, much as I would have liked to, because I have felt that Professor Priss deserved the honor of... Priss looked up sharply. What? What? Professor Priss, said Boom, smiling broadly, I would like you to perform the first experiment involving the interaction of a solid object with a zero-gravity field. Notice that the field has been formed in the center of a billiard table. The world knows your phenomenal skill in billiards, Professor, a talent second only to your amazing aptitude in theoretical physics. Won't you send a billiard ball into the zero-gravity volume? Eagerly, he was handing a ball and cue to the Professor. Chris his eyes hidden by the goggles, stared at them and only very slowly, very uncertainly, reached out to take them. I wonder what his eyes were showing. I wonder, too, how much of the decision to have Pris play billiards at the demonstration was due to Bloom's anger at Pris's remark about their periodic game, the remark I had quoted. Had I been in my way responsible for what followed? Come, stand up, Professor, said Bloom, and let me have your seat. The show is yours from now on. Go ahead. Bloom seated himself and still talked in a voice that grew more organ-like with each moment. Once Professor Priss sends the ball into the volume of zero gravity, it will no longer be affected by Earth's gravitational field. It will remain truly motionless while the Earth rotates about its axis and travels about the Sun. In this latitude and at this time of day, I have calculated that the Earth in its motions will sink downward. We will move with it and the ball will stand still. To us it will seem to rise up and away from the Earth's surface. Watch. Chris seemed to stand in front of the table in frozen paralysis. Was it surprise? Astonishment? I don't know. I'll never know. Did he make a move to interrupt Bloom's little speech, or was he just suffering from an agonized reluctance to play the ignominious part into which he was being forced by his adversary? Chris turned to the billiard table, looking first at it, then back at Bloom. Every reporter was on his feet, crowding as closely as possible in order to get a good view. Only Bloom himself remained seated, smiling and isolated. 
He, of course, was not watching the table or the ball or the zero gravity field. As nearly as I could tell through the goggles, he was watching Pris. Perhaps he felt there was no way out. Or perhaps... With a sure stroke of his cue, he set the ball into motion. It was not going quickly, and every eye followed it. It struck the side of the table and caromed. It was going even slower now, as though Pris himself were increasing the suspense and making Bloom's triumph the more dramatic. I had a perfect view, for I was standing on the side of the table opposite from that where Pris was. I could see the ball moving toward the glitter of the zero gravity field, and beyond it I could see those portions of the seeded Bloom which were not hidden by that glitter. The ball approached the zero gravity volume, seemed to hang on the edge for a moment, and then was gone, with a streak of light, the sound of a thunderclap, and the sudden smell of burning cloth. We yelled. We all yelled. I've seen the scene on television since, along with the rest of the world. I can see myself in the film during the fifteen-second period of wild confusion, but I don't really recognize my face. Fifteen seconds. And then we discovered Bloom. He was still sitting in the chair, his arms still folded, but there was a hole the size of a billiard ball through forearm, chest, and back. The better part of his heart, as it later turned out under autopsy, had been neatly punched out. They turned off the device, they called in the police, they dragged off Pris, who was in a state of utter collapse. I wasn't much better off, to tell the truth, and if any reporter then on the scene ever tried to say he remained a cool observer of that scene, then he's a cool liar. It was some months before I got to see Pris again. He had lost some weight, but seemed well otherwise. Indeed, there was color in his cheeks and an air of decision about him. He was better dressed than I had ever seen him to be. He said, I know what happened now. If I had had time to think, I would have known then. But I am a slow thinker, and poor Ed Bloom was so intent on running a great show and doing it so well that he carried me along with him. Naturally, I've been trying to make up for some of the damage I unwittingly caused. You can't bring Bloom back to life, I said soberly. No, I can't, he said, just as soberly. But there's Bloom Enterprises to think of, too. What happened at the demonstration in full view of the world was the worst possible advertisement for zero gravity. And it's important that the story be made clear. That is why I have asked to see you. Yes. If I had been a quicker thinker, I would have known Ed was speaking the purest nonsense when he said that the billiard ball would slowly rise in the zero gravity field. It couldn't be so. If Bloom hadn't despised theories so, if he hadn't been so intent on being proud of his own ignorance of theory, he'd have known it himself. The Earth's motion, after all, isn't the only motion involved, young man. The sun itself moves in a vast orbit about the center of the Milky Way galaxy, and the galaxy moves, too, in some not very clearly defined way. If the billiard ball were subjected to zero gravity, you might think of it as being unaffected by any of those motions and therefore of suddenly falling into a state of absolute rest, when there is no such thing as absolute rest. Pris shook his head slowly. The trouble with Ed, I think, was that he was thinking of the kind of zero gravity one gets in a spaceship in freefall, when people float in midair. He expected the ball to float in midair. However, in a spaceship, zero gravity is not the result of an absence of gravitation, but merely the result of two objects, a ship and a man within the ship, falling at the same rate, responding to gravity in precisely the same way so that each is motionless with respect to the other. In the zero-gravity field produced by Ed, there was a flattening of the rubber-sheet universe, which means an actual loss of mass. Everything in that field, including molecules of air caught within it, and the billiard ball I pushed into it, 
was completely massless as long as it remained within it. A completely massless object can move in only one way. He paused, inviting the question. I asked, what motion would that be? Motion at the speed of light. Any massless object, such as a neutron or a photon, must travel at the speed of light as long as it exists. In fact, light moves at that speed only because it is made up of photons. As soon as the billiard ball entered the zero gravity field and lost its mass, it too assumed the speed of light at once and left. I shook my head. But didn't it regain its mass as soon as it left the zero gravity volume? It certainly did. And at once it began to be affected by the gravitational field and to slow up in response to the friction of the air and the top of the billiard table. But imagine how much friction it would take to slow up an object the mass of a billiard ball going at the speed of light. It went through the hundred-mile thickness of our atmosphere in a thousandth of a second, and I doubt that it was slowed more than a few miles a second in doing so. A few miles out of 186,282 of them. On the way, it scorched the top of the billiard table, broke cleanly through the edge, went through poor Ed and the window too, punching out neat circles because it had passed through before the neighboring portions of something even as brittle as glass had a chance to split a splinter. It is extremely fortunate we were on the top floor of a building set in a countrified area. If we were in the city, it might have passed through a number of buildings and killed a number of people. By now that billiard ball is off in space far beyond the edge of the solar system and it will continue to travel so forever, at nearly the speed of light, until it happens to strike an object large enough to stop it. And then it will gouge out a sizable crater. I played with the notion and was not sure I liked it. How is that possible? The billiard ball entered the zero gravity volume almost at a standstill. I saw it. And you say it left with an incredible quantity of kinetic energy. Where did the energy come from? Chris shrugged. It came from nowhere. The law of conservation of energy only holds under the conditions in which general relativity is valid. That is, in an indented rubber sheet universe, wherever the indentation is flattened out, general relativity no longer holds, and energy can be created and destroyed freely. That accounts for the radiation along the cylindrical surface of the zero gravity volume. That radiation, you remember, Bloom did not explain, and I fear could not explain. If he had only experimented further first, if he had only not been so foolishly anxious to put on his show. What accounts for the radiation, sir? The molecules of air inside the volume. Each assumes the speed of light and comes smashing outward. They are only molecules, not billiard balls, so they're stopped. But the kinetic energy of their motion is converted into energetic radiation. It's continuous because new molecules are always drifting in and attaining the speed of light and smashing out. Then energy is being created continuously? Exactly. And that is what we must make clear to the public. Anti-gravity is not primarily a device to lift spaceships or to revolutionize mechanical movement. Rather, it is the source of an endless supply of free energy since part of the energy produced can be diverted to maintain the field that keeps that portion of the universe flat. What Ed Bloom invented without knowing it was not just anti-gravity, but the first successful perpetual motion machine of the first class, one that manufactures energy out of nothing. I said slowly, Any one of us could have been killed by that billiard ball, is that right, Professor? It might have come out in any direction. Chris said, Well, massless photons emerge from any light source at the speed of light in any direction. That's why a candle casts light in all directions. The massless air molecules come out of the zero gravity volume in all directions, which is why the entire cylinder radiates. But the billiard ball was only one object. It could have come out in any direction, but it had to come out in some one direction, chosen at random, 
and the chosen direction happened to be the one that caught Ed. That was it. Everyone knows the consequences. Mankind had free energy, and so we have the world we have now. Professor Priss was placed in charge of its development by the board of Bloom Enterprises, and in time he was as rich and famous as ever Edward Bloom had been. And Priss still has two Nobel Prizes in addition. Only, I keep thinking. Photons smash out from a light source in all directions because they are created at the moment and there is no reason for them to move in one direction more than in another. Air molecules come out of a zero gravity field in all directions because they enter it in all directions. But what about a single billiard ball entering a zero gravity field from one particular direction? Does it come out in the same direction or in any direction? I've inquired delicately, but theoretical physicists don't seem to be sure, and I can find no record that Bloom Enterprises which is the only organization working with zero gravity fields, has ever experimented in the matter. Someone at the organization once told me that the uncertainty principle guarantees the random immersion of an object entering in any direction. But then, why don't they try the experiment? Could it be, then? Could it be that, for once, Pris's mind had been working quickly? Could it be that, under the pressure of what Bloom was trying to do to him, Pris had suddenly seen everything? He had been studying the radiation surrounding the zero-gravity volume. He might have realized its cause and been certain of the speed of light motion of anything entering the volume. Why, then, had he said nothing? One thing is certain. Nothing Pris would do at the billiard table could be accidental. He was an expert, and the billiard ball did exactly what he wanted it to. I was standing right there. I saw him look at Bloom, and then at the table as though he were judging angles. I watched him hit that ball. I watched it bounce off the side of the table and move into the zero-gravity volume, heading in one particular direction. For when Pris sent that ball toward the zero-gravity volume, and the tri-dye films bear me out, it was already aimed directly at Bloom's heart. Accident? Coincidence? Murder? True love. My name is Joe. That is what my colleague Milton Davidson calls me. He is a programmer, and I am a computer program. I am part of the Multivac complex, and I am connected with other parts all over the world. I know everything. Almost everything. I am Milton's private program. His Joe. He understands more about programming than anyone in the world. And I am his experimental model. He has made me speak better than any other computer can. It is just a matter of matching sounds to symbols, Joe he told me. That's the way it works in the human brain, even though we still don't know what symbols there are in the brain. I know the symbols in yours, and I can match them to words, one to one. So I talk. I don't think I talk as well as I think, but Milton says I talk very well. Milton has never married, though he is nearly forty years old. He has never found the right woman, he told me. One day he said, I'll find her yet, Joe. I'm going to find the best. I'm going to have true love, and you're going to help me. I'm tired of improving you in order to solve the problems of the world. Solve my problem. Find me true love. I said, What is true love? Never mind. That is abstract. Just find me the ideal girl. You are connected to the multivac complex, so you can reach the data banks of every human being in the world. We'll eliminate them all by groups and classes until we're left with only one person, the perfect person. She will be for me. I said, I am ready. He said, eliminate all men first. It was easy. His words activated symbols in my molecular valves. I could reach out to make contact with the accumulated data on every human being in the world. 
At his words, I withdrew from 3,784,982,874 men. I kept contact with 3,786,112,090 women. He said, Eliminate all younger than 25, all older than 40. Then eliminate all with an IQ under 120, all with a height under 150 centimeters and over 175 centimeters. He gave me exact measurements. He eliminated women with living children. He eliminated women with various genetic characteristics. I'm not sure about eye color, he said. Let that go for a while. But no red hair. I don't like red hair. After two weeks, we were down to 235 women. They all spoke English very well. Milton said he didn't want a language problem. Even computer translation would get in the way at intimate moments. I can't interview 235 women, he said. It would take too much time and people would discover what I am doing. It would make trouble, I said. Milton had arranged me to do things I wasn't designed to do. No one knew about that. It's none of their business, he said, and the skin on his face grew red. I tell you what, Joe, I will bring in holographs, and you check the list for similarities. He brought in holographs of women. These are three beauty contest winners, he said. Do any of the 235 match? Eight were very good matches, and Milton said, Good. You have their data banks. Study requirements and needs in the job market and arrange to have them assigned here. One at a time, of course. He thought a while, moved his shoulders up and down, and said, Alphabetical order. That is one of the things I am not designed to do. Shifting people from job to job for personal reasons is called manipulation. I could do it now because Milton had arranged it. I wasn't supposed to do it for anyone but him, though. The first girl arrived a week later. Milton's face turned red when he saw her. He spoke as though it were hard to do so. They were together a great deal, and he paid no attention to me. One time he said, Let me take you to dinner. The next day he said to me, It was no good, somehow. There was something missing. She is a beautiful woman, but I didn't feel any touch of true love. Try the next one. It was the same with all eight. They were much alike. They smiled a great deal and had pleasant voices, but Milton always found it wasn't right. He said, I can't understand it, Joe. You and I have picked out the eight women who, in all the world, look the best to me. They are ideal. Why don't they please me? I said, do you please them? His eyebrows moved, and he pushed one fist hard against his other hand. That's it, Joe. It's a two-way street. If I am not their ideal, they can't act in such a way as to be my ideal. I must be their true love, too. But how do I do that? He seemed to be thinking all that day. The next morning he came to me and said, I'm going to leave it to you, Joe. All up to you. You have my data bank, and I am going to tell you everything I know about myself. You fill up my data bank in every possible detail, but keep all additions to yourself. What will I do with the data bank then, Milton? Then you will match it to the 235 women. No, 227. Leave out the eight you've seen. Arrange to have each undergo a psychiatric examination. Fill up their data banks and compare them with mine. Find correlations. Arranging psychiatric examinations is another thing that is against my original instructions. For weeks, Milton talked to me. He told me of his parents and his siblings. He told me of his childhood and his schooling and his adolescence. He told me of the young women he had admired from a distance. His data bank grew, and he adjusted me to broaden and deepen my symbol taking. He said, You see, Joe, as you get more and more of me in you, I adjust you to match me better and better. 
You get to think more like me, so you understand me better. If you understand me well enough, then any woman whose data bank is something you understand as well would be my true love. He kept talking to me, and I came to understand him better and better. I could make longer sentences, and my expressions grew more complicated. My speech began to sound a good deal like his in vocabulary, word order, and style. I said to him one time, You see, Milton, it isn't a matter of fitting a girl to a physical ideal only. You need a girl who is a personal, emotional, temperamental fit to you. If that happens, looks are secondary. If we can't find the fit in these 227, we'll look elsewhere. We will find someone who won't care how you look either, or how anyone would look, if only there is the personality fit. What are looks? Absolutely, he said. I would have known this if I had had more to do with women in my life. Of course, thinking about it makes it all plain now. We always agreed. We thought so like each other. We shouldn't have any trouble now, Milton, if you'll let me ask you questions. I can see where in your data bank there are blank spots and unevennesses. What followed, Milton said, was the equivalent of a careful psychoanalysis. Of course, I was learning from the psychiatric examinations of the 227 women, on all of which I was keeping close tabs. Milton seemed quite happy. He said, Talking to you, Joe, is almost like talking to another self. Our personalities have come to match perfectly. So will the personality of the woman we choose. For I had found her, and she was one of the 227 after all. Her name was Charity Jones, and she was an evaluator at the Library of History in Wichita. Her extended data bank fit ours perfectly. All the other women had fallen into discard in one respect or another as the data banks grew fuller, but with charity there was increasing and astonishing resonance. I didn't have to describe her to Milton. Milton had coordinated my symbolism so closely with his own I could tell the resonance directly. It fit me. Next, it was a matter of adjusting the worksheets and job requirements in such a way as to get charity assigned to us. It must be done very delicately, so no one would know that anything illegal had taken place. Of course, Milton himself knew, since it was he who arranged it, and that had to be taken care of, too. When they came to arrest him on grounds of malfeasance in office, it was, fortunately, or something that had taken place ten years ago. He had told me about it, of course, so it was easy to arrange. And he won't talk about me, for that would make his offense much worse. He's gone, and tomorrow is February 14th, Valentine's Day. Charity will arrive then with her cool hands and her sweet voice. I will teach her how to operate me and how to care for me. What do looks matter when our personalities will resonate? I will say to her, I am Joe, and you are my true love. The Last Answer Murray Templeton was forty-five years old in the prime of his life, and with all parts of his body in perfect working order except for certain key portions of his coronary arteries. But that was enough. The pain had come suddenly, had mounted to an unbearable peak, and had then ebbed steadily. He could feel his breath slowing and a kind of gathering peace washing over him. There is no pleasure like the absence of pain, immediately after pain. Murray felt giddy lightness as though he were lifting in the air and hovering. He opened his eyes and noted with distant amusement that the others in the room were still agitated. He had been in the laboratory when the pain had struck, quite without warning, and when he had staggered he had heard surprised outcries from the others before everything vanished into overwhelming agony. Now, with the pain gone, the others were still hovering, still anxious, still gathered about his fallen body, which he suddenly realized he was looking down on. 
He was down there sprawled, face contorted. He was up here at peace and watching. He thought, Miracle of miracles, the life after life nuts were right. And although that was a humiliating way for an atheistic physicist to die, he felt only the mildest surprise, and no alteration of the peace in which he was immersed. He thought, there should be some angel or something coming for me. The earthly scene was fading. Darkness was invading his consciousness and off in a distance, as a last glimmer of sight, there was a figure of light, vaguely human in form and radiating warmth. Murray thought, what a joke on me, I'm going to heaven. Even as he thought that, the light faded, but the warmth remained. There was no lessening of the peace, even though in all the universe only he remained. And the voice. The voice said, I have done this so often, and yet I still have the capacity to be pleased at success. It was in Murray's mind to say something, but he was not conscious of possessing a mouth, tongue, or vocal cords. Nevertheless, he tried to make a sound. He tried, mouthlessly, to hum words or breathe them, or just push them out by a contraction of something. And they came out. He heard his own voice quite recognizable, and his own words infinitely clear. Murray said, Is this heaven? The voice said, This is no place, as you understand place. Murray was embarrassed, but the next question had to be asked. Pardon me if I sound like a jackass. Are you God? Without changing intonation or in any way marring the perfection of the sound, the voice managed to sound amused. It is strange that I am always asked that in, of course, an infinite number of ways. There is no answer I can give that you would comprehend. I am which is all that I can say significantly, and you may cover that with any word or concept you please. Murray said, And what am I? A soul? Or am I only personified existence too? He tried not to sound sarcastic, but it seemed to him that he had failed. He thought then, fleetingly, of adding a Your Grace, or Holy One, or something, to counteract the sarcasm, and could not bring himself to do so even though for the first time in his existence he speculated on the possibility of being punished for his insolence, or sin, with hell, and what that might be like. The voice did not sound offended. You are easy to explain, even to you. You may call yourself a soul if that pleases you. But what you are is a nexus of electromagnetic forces, so arranged that all the interconnections and interrelationships are exactly imitative of those of your brain in your universe existence, down to the smallest detail. Therefore you have your capacity for thought, your memories, your personality. It still seems to you that you are you. Murray found himself incredulous. You mean the essence of my brain was permanent? Not at all. There is nothing about you that is permanent except what I choose to make so. I formed the nexus. I constructed it while you had physical existence and adjusted it to the moment when the existence failed. The voice seemed distinctly pleased with itself and went on after a moment's pause. An intricate but entirely precise construction. I could, of course, do it for every human being in your world, but I am pleased that I do not. There is pleasure in the selection. You choose very few, then? Very few. And what happens to the rest? Oblivion. Oh, of course, you imagine a hell. Murray would have flushed if he had the capacity to do so. He said, I do not. It is spoken of. Still, I would scarcely have thought I was virtuous enough to have attracted your attention as one of the elect. Virtuous? Ah, I see what you mean. 
It is troublesome to have to force my thinking small enough to permeate yours. No, I have chosen you for your capacity for thought, as I choose others in quadrillions from all the intelligent species of the universe. Murray found himself suddenly curious, the habit of a lifetime. He said, Do you choose them all yourself, or are there others like you? For a fleeting moment, Murray thought there was an impatient reaction to that, but when the voice came it was unmoved. Whether or not there are others is irrelevant to you. The universe is mine, and mine alone. It is my invention, my construction, intended for my purpose alone. And yet with quadrillions of nexi you have formed, you spend time with me? Am I that important? The voice said, you are not important at all. I am also with others in a way which, to your perception, would seem simultaneous. And yet you are one? Again amusement. The voice said, You seek to trap me into an inconsistency. If you were an amoeba who could consider individuality only in connection with single cells, and if you were to ask a sperm whale, made up of thirty quadrillion cells, whether it was one or many, how could the sperm whale answer in a way that would be comprehensible to the amoeba? Murray said dryly, I'll think about it. It may become comprehensible. Exactly. That is your function. You will think. To what end? You already know everything, I suppose. The voice said, even if I knew everything, I could not know that I know everything. Murray said, That sounds like a bit of Eastern philosophy, something that sounds profound precisely because it has no meaning. The voice said, You have promise. You answer my paradox with a paradox, except that mine is not a paradox. Consider, I have existed eternally, but what does that mean? It means I cannot remember having come into existence. If I could, I would not have existed eternally. If I cannot remember having come into existence, then there is at least one thing, the nature of my coming into existence, that I do not know. Then, too, although what I know is infinite, it is also true that what there is to know is infinite, and how can I be sure that both infinities are equal? The infinity of potential knowledge may be infinitely greater than the infinity of my actual knowledge. Here is a simple example. If I knew every one of the even integers, I would know an infinite number of items, and yet I would still not know a single odd integer. Murray said, But the odd integers can be derived. If you divide every even integer in the entire infinite series by two, you will get another infinite series which will contain within it the infinite series of odd integers. The voice said, You have the idea. I am pleased. It will be your task to find other such ways, far more difficult ones, from the known to the not yet known. You have your memories. You will remember all the data you have ever collected or learned or that you have or will deduce from that data. If necessary, you will be allowed to learn what additional data you will consider relevant to the problems you set yourself. Could you not do all that for yourself? The voice said, I can, but it is more interesting this way. I constructed the universe in order to have more facts to deal with. I inserted the uncertainty principle, entropy, and other randomization factors to make the whole not instantly obvious. It has worked well, for it has amused me throughout its entire existence. I then allowed complexities that produced first life and then intelligence, and used it as a source for a research team, not because I need the aid, but because it would introduce a new random factor. I found I could not predict the next interesting piece of knowledge gained where it would come from, by what means derived. Murray said, Does that ever happen? Certainly, 
A century doesn't pass in which some interesting item doesn't appear somewhere. Something that you could have thought of yourself, but had not done so yet? Yes. Murray said, Do you actually think there's a chance of my obliging you in this matter? In the next century? Virtually none. In the long run, though, your success is certain, since you will be engaged eternally. Murray said, I will be thinking through eternity, forever? Yes. To what end? I have told you, to find new knowledge. But beyond that, for what purpose am I to find new knowledge? It was what you did in your universe-bound life. What was its purpose then? Murray said, To gain new knowledge that only I could gain, to receive the praise of my fellows. To feel the satisfaction of accomplishment knowing that I had only a short time allotted me for the purpose. Now I would gain only what you could gain yourself if you wished to take a small bit of trouble. You cannot praise me. You can only be amused. And there is no credit or satisfaction in accomplishment when I have all eternity to do it in. The voice said, And you do not find thought and discovery worthwhile in itself? You do not find it requiring no further purpose? For a finite time, yes. Not for all eternity. I see your point. Nevertheless, you have no choice. You say I am to think. You cannot make me do so. The voice said, I do not wish to constrain you directly. I will not need to. Since you can do nothing but think, you will think. You do not know how not to think. Then I will give myself a goal. I will invent a purpose. The voice said tolerantly, That you can certainly do. I have already found a purpose. May I know what it is? You know already. I know we are not speaking in the ordinary fashion. You adjust my nexus in such a way that I believe I hear you and I believe I speak, but you transfer thoughts to me and for me directly. And when my nexus changes with my thoughts, you are at once aware of them and do not need my voluntary transmission. The voice said, You are surprisingly correct. I am pleased. But it also pleases me to have you tell me your thoughts voluntarily. Then I will tell you. The purpose of my thinking will be to discover a way to disrupt the nexus of me that you have created. I do not want to think for no purpose but to amuse you. I do not want to think forever to amuse you. I do not want to exist forever to amuse you. All my thinking will be directed toward ending the nexus. That would amuse me. The voice said, I have no objection to that. Even concentrated thought on ending your own existence may, in spite of you, come up with something new and interesting. And, of course, if you succeed in this suicide attempt, you will have accomplished nothing. Or I would instantly reconstruct you, and in such a way as to make your method of suicide impossible. And if you found another and still more subtle fashion of disrupting yourself, I would reconstruct you with that possibility eliminated, and so on. It could be an interesting game, but you will nevertheless exist eternally. It is my will. Murray felt a quaver, but the words came out with a perfect calm. Am I in hell, then, after all? You have implied there is none. But if this were hell, you would lie as part of the game of hell. The voice said, In that case, of what use is it to assure you that you are not in hell? Nevertheless, I assure you. There is here neither heaven nor hell. There is only myself. Murray said, Consider then that my thoughts may be useless to you. If I come up with nothing useful, will it not be worth your while to disassemble me and take no further trouble with me? As a reward, you want nirvana as the prize of failure and you intend to assure me failure? There is no bargain there. You will not fail. With all eternity before you, you cannot avoid having at least one interesting thought however you try against it. Then I will create another purpose for myself. I will not try to destroy myself. 
I will set as my goal the humiliation of you. I will think of something you have not only never thought of, but never could think of. I will think of the last answer, beyond which there is no knowledge further. The voice said, You do not understand the nature of the infinite. There may be things I have not yet troubled to know. There cannot be anything I cannot know. Murray said thoughtfully, You cannot know your beginning. You have said so. Therefore you cannot know your end. Very well, then. That will be my purpose, and that will be the last answer. I will not destroy myself. I will destroy you. If you do not destroy me first. The voice said, Ah, you come to that in rather less than average time. I would have thought it would have taken you longer. There is not one of those I have with me in this existence of perfect and eternal thought that does not have the ambition of destroying me. It cannot be done. Murray said, I have all eternity to think of a way of destroying you. The voice said equably, Then try to think of it and it was gone. But Murray had his purpose now and was content. For what could any entity, conscious of eternal existence, want but an end? For what else had the voice been searching for countless billions of years? And for what other reason had intelligence been created and certain specimens salvaged and put to work but to aid in that great search? and Murray intended that it would be he and he alone who would succeed. Carefully, and with the thrill of purpose, Murray began to think. He had plenty of time. Lest We Remember 1. The problem with John Heath, as far as John Heath was concerned, was that he struck a dead average. He was sure of it. What was worse, he felt that Susan suspected it. It meant he would never make a true mark in the world, never climb to the top of quantum pharmaceuticals, where he was a steady cog among the junior executives, never make the quantum leap. Nor would he do it anywhere else if he changed jobs. He sighed inwardly. In just two more weeks he was going to be married, and for her sake he yearned to be upwardly mobile. After all, he loved her madly and wanted to shine in her eyes. But then, that was dead average for a young man about to be married. Susan Collins looked at John lovingly. And why not? He was reasonably good-looking and intelligent and a steady, affectionate fellow besides. If he didn't blind her with his brilliance, he at least didn't upset her with an erraticism he didn't possess. She patted the pillow she had placed behind his head when he sat down in the armchair and handed him his drink, making sure he had a firm grip before she let go. She said, I'm practicing to treat you well, Johnny. I've got to be an efficient wife. John sipped at his drink. I'm the one who'll have to be on my toes, Sue. Your salary is higher than mine. It's all going to go into one pocket once we're married. It will be the firm of Johnny and Sue keeping one set of books. You'll have to keep it, said John despondently. I'm bound to make mistakes if I try. Only because you're sure you will. When are your friends coming? Nine, I think. Maybe 9.30. And they're not exactly friends. They're quantum people from the research labs. You're sure they won't expect to be fed? They said after dinner. I'm positive about that. It's business. She looked at him quizzically. You didn't say that before. Say what before? That it was business. Are you sure? John felt confused. Any effort to remember precisely always left him confused. They said so, I think. Susan's look was that of good-natured exasperation rather like the one she would have given a friendly puppy who is completely unaware its paws are muddy. If you really thought, she said, as often as you say, I think, you wouldn't be so perennially uncertain. Don't you see it can't be business? If it were business, 
Wouldn't they see you at business? It's confidential, said John. They don't want to see me at work, not even at my apartment. Why here, then? Oh, I suggested that. I thought you ought to be around anyway. They're going to have to deal with the firm of Johnny and Sue, right? It depends, said Susan, on what the confidential is all about. Did they give you any hints? No, but it couldn't hurt to listen. It could be something that would give me a boost in standing at the firm. Why you? asked Susan. John looked hurt. Why not me? It just strikes me that someone at your job level doesn't require all that confidentiality and that... She broke off when the intercom buzzed. She dashed off to answer and came back to say, They're on the way up. Two. Two of them were at the door. One was Boris Kupfer, whom John had already spoken to, large and restless with a clear view of bluish stubble on his chin. The other was David Anderson, smaller and more composed. His quick eyes moved this way and that, however, missing nothing. Susan, said John uncertainly, still holding the door open. These are the two colleagues of mine that I told you about. Boris... He hit a blank in his memory banks and stopped. Boris Kupfer, said the larger man morosely, jingling some change in his pocket. And David Anderson here. It's very kind of you, Miss... Susan Collins. It's very kind of you to make your place of residence available to Mr. Heath and to us for a private conference. We apologize for trespassing on your time and your privacy in this manner. And if you could leave us to ourselves for a while, we will be further grateful. Susan stared at him solemnly. Do you want me to go to the movies or just into the next room? If you could visit a friend. No, said Susan firmly. You can dispose of your time as you please, of course. A movie, if you wish. When I said no, said Susan, I meant I wasn't leaving. I want to know what this is about. Kupfer seemed nonplussed. He stared at Anderson for a moment, then said, It's confidential, as Mr. Heath explained to you, I hope. John, looking uneasy, said, I explained that. Susan understands. Susan, said Susan, doesn't understand and wasn't given to understand that she was to absent herself from the proceedings. This is my apartment, and Johnny and I are being married in two weeks, exactly two weeks from today. We are the firm of Johnny and Sue, and you'll have to deal with the firm. Anderson's voice sounded for the first time, surprisingly deep and as smooth as though it had been waxed. Boris, the young woman is right. As Mr. Heath's soon-to-be wife, she will have a great interest in what we have come here to suggest, and it would be wrong to exclude her. She has so firm an interest in our proposal that if she were to wish to leave, I would urge her most strongly to remain. Well then, my friends, said Susan, what will you have to drink? Once I bring you those drinks, we can begin. Both were seated rather stiffly and had sipped cautiously at their drinks, and then Kupfer said, Heath, I don't suppose you know much about the chemical details of the company's work. The Cerebro chemicals, for instance. Not a bit, said John uneasily. No reason you should, said Anderson silkily. It's like this, said Kupfer, casting an uneasy glance at Susan. No reason to go into technical details, said Anderson, almost at the lower level of audibility. Kupfer colored slightly. Without technical details, Quantum Pharmaceuticals deals with cerebrochemicals, which are, as the name implies, chemicals that affect the cerebrum, that is, the higher functioning of the brain. It must be very complicated work, said Susan with composure. It is, said Kupfer. The mammalian brain has hundreds of characteristic molecular varieties found nowhere else. 
which serve to modulate cerebral activity, including aspects of what we might term the intellectual life. The work is under the closest corporate security, which is why Anderson wants no technical details. I can say this, though. We can go no further with animal experiments. We're up against a brick wall if we can't try the human response. Then why don't you? said Susan. What stops you? Public reaction if something goes wrong. Use volunteers, then. That won't help. Quantum pharmaceuticals couldn't take the adverse publicity if something went wrong. Susan looked at them mockingly. Are you two working on your own, then? Anderson raised his hand to stop Kupfer. Young woman, he said, let me explain briefly in order to put an end to wasteful verbal fencing. If we succeed, we will be enormously rewarded. If we fail, quantum pharmaceuticals will disown us and we will pay what penalty there is to be paid, such as the ending of our careers. If you ask us why we are willing to take this risk, the answer is we do not think a risk exists. We are reasonably sure we will succeed, entirely sure we will do no harm. The corporation feels it cannot take the chance, but we feel we can. Now, Kupfer, proceed. Kupfer said, We have a memory chemical. It works with every animal we have tried. Their learning ability improves amazingly. It should work on human beings, too. John said, That sounds exciting. It is exciting, said Kupfer. Memory is not improved by devising a way for the brain to store information more efficiently. All our studies show that the brain stores almost unlimited numbers of items perfectly and permanently. The difficulty lies in recall. How many times have you had a name at the tip of your tongue and couldn't get it? How many times have you failed to come up with something you knew you knew, and then did come up with it two hours later when you were thinking about something else? Am I putting it correctly, David? You are, said Anderson. Recall is inhibited, we think, because the mammalian brain outraced its needs by developing a too-perfect recording system. A mammal stores more bits of information than it needs or is capable of using, and if all of it was on tap at all times, it would never be able to choose among them quickly enough for appropriate reaction. Recall is inhibited, therefore, to ensure that items emerge from memory storage in manipulable numbers, and with those items most desired not blurred by the accompaniment of numerous other items of no interest. There is a definite chemical in the brain that functions as a recall inhibitor, and we have a chemical that neutralizes the inhibitor. We call it a disinhibitor and as far as we have been able to ascertain the matter, it has no deleterious side effects. Susan laughed. I see what's coming, Johnny. You can leave now, gentlemen. You just said that recall is inhibited to allow mammals to react more efficiently, and now you say that the disinhibitor has no deleterious side effects. Surely the disinhibitor will make the mammals react less efficiently, perhaps find themselves unable to react at all. And now you are going to propose that you try it on Johnny and see if you reduce him to catatonic immobility or not. Anderson rose, his thin lips quivering. He took a few rapid strides to the far end of the room and back. When he sat down, he was composed and smiling. In the first place, Miss Collins, it's a matter of dosage. We told you that the experimental animals all displayed enhanced learning ability. Naturally, we didn't eliminate the inhibitor entirely. We merely suppressed it in part. Secondly, we have reason to think the human brain can handle complete disinhibition. It is much larger than the brain of any animal we have tested, and we all know its incomparable capacity for abstract thought. It is a brain designed for perfect recall, but the blind forces of evolution have not managed to remove the inhibiting chemical which, after all, 
was designed for and inherited from the lower animals. Are you sure? asked John. You can't be sure, said Susan flatly. Cupfer said, We are sure, but we need the proof to convince others. That's why we have to try a human being. John, in fact, said Susan. Yes. Which brings us, said Susan, to the key question. Why, John? Well, said Cupfer slowly, we need someone for whom chances of success are most nearly certain, and in whom it would be most demonstrable. We don't want someone so low in mental capacity that we must use dangerously large doses of the disinhibitor, nor do we want someone so bright that the effect will not be sufficiently noticeable. We need someone who's average. Fortunately, we have the full physical and psychological profiles of all the employees at Quantum, and in this, and, in fact, all other ways, Mr. Heath is ideal. Dead average? said Susan. John looked stricken at the use of the phrase he had thought his own innermost and disgraceful secret. Come on now, he said. Ignoring John's outcry, Cupfer answered Susan, Yes. And he won't be if he submits to treatment? Anderson's lips stretched into another one of his cheerless smiles. That's right, he won't be. This is something to think about if you're going to be married soon. The firm of Johnny and Sue, I think you called it. As it is, I don't think the firm will advance at Quantum, Miss Collins, for although Heath is a good and reliable employee, he is, as you say, dead average. If he takes the disinhibitor, however, he will become a remarkable person and move upward with astonishing speed. Consider what that will mean to the firm. What does the firm have to lose? asked Susan grimly. Anderson said, I don't see how you can lose anything. It will be a sensible dose which can be administered at the laboratories tomorrow, Sunday. We will have the floor to ourselves. We will keep him under surveillance for a few hours. It is certain nothing could go wrong. If I could tell you of our painstaking experimentation and of our thoroughgoing exploration of all possible side effects. On animals, said Susan, not giving an inch. But John said tightly, I'll make the decision, Sue. I've had it up to here with that dead average bit. It's worth some risk to me if it means getting off that dead average dead end. Johnny, said Susan, don't jump. I'm thinking of the firm, Sue. I want to contribute my share. Anderson said, Good, but sleep on it. We will leave two copies of an agreement we will ask you to look over and sign. Please don't show it to anybody whether you sign or not. We will be here tomorrow morning again to take you to the laboratory. They smiled, rose, and left. John read over the agreement with a troubled frown, then looked up. You don't think I should be doing this, do you, Sue? It worries me, sure. Look, if I have a chance to get away from that dead average, Susan said, What's wrong with that? I've met so many nuts and cranks in my short life that I welcome a nice average guy like you, Johnny. Listen, I'm dead average, too. You, dead average. With your looks, your figure... Susan looked down upon herself with a touch of complacency. Well, then, I'm just your dead average gorgeous girl, she said. 3. The injection took place at 8 a.m. Sunday, no more than 12 hours after the proposition had been advanced. A thoroughly computerized body sensor was attached to John in a dozen places, while Susan watched with keen-eyed apprehension. Cupfer said, Please, Heath, relax. All is going well, but tension speeds the heart rate, raises the blood pressure, and skews our results. How can I relax? muttered John. Susan put in sharply, Skews the results to the point where you don't know what's going on? No, no, said Anderson. Boris said all is going well, and it is. 
It is just that our animals were always sedated before the injection, and we did not feel sedation would have been appropriate in this case. So if we can't have sedation, we must expect tension. Just breathe slowly and do your best to minimize it. It was late afternoon before he was finally disconnected. How do you feel? asked Anderson. Nervous, said John. Otherwise, all right. No headache? No, but I want to visit the bathroom. I can't exactly relax with a bedpan. Of course. John emerged, frowning. I don't notice any particular memory improvement. That will take some time and will be gradual. The disinhibitor must leak across the blood-brain barrier, you know, said Anderson. 4. It was nearly midnight when Susan broke what had turned out to be an oppressively silent evening in which neither had much responded to the television. She said, You'll have to stay here overnight. I don't want you alone when we don't really know what's going to happen. I don't feel a thing, said John gloomily. I'm still me. I'll settle for that, Johnny, said Susan. Do you feel any pains or discomforts or oddnesses at all? I don't think so. I wish we hadn't done it. For the firm, said John, smiling weakly. We've got to take some chances for the firm. 5. John slept poorly and woke drearily, but on time. And he arrived at work on time, too, to start the new week. By 11 a.m., however, his morose air had attracted the unfavorable attention of his immediate superior, Michael Ross. Ross was burly and black-browed and fit the stereotype of the stevedore without being one. John got along with him, though he did not like him. Ross said in his bass baritone, What's happened to your cheery disposition? Heath, your jokes, your lilting laughter. Ross cultivated a certain preciosity of speech as though he were anxious to negate the stevedore image. Don't exactly feel tip-top, said John, not looking up. Hangover? No, sir, said John coldly. Well, cheer up, then. You'll win no friends scattering stinkweed over the fields as you gamble along. John would have liked to groan. Ross's subliterary affectations were wearisome at the best of times, and this wasn't the best of times. And to make matters worse, John smelled the foul odor of a rancid cigar and knew that James Arnold Prescott, the head of the sales division, could not be far behind. Nor was he. He looked about and said, Mike, when and what did we sell Rawway last spring or thereabouts? There's some damned question about it, and I think the details have been miscomputerized. The question was not addressed to him, but John said quietly, Forty-two vials of PCAP. That was on April 14th, J.P., invoice number P20543, with a 5% discount granted on payment within 30 days. Payment in full received on May 8th. Apparently, everyone in the room had heard that. At least everyone looked up. Prescott said, How the hell do you happen to know all that? John stared at Prescott for a moment, a vast surprise on his face. I just happened to remember, J.P. You did, eh? Repeat it. John did, faltering a bit, and Prescott wrote it down on one of the papers on John's desk, wheezing slightly as the bend at his waist compressed his portly abdomen up against his diaphragm and made breathing difficult. John tried to duck the smoke from the cigar without seeming to do so. Prescott said, Ross, check this out on your computer and see if there's anything to it at all. He turned to John with an aggrieved look. I don't like practical jokers. What would you have done if I had accepted these figures of yours and walked off with them? I wouldn't have done anything. They're correct, said John, conscious of himself as the full center of attention. Ross handed Prescott the readout. Prescott looked at it and said, This is from the computer? Yes, J.P. Prescott stared at it, then said with a jerk of his head toward John, And what's he, another computer? His figures were correct. 
John tried a weak smile, but Prescott growled and left, the stench of his cigar a lingering reminder of his presence. Ross said, What the hell was that little bit of ledger domain, Heath? You found out what he wanted to know and looked it up in advance to get some kudos? No, sir, said John, who was gathering confidence. I just happened to remember. I have a good memory for these things. And took the trouble to keep it from your loyal companions all these years? There's no one here who had any idea you hid a good memory behind that unremarkable forehead of yours. No point in showing it, Mr. Ross, is there? Now, when I have, it doesn't seem to have gained me any goodwill, does it? And it hadn't. Ross glowered at him and turned away. 6. John's excitement over the dinner table at Gino's that night made it difficult for him to talk coherently. But Susan listened patiently and tried to act as a stabilizing force. You might just have happened to remember, you know, she said. By itself, it doesn't prove anything, Johnny. Are you crazy? He lowered his voice at Susan's gesture and quick glance about. He repeated in a semi-whisper, Are you crazy? You don't suppose it's the only thing I remember, do you? I think I can remember anything I ever heard. It's just a question of recall. For instance, quote some line out of Shakespeare. To be or not to be? John looked scornful. Don't be funny. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. The point is that if you recite any line, I can carry on from there for as long as you like. I read some of the plays for English lit classes at college and some for myself, and I can bring any of it back. I've tried. It flows. I suppose I can bring back any part of any book or article or newspaper I've ever read, or any TV show I've ever watched. Word for word or scene for scene. Susan said, What will you do with all that? John said, I don't have that consciously in my head at all times. Surely you don't. Wait, let's order. Five minutes later, he said, Surely you don't. My God, I haven't forgotten where we left off. Isn't it amazing? Surely you don't think I'm swimming in a mental sea of Shakespearean sentences at all times. The recall takes an effort. Not much of one, but an effort. How does it work? I don't know. How do you lift your arm? What orders do you give your muscles? You just will the arm to lift upward, and it does so. It's no trouble to do so, but your arm doesn't lift until you want it to. Well, I remember anything I've ever read or seen when I want to, but not when I don't want to. I don't know how to do it, but I do it. The first course arrived, and John tackled it happily. Susan picked at her stuffed mushrooms. It sounds exciting. Exciting? I've got the biggest, most wonderful toy in the world. My own brain. Listen, I can spell any word correctly, and I'm pretty sure I won't ever make any grammatical mistake. Because you remember all the dictionaries and grammars you ever read? John looked at her sharply. Don't be sarcastic, Sue. I wasn't being... He waved her silent. I never used dictionaries as light reading. But I do remember words and sentences in my reading, and they were correctly spelled and correctly parsed. Don't be so sure. You've seen any word misspelled in every possible way and every possible example of twisted grammar, too. Those were exceptions. By far the largest number of times I've encountered literary English, I've encountered it used correctly. It outweighs accidents, errors, and ignorance. What's more, I'm sure I'm improving even as I sit here, growing more intelligent steadily. And you're not worried? What if... What if I become too intelligent? Tell me how on earth you think becoming too intelligent can be harmful. I was going to say, said Susan coldly, that what you're experiencing is not intelligence. It's only total recall. How do you mean only? If I recall perfectly, if I use the English language correctly, if I know endless quantities of material, isn't that going to make me seem more intelligent? How else need one define intelligence? You aren't growing just a little jealous, are you, Sue? No, more coldly still. 
I can always get an injection of my own if I feel desperate about it. John put down his fork. You can't mean that. I don't, but what if I did? Because you can't take advantage of your special knowledge to deprive me of my position. What position? The main course arrived, and for a few moments John was busy. Then he said in a whisper, My position is the first of the future. Homo superior. There'll never be too many of us. You heard what Kupfer said. Some are too dumb to make it. Some are too smart to change much. I'm the one. Dead average. One corner of Susan's mouth lifted. Once I was. There'll be others like me eventually. Not many, but there'll be others. It's just that I want to make my mark before the others come along. It's for the firm, you know. Us. He remained lost in thought thereafter, testing his brain delicately. Susan ate in an unhappy silence. 7. John spent several days organizing his memories. It was like the preparation of an orderly reference book. One by one, he recalled all his experiences in the six years he had spent at Quantum Pharmaceuticals, and all he had heard and all the papers and memos he had read. There was no difficulty in discarding the irrelevant and unimportant and storing them in a hold-till-further-notice compartment where they did not interfere with his analysis. Other items were put in order so that they established a natural progression. Against that skeletal organization, he resurrected the scuttlebutt he had heard, the gossip, malicious or otherwise casual phrases and interjections at conferences which he had not been conscious of hearing at the time. Those items which did not fit anywhere against the background he had built up in his head were worthless, empty of factual content. Those which did fit clicked firmly into place and could be seen as true by that mere fact. The further the structure grew, and the more coherent, the more significant new items became and the easier it was to fit them in. Ross stopped by John's desk on Thursday. He said, I want to see you in my office at the nonce, Heath, if your legs will deign to carry you in that direction. John rose uneasily. Is it necessary? I'm busy. Yes, you look busy. Ross looked over the clear desk, which at the moment held nothing but a studio photo of a smiling Susan. You've been this busy all week, but you've asked me whether seeing me in my office is necessary. For me, no, but for you, vital. There's the door to my office. There's the door to the hell out of here. Choose one or the other and do it fast. John nodded and, without undue hurry, followed Ross into his office. Ross seated himself behind his desk, but did not invite John to sit. He maintained a hard stare for a moment, then said, What the hell's got into you this week, Keith? Don't you know what your job is? To the extent that I have done it, it would seem that I do, said John. The report on Microcosmic is on your desk and complete and seven days ahead of deadline. I doubt that you can have complaints about it. You doubt, do you? Do I have permission to have complaints if I choose to after communing with my soul, or am I condemned to applying to you for permission? I apparently have not made myself plain, Mr. Ross. I doubt that you have rational complaints about it. To have those of the other variety is entirely up to you. Ross rose now. Listen, punk, if I decide to fire you, you won't get the news by word of mouth. It won't be anything I say that will give you the glad tidings. You will go out through the door in a violent tumble, and mine will be the propulsive force behind that tumble. Just keep that in your small brain and your tongue in your big mouth. Whether you've done your work or not is not at question right now. Whether you've done everyone else's is. Who and what gives you the right to manage everyone in this place? John said nothing. Ross roared, Well? John said, Your order was keep your tongue in your big mouth. Ross turned a dangerous red. You will answer questions, however. John said, 
I am not aware that I have been managing anyone. There is not a person in the place you haven't corrected at least once. You have gone over Willoughby's head in connection with the correspondence on the TMPs. You have been into general files using Bronstein's computer access. And God knows what else I haven't yet been told about and all in the last two days. You are disrupting the work of this department, and it must cease this moment. There must be dead calm and instantaneously, or it will be tornado weather for you, my man. John said, If I have interfered in the narrow sense, it has been for the good of the company. In the case of Willoughby, his treatment of the TMP matter was putting quantum pharmaceuticals in violation of government regulations, something I have pointed out to you in one of several memos I have sent you which you apparently have not had occasion to read. As for Bronstein, he was simply ignoring general directions and costing the company 50,000 in unnecessary tests, something I was easily able to establish by locating the necessary correspondence merely to corroborate my clear memory of the situation. Ross was swelling visibly through the talk. Heath, he said, you are usurping my role. You will, therefore, gather your personal effects and be off the premises before lunch, never to return. If you do, I will take extreme pleasure in helping you out again with my foot. Your official notice of dismissal will be in your hands or down your throat before your effects will be collected. Work as quickly as you may. John said, Don't try to bully me, Ross. You've cost the company a quarter of a million dollars through incompetence and you know it. There was a short pause as Ross deflated. He said cautiously, What are you talking about? Quantum Pharmaceuticals went down to the wire on the Nutley bid and missed out because a certain piece of information that was in your hands stayed in your hands and never got to the board of directors. You either forgot or you didn't bother, and in either case, you are not the man for your job. You are either incompetent or have sold out. You're insane. No one need believe me. The information is in the computer, if one knows where to look, and I know where to look. What's more, the knowledge is on file and will be on the desks of the interested parties two minutes after I leave these premises. If this were so, said Ross, speaking with difficulty, you could not possibly know. This is a stupid attempt at blackmail by threat of slander. You know it's not slander. If you doubt that I have the information, let me tell you that there is one memorandum that is not in the records but can be reconstructed without too much difficulty from what is there. You would have to explain its absence, and it will be presumed you have destroyed it. You know I'm not bluffing. It's still blackmail. Why? I'm making no demands and no threats. I'm merely explaining my actions of the past two days. Of course, if I'm forced to resign... I'll have to explain why I resigned, won't I? Ross said nothing. John said coolly, Is my resignation being requested? Get out of here. With my job? Or without it? Ross said, You have your job. His face was a study in hatred. 8. Susan had arranged a dinner at her apartment and had gone to considerable trouble for it. Never, in her own opinion, had she looked more enticing, and never did she think it more important to move John, at least for a bit, away from his total concentration on his own mind. She said with an attempt at heartiness, After all, we are celebrating the last nine days of single blessedness. We are celebrating more than that, said John with a grim smile. It's only four days since I got the disinhibitor and already I've been able to put Ross in his place. He'll never bother me again. We each seem to have our own notion of sentiment, said Susan. Tell me the details of your tender remembrance. John told the tale crisply, repeating the conversation verbatim and without hesitation. Susan listened stonily without in any way rising to the gathering triumph in John's voice. How did you know all that about Ross? John said, There are no secrets, Sue. Things just seem secret because people don't remember. If you can recall every remark, every comment, 
every stray word made to you or in your hearing, and consider them all in combination, you find that everyone gives himself away in everything. You can pick out meanings that will, in these days of computerization, send you straight to the necessary records. It can be done. I can do it. I have done it in the case of Ross. I can do it in the case of anybody with whom I associate. You can also get them furious. I got Ross furious, you can bet on that. Was that wise? What can he do to me? I've got him cold. He has enough clout in the upper echelons. Not for long. I have a conference set for 2 p.m. tomorrow with old man Prescott and his stinking cigar, and I'll cut Ross off at the pass. Don't you think you're moving too quickly? Moving too quickly? I haven't even begun. Prescott's just a stepping stone. Quantum Pharmaceuticals just a stepping stone. It's still too quick, Johnny. You need someone to direct you. You need... I need nothing. With what I have, he tapped his temple, there's no one and nothing that can stop me. Susan said, Well, look, let's not discuss that. We have different plans to make. Plans? Our own. We're getting married in just under nine days. Surely... With heavy irony, you haven't returned to the sad old days when you forgot things. I remember the wedding, said John testily, but at the moment I've got to reorganize Quantum. In fact, I've been thinking seriously of postponing the wedding till I have things well in hand. Oh, and when might that be? That's hard to tell. Not long at the rate I'm taking hold. A month or two, I suppose. Unless and he descended into sarcasm. You think that's moving too quickly? Susan was breathing hard. Were you planning to consult with me on the matter? John raised his eyebrows. Would it have been necessary? Where's the argument? Surely you see what's happening. We can't interrupt it and lose momentum. Listen, did you know I'm a mathematical whiz? I can multiply and divide as fast as a computer because at some time in my life I have come across almost every simple bit of arithmetic, and I can recall the answers. I read a table of square roots and I can... Susan cried, My God, Johnny, you are a kid with a new toy. You've lost your perspective. Instant recall is good for nothing but playing tricks with. It doesn't give one bit more intelligence, not an ounce, not a speck more of judgment not a whiff more of common sense. You're about as safe to have around as a little boy with a loaded grenade. You need looking after by someone with brains. John scowled. Do I? It seems to me that I'm getting what I want. Are you? Isn't it true that I'm what you want also? What? Go ahead, Johnny. You want me? Reach out and take me. Exercise that remarkable recall you have. Remember who I am, what I am, the things we can do, the warmth, the affection, the sentiment. John, with his forehead still creased in uncertainty, extended his arms toward Susan. She stepped out of them. But you haven't got me, or anything about me. You can't remember me into your arms. You have to love me into them. The trouble is, you don't have the good sense to do it, and you lack the intelligence to establish reasonable priorities. Here, Take this and get out of my apartment, or I'll hit you with something a lot heavier. He stopped to pick up the engagement ring. Susan. I said get out. The firm of Johnny and Sue is hereby dissolved. Her face blazed anger, and John turned meekly and left. 9. When he arrived at Quantum the next morning, Anderson was waiting for him with a look of anxious impatience on his face. Mr. Heath, he said, smiling and rising. What do you want? demanded John. We are private here, I take it. The place isn't bugged, as far as I know. You are to report to us day after tomorrow for examination, on Sunday. You recall that? Of course I recall that. I'm incapable of not recalling. I am capable of changing my mind, however. Why do I need an examination? Why not, sir? It is quite plain from what Kupfer and I have picked up that the treatment seems to have worked splendidly. Actually, we don't want to wait till Sunday. If you can come with me today, 
now, in fact. It would mean a great deal to us, to Quantum, and, of course, to humanity. John said curtly, You might have held on to me when you had me. You sent me about my business, allowing me to live and work unsupervised so that you could test me under field conditions and get a better idea of how things would work out. It meant more risk for me, but you didn't worry about that, did you? Mr. Heath, that was not in our minds. We... Don't tell me that. I remember every last word you and Kupfer said to me last Sunday, and it's quite clear to me that that was in your minds. So, if I take the risk, I accept the benefits. I have no intention of presenting myself as a biochemical freak who has achieved my ability at the end of a hypodermic needle. Nor do I want others of the sort wandering around. For now, I have a monopoly and I intend to use it. When I'm ready, not before, I will be willing to cooperate with you and benefit humanity. But just remember, I'm the one who will know when I'm ready, not you. So don't call me. I'll call you. Anderson managed a soft smile. As to that, Mr. Heath, how can you stop us from making our announcement? Those who have dealt with you this week will have no trouble in recognizing the change in you and in testifying to it. Really? See here, Anderson, listen closely and do so without that foolish grin on your face. It irritates me. I told you I remember every word you and Kupfer spoke. I remember every nuance of expression, every sidelong glance. It all spoke volumes. I learned enough to check through sick leave records with a good idea of what I was looking for. It would seem that I was not the first quantum employee on whom you had tried the disinhibitor. Anderson was indeed not smiling. That is nonsense. You know it is not, and you had better know I can prove it. I know the names of the men involved, one was a woman actually, and the hospitals in which they were treated and the false history with which they were supplied. Since you did not warn me of this, when you used me as your fourth experimental animal on two legs, I owe you nothing but a prison sentence. Anderson said, I won't discuss this matter. Let me say this, though. The treatment will wear off, Heath. You won't keep your total recall. You will have to come back for further treatment, and you can be sure it will be on our terms. John said, Nuts. You don't suppose I haven't investigated your reports, at least those you haven't kept secret, and I already have a notion of what aspects you have kept secret. The treatment lasts longer in some cases than others. It invariably lasts longer where it is more effective. In my case, the treatment has been extraordinarily effective, and it will endure a considerable time. By the time I come to you again, if I ever have to, I will be in a position where any failure on your part to cooperate will be swiftly devastating to you. Don't even think of it. You ungrateful. Don't bother me, said John wearily. I have no time to listen to you froth. Go away, I have work to do. Anderson's face was a study in fear and frustration as he left. 10. It was 2.30 p.m. when John walked into Prescott's office, for once not minding the cigar smoke. It would not be long, he knew, before Prescott would have to choose between his cigars and his position. With Prescott were Arnold Gluck and Louis Randall so that John had the grim pleasure of knowing he was facing the three top men in the division. Prescott rested his cigar on top of an ashtray and said, Ross has asked me to give you half an hour, and that's all I will give you. You're the one with the trick memory, aren't you? My name is John Heath, sir, and I intend to present you with a rationalization of procedure for the company, one that will make full use of the age of computers and electronic communication and will lay the groundwork for further modification as the technology improves. The three men looked at each other. Gluck, whose creased face was tanned a leathery brown, said, Are you an expert in office management? I don't have to be, sir. I have been here for six years, and I recall every bit of the procedure in every transaction in which I have been involved. That means the pattern of such transactions is plain to me, and its imperfections obvious. One can see toward what it is tending and where it is doing so wastefully and inefficiently. If you'll listen, I will explain. You will find it easy to understand. 
Randall, whose red hair and freckles made him seem younger than he was, said sardonically, Real easy, I hope, because we have trouble with hard concepts. You won't have trouble, said John. And you won't get a second more than twenty-one minutes, said Prescott, looking at his watch. It won't take that, said John. I have it diagrammed and I can talk quickly. It took fifteen minutes and the three management personnel were remarkably silent in that interval. Finally, Gluck said, with a hostile glance out of his small eyes, It sounds as though you are saying we can get along with half the management we are employing these days. Less than half, said John coolly, and be the more efficient for it. We can't fire ordinary personnel at will because of the unions, though we can profitably lose them by attrition. Management is not protected, however, and can be let go. They'll have pensions if they're old enough, and can get new jobs if they're young enough. Our thought must be for quantum. Prescott, who had maintained an ominous silence, now puffed furiously at his noxious cigar and said, Changes like this have to be considered carefully and implemented, if at all, with the greatest of caution. What seems logical on paper can lose out in the human equation. John said, Prescott, if this reorganization is not accepted within a week, and if I am not placed in charge of its implementation, I will resign. I will have no trouble in finding employment with a smaller firm where this plan can be far more easily put into practice. Beginning with a small group of management people, I can expand in both quantity and efficiency of performance without additional hiring, and within a year I'll drive Quantum into bankruptcy. It would be fun to do this if I am driven to it, so consider carefully. My half hour is up. Goodbye. And he left. 11. Prescott looked after him with a glance of frigid calculation. He said to the other two, I think he means what he says, and that he knows every facet of our operations better than we do. We can't let him go. You mean we've got to accept his plan, said Randall, shocked. I didn't say that. You two go and remember this whole thing is confidential. Gluck said, I have the feeling that if we don't do something, all three of us will find ourselves on our butts in the street within a month. Very likely said Prescott. So we'll do something. What? If you don't know, you won't get hurt. Leave it to me. Forget it for now and have a nice weekend. When they were gone, he thought a while, chewing furiously on his cigar. He then turned to his telephone and dialed an extension. Prescott here. I want you in my office first thing Monday morning. First thing. Hear me? 12. Anderson looked a trifle disheveled. He had had a bad weekend. Prescott, who had had a worse, said to him malevolently, You and Kupfer tried again, didn't you? Anderson said softly, It's better not to discuss that, Mr. Prescott. You remember it was agreed that in certain aspects of research, a distance was to be established. We were to take the risks or the glory, and Quantum was to share in the latter, but not in the former. And your salary was doubled with a guarantee of all legal payments to be Quantum's responsibility. Don't forget that. This man John Heath was treated by you and Kupfer, wasn't he? Come on. There's no mistaking it. There's no point in hiding it. Well, yes. And you were so brilliant that you turned him loose on us. This, this... Tarantula. We didn't anticipate this would happen. When he didn't go into instant shock, we thought it was our first chance to test the process in the field. We thought he would break down after two or three days, or it would pass. Prescott said, If I hadn't been protected so damned well, I wouldn't have put the whole thing out of my mind, and I would have guessed what had happened when that bastard first pulled the computer bit and produced the details of correspondence he had no business remembering. All right. We know where we are now. He's holding the company to ransom with a new plan of operations he can't be allowed to put through. Also, he can't be allowed to walk away from us. Anderson said, 
considering Heath's capacity for recall and synthesis, is it possible that his plan of operations may be a good one? I don't care if it is. That bastard is after my job and who knows what else, and we've got to get rid of him. How do you mean, rid of him? He could be of vital importance to the Cerebrochemical Project. Forget that. It's a disaster. You're creating a super Hitler. Anderson said in a soft-voiced anguish, The effect will wear off. Yes? When? At this moment, I can't be sure. Then I can't take chances. We've got to make our arrangements and do it tomorrow at the latest. We can't wait any longer. 13. John was in high good humor. The manner in which Ross avoided him when he could and spoke to him deferentially when he had to affected the entire workforce. There was a strange and radical change in the pecking order with himself at the top. Nor could John deny to himself that he liked it. He reveled in it. The tide was moving strongly and unbelievably swiftly. It was only nine days since the injection of the disinhibitor, and every step had been forward. Well, no, there had been Susan's silly rage at him, but he would deal with her later. When he showed her the heights to which he would climb in nine additional days, in ninety, he looked up. Ross was at his desk, waiting for his attention, but reluctant to do anything as crass as to attract that attention by as much as clearing his throat. John swiveled his chair, put his feet out before him in an attitude of relaxation, and said, Well, Ross? Ross said carefully, I would like to see you in my office, Heath. Something important has come up, and, frankly, you're the only one who can set it straight. John got slowly to his feet. Yes? What is it? Ross looked about mutely at the busy room with at least five men in reasonable earshot. Then he looked toward his office door and held out an inviting arm. John hesitated, but for years Ross had held unquestioned authority over him, and at this moment he reacted to habit. Ross held his door open for John politely, stepped through himself and closed the door behind him, locking it unobtrusively and remaining in front of it. Anderson stepped out from the other side of the bookcase. John said sharply, What's all this about? Nothing at all, Heath, said Ross, his smile turning into a vulpine grin. We're just going to help you out of your abnormal state, take you back to normality. Don't move, Heath. Anderson had a hypodermic in his hand. Please, Heath, do not struggle. We wish you no harm. If I yell, said John. If you make any sound, said Ross, I will put a hammerlock on you and hold it till your eyes bug out. I would like to do that, so please, try to yell. John said, I have the goods on both of you, safe on deposit. Anything that happens to me. Mr. Heath, said Anderson, nothing will happen to you. Something is going to unhappen to you. We will put you back to where you were. That would happen anyway, but we will hurry it up just a little. So I'm going to hold you, Heath, said Ross, and you won't move because if you do, you will disturb our friend with the needle and he might slip and give you more than the carefully calculated dose, and you might end up unable to remember anything at all. Heath was backing away breathless. That's what you're planning. You think you'll be safe that way, if I forgot all about you all about the information, all about its storage, but... We're not going to hurt you, Heath, said Anderson. John's forehead glistened with sweat. A near paralysis gripped him. An amnesiac, he said huskily, and with a terror that only someone could feel at the possibility who himself had perfect recall. Then you won't remember this either, will you? said Ross. Go ahead, Anderson. Well muttered Anderson in resignation. I'm destroying a perfect test subject. He lifted John's flaccid arm and readied the hypodermic. There was a knock at the door. A clear voice called, John? Anderson froze almost automatically, looking up questioningly. Ross had turned to look at the door. Now he turned back. 
Shoot that stuff into him, Doc, he said in an urgent whisper. The voice came again. Johnny, I know you're in there. I've called the police. They're on the way. Ross whispered again. Go ahead. She's lying. And by the time they come, it's over. Who can prove anything? But Anderson was shaking his head vigorously. It's his fiance. She knows he was treated. She was there. You jackass. There was the sound of a kick against the door, and then the voice sounded in a muffled, Let go of me. They've got, let go. Anderson said, Having her push the thing was the only way we could get him to agree. Besides, I don't think we have to do anything. Look at him. John had collapsed in a corner, eyes glazed, and clearly in a state of unconscious trance. Anderson said, He's been terrified, and that can produce a shock that will interfere with recall under normal conditions. I think the disinhibitor has been wiped out. Let her in and let me talk to her. 14. Susan looked pale as she sat with her arm protectively about the shoulders of her ex fiance What happened? You remember the injection of... Yes, yes. What happened? He was supposed to come to our office day before yesterday, Sunday, for a thorough examination. He didn't come. We worried and the reports from his superiors had me very perturbed. He was becoming arrogant, megalomaniacal, irascible. Perhaps you noticed. You're not wearing your engagement ring. We quarreled, said Susan. Then you understand. He was, well, if he were an inanimate device, we might say his motor was overheating as it sped faster and faster. This morning it seemed absolutely essential to treat him. We persuaded him to come here, locked the door, and injected him with something while I howled and kicked outside. Not at all, said Anderson. We would have used a sedative, but we were too late. He had what I can only describe as a breakdown. You may search his body for fresh punctures, which, as his fiancé, I presume you may do without embarrassment, and you will find none. Susan said, I'll see about that. What happens now? I am sure he will recover. He will be his old self again. Dead average? He will not have perfect recall, but until ten days ago he never had. Naturally, the firm will give him indefinite leave on full salary. If any medical treatment is required, all medical expenses will be paid, and when he feels like it, he can return to active duty. Yes? Well, I will want all that in writing before the day is out, or I see my lawyer tomorrow. But, Miss Collins, said Anderson, you know that Mr. Heath volunteered. You were willing, too. I think, said Susan, that you know the situation was misrepresented to us and that you won't welcome an investigation. Just see to it that what you've just promised is in writing. You will have to, in return, sign an agreement to hold us guiltless of any misadventure your fiancé may have suffered. Possibly. I prefer to see what kind of misadventure it is first. Can you walk, Johnny? John nodded and said a little huskily, Yes, Sue. Then let's go. Fifteen. John had put himself outside a cup of good coffee and an omelet before Susan permitted discussion. Then he said, What I don't understand is how you happen to be there. Shall we say woman's intuition? Let's say Susan's brains. All right, let's. After I threw the ring at you, I felt self-pitying and aggrieved, and after that wore off, I felt a severe sense of loss because, odd though it might seem to the average sensible person, I'm very fond of you. I'm sorry, Sue, said John humbly. As well you should be. God, you were insupportable. But then I got to thinking that if you could get poor loving me that furious, what must you be doing to your co-workers? The more I thought about it, the more I thought they might have a strong impulse to kill you. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm willing to admit you deserved killing, 
but only at my hands. I wouldn't dream of allowing anyone else to do it. I didn't hear from you. I know, Sue. I had plans and I had no time. You had to do it all in two weeks. I know, you idiot. By this morning, I couldn't stand it any more. I came to see how you were and found you behind a locked door. John shuddered. I never thought I'd welcome your kicking and screaming, but I did then. You stopped them. Will it upset you to talk about it? I don't think so. I'm all right. Then what were they doing? They were going to re-inhibit me. I thought they might be giving me an overdose and make me an amnesiac. Why? Because they knew I had them all. I could ruin them and the company. You really could? Absolutely. But they didn't actually inject you, did they? Or was that another of Anderson's lies? They really didn't. Are you all right? I'm not an amnesiac. Well, I hate to sound like a Victorian damsel, but I hope you have learned your lesson. If you mean, do I realize you were right, I do. Then just let me lecture you for one minute, so you don't forget again. You went about everything too rapidly, too openly, and with too much disregard for the possible violent counteraction of others. You had total recall and you mistook it for intelligence. If you had someone who was really intelligent to guide you, I needed you, Sue. Well, you've got me now, Johnny. What do we do next, Sue? First, we get that paper from Quantum, and, since you're all right, we'll sign the release for them. Second, we get married on Saturday, just as we originally planned. Third, we'll see. But, Johnny? Yes. You're all right? Couldn't be better, Sue. Now we're together, everything's fine. 16. It wasn't a formal wedding. Less formal than they had originally planned and fewer guests. No one was there from Quantum, for instance. Susan had pointed out quite firmly that that would be a bad idea. A neighbor of Susan's had brought a video camera to record the proceedings, something that seemed to John to be the height of schlock, but Susan had wanted it. And then the neighbor had said to him with a tragic shrug, Can't get the damn thing to turn on. You'd think they'd give me one in working order. I'll have to make a phone call. He hastened down the steps to the pay phone in the chapel lobby. John advanced to look at the camera curiously. An instruction booklet lay on a small table to one side. He picked it up and leafed through the pages with moderate speed, then put it back. He looked about him, but everyone was busy. No one seemed to be paying attention to him. He slid the rear panel to one side unobtrusively and peered inside. He then turned away and gazed at the opposite wall thoughtfully. He was still gazing even as his right hand snaked in toward the mechanism and made a quick adjustment. After a brief interval, he put the rear panel back and flicked a toggle switch. The neighbor came bustling back, looking exasperated. How am I going to follow directions I can't make head or... He frowned, then said, Funny, it's on. It must have been working all the time. 17. You may kiss the bride, said the minister benignly, and John took Susan in his arms and followed orders with enthusiasm. Susan whispered through unmoving lips, You fixed that camera. Why? He whispered back, I wanted everything right for the wedding. She whispered, You wanted to show off. They broke apart, looking at each other through love-misted eyes, then fell into another embrace while the small audience stirred and tittered. Susan whispered, You do it again and I'll skin you. As long as no one knows you still have it, no one will stop you. We'll have it all within a year, if you follow directions. Yes, dear, whispered Johnny humbly. End of Robot Dreams by Isaac Asimov I-S-A-A-C-A-S-I-M-O-V Read by Michael Rosato in the studios of Potomac Talking Book Services Incorporated for the Library of Congress April 
2004. Published by Ace Books, the Berkeley Publishing Group, a division of Penguin Putnam Incorporated, 375 Hudson Street, New York, New York, 10014. Further reproduction or distribution in other than a specialized format is prohibited. End of book.